Section 1 of Library of the World's Best Literature Ancient and Modern Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jyoti Taravanat Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6 by Various Authors Section 1 The Abbé du Brantôme, Pierre de Baudet, 1527-1614 Early historian of the Valois period, he is indebted to Brantôme for preserving the atmosphere and detail of the brilliant life in which he moved as a dashing courtier, a military adventurer, and a gallant gentleman of high degree. He was not a professional scribe nor a student, but he took notes unconsciously, and in the evening of his life turned back the pages of his memory to record the scenes through which he had passed and the characters which he had known. He has been termed the valley du chambre of history nevertheless the anecdotes scattered through his works will ever be treasured by all students and historians of that age of luxury and magnificence art and beauty beneath which lay the fermentation of great religious and political movements culminating in the struggle between the huguenots and catholics Brantome was the third son of the Vicomte de Bordet, a Perigord nobleman, whose family had lived long in Guyenne, and whose aristocratic lineage was lost in myth. Upon the estate stood the Abbe of Brantome, founded by Charlemagne, and this Henry the Second gave to young Pierre de Bordet in recognition of the military deeds of his brother jean de baudet who lost his life in service thereafter the lad was to sign his name as the reverend father in god monsieur pierre de baudet abbe de brantome born in the old chateau in 1527 he was destined for the church but abandoned this career for arms at an early age he was sent to court as page to marguerite sister of francis i and queen of navarre after her death in fifteen forty nine he went to paris to study at the university his title of abbe being merely honorary he served in the army under francois de guise duke of lorraine and became gentleman of the chamber to charles the ninth his career extended through the reigns of Henry the Second, Francis the Second, Charles the Ninth, Henry the Third, and Henry the Fourth to that of Louis the Thirteenth, with the exception of diplomatic missions, service on the battlefield, and voyages for pleasure. He spent his life at court. About fifteen ninety four, he retired to his estate where until his death on july fifteenth sixteen fourteen he passed his days in contentions with the monks of the brantherm in lawsuits with his neighbours and in writing his books lives of the illustrious men and great captains of france lives of illustrious ladies lives of women of gallantry memoir containing anecdotes connected with the court of france spanish rodomonteles a life of his father franco de bordeaux a funeral oration on a sister-in-law and a dialogue in verse entitled the tomb of madame de bordeaux these were not published until long after his death first appearing in leyden about sixteen sixty five at the hague in seventeen forty and in Paris in 1787. The best editions are by Foucault, seven volumes, Paris, 1822, by Lacroix and Merem, 
three volumes, 1859, and Le Lande, ten volumes, 1865-81. What Brantome thought of himself may be seen by glancing at that portion of the Testament Mystique which relates to his writings. I will and expressly charge my heirs that they cast to be printed the books which I have composed by my talent and invention. These books will be found covered with velvet, either black, green or blue, and one larger volume, which is that of the Rhodomontades, covered with velvet, gilt outside and curiously bound all have been carefully corrected there will be found in these books excellent things such as stories histories discourses and witty sayings which i flatter myself the world will not disdain to read when once it has had a sight of them i direct that a sum of money be taken from my estate sufficient to pay for the printing thereof which certainly cannot be much for i have known many printers who would have given money rather than charged any for the right of printing them they print many things without charge which are not at all equal to mine i will also that the said impression shall be in large type in order to make the better appearance and that they should appear with the royal privilege which the king will readily grant also care must be taken that the printers do not put on the title page any supposititious name instead of mine otherwise i should be defrauded of the glory which is my due the old man delighted in complimenting himself when talking about his grand dour dame this greatness of soul may be measured from the command he gave his heirs to annoy a man who had refused to swear homage to him it not being reasonable to leave at rest this little wretch who descends from a low family and whose grandfather was nothing but a notary he also commands his nieces and nephews to take the same vengeance upon his enemies as i should have done in my green and vigorous youth during which i may boast and i thank god for it that i never received an injury without being revenged on the author of it brantome writes like a gentleman of the sword with dash and elan and as one to use his own words who has been a trujo trotan traversa e vagabandan mund always trotting traversing and tramping the world not in the habit of a vagabond however for the balls banquet tournaments masks ballet and wedding feasts which he describes so vividly were occasions for the display of sumptuous costumes and Monsieur Pierre du Bourdais doubtless appeared as elegant as any other gallant in silken hose, jewelled doublet, flowing cape, and long rapier. What we value most are his paintings of these festive scenes, and the vivid portraits which he has left of the valois women who were largely responsible for the luxuries and the crimes of the period, women who could step without a tremor, from a court mask into a massacre who could toy with the gallant's ribbons and direct the blow of an assassin and who could poison a rival with a delicately perfumed gift such a court brantome calls the true paradise of the world school of all honesty and virtue ornament of france we like to hear about catherine de medici riding with her famous squadron of venus you should have seen forty or fifty dames and damsels following her mounted on beautifully accoutred hackneys their hats adorned with feathers which increased their charm 
so well did the flying plumes represent the demand for love or war virgil who undertook to describe the fine apparel of queen dida when she went out hunting has by no means equalled that of her queen and her ladies charming to or such descriptions as the most beautiful valley that ever was composed of sixteen of the fairest and best trained dames and damsels who appeared in a silver rock where they were seated in niches shut in on every side the sixteen ladies represented the sixteen provinces of france after having made the round of the hall for parade as in a camp they all descended and ranging themselves as in the form of a little oddly contrived battalion some thirty violins began a very pleasant warlike air to which they danced their ballet after an hour the ladies presented the king the queen mother and others with golden plaques on which were engraved the fruits and singularities of each province the wheat of champagne the wines of burgundy the lemons and oranges of province etc he shows us catherine de medici the elegant cunning florentine her beautiful daughters elizabeth of spain and marguerite de volleve diana apotia the woman of eternal youth and beauty jean delbarre the mother of henry the fourth louis de verdemont the duchess de tombe marie truchet and all their satellites as they enjoyed their lives very valuable are the data regarding mary stuart's departure from france in 1561 brantome was one of her suite and describes her grief when the shores of france faded away and her arrival in scotland where on the first night she was serenaded by psalm tunes with the most villainous accompaniment of scottish music e quella music he exclaims e quella ripo pole noi but of all the gay ladies brantome loves to dwell upon his favorites are the two margaritis margariti of anguli queen of navarre the sister of francis the first and margariti daughter of catherine de medici and wife of henry the fourth of the latter called familiarly la reine margot he is always writing to speak of the beauty of this rare princess he says i think that all that are or will be or have ever been near her are ugly brantome has been a puzzle to many critics who cannot explain his contradictions he had none he extolled wicked and immoral characters because he recognized only two merits aristocratic birth and hatred of the huguenots he is well described by m de baron who says brantome expresses the entire character of his country and of his profession careless of the difference between good and evil a courtier who has no idea that anything can be blameworthy in the great but who sees and narrates their vices and their crimes all the more frankly in that he is not very sure whether what he tells be good or bad as indifferent to the honor of women as he is to the morality of men relating scandalous things with no consciousness that they are such and almost leading his reader into accepting them as the simplest things in the world so little importance does he attach to them terming louis the 11th who poisoned his brother the good king louis calling women whose adventures could hardly have been written by any pen save his own or no dames brantel must therefore not be regarded as a chronicler who revels in scandals although his pages reek with them but as a true mirror of the valois court and the valois period the dancing of royalty from lives of notable women 
Ah, how the times have changed! Since I saw them together in the ballroom, expressing the very spirit of the dance, the king always opened the grand ball by leading out his sister, and each equal the other, in majesty and grace. I have often seen them dancing the Pabin de Spagne, which must be performed with the utmost majesty and grace. The eyes of the entire court were riveted upon them, ravished by this lovely scene, for the measures were well so well danced, the steps so intelligently placed, the sudden pauses timed so accurately, and making so elegant an effect, that one did not know what to admire most, the beautiful manner of moving, or the majesty of the halls, now expressing excessive gaiety, now a beautiful and haughty disdain. Who could dance with such elegance and grace as the royal brother and sister? None, I believe. And I have watched the king dancing with the queen of Spain and the queen of Scotland, each of whom was an excellent dancer. I have seen them dance the Pazimiso di Telli, walking gravely through the measures and directing their steps with so graceful and solemn a manner that no other prince nor lady could approach them in dignity. This queen took great pleasure in performing these grave dances, for she preferred to exhibit dignified grace rather than to express the gaiety of the brawl, the volta, and the courant. Although she acquired them quickly, she did not think them worthy of her majesty. I always enjoyed seeing her dance the Bran de Lantha or de Fombo. Once returning from the nuptials of the daughter of the King of Poland, I saw her dance this kind of Bran at Lyons before the assembled guests from Savoy, Piedmont, Italy, and other places, and everyone said he had never seen any such more captivating than this lovely lady, moving with grace of motion and majestic mien, all agreeing that she had no need of the flaming torch which she held in her hand, for the flashing light from her brilliant eyes was sufficient to illuminate the set and to pierce the dark veil of night. The Shadow of a Tomb From the Lives of Courtly Women Once I had an elder brother who was called Captain Baudet, one of the bravest and most valiant soldiers of his time. Although he was my brother, I must praise him, for the record he made in the wars brought him fame. He was the gentilhomme de France who stood first in the science and gallantry of arms. He was killed during the last siege of Hesden. My brother's parents had destined him for the career of letters, and accordingly sent him at the age of eighteen to study in Italy, where he settled in Ferrara because of Madame René de France, Duchess of Ferrara, who ardently loved my mother, who enjoyed life at her court, and soon fell deeply in love with a young French widow, Mademoiselle de la Roche, who was in the suit of Madame de Ferrara. They remained there in the service of love until my father, seeing that his son was not following literature, ordered him home. She who loved him begged him to take her with him to France, and to the court of Marguerite of Navarre, whom she had served and who had given her to Madame René, when she went to Italy upon her marriage. My brother, who was young, was greatly charmed to have her companionship, and conducted her to Paul. The queen was glad to welcome her, for the young widow was handsome and accomplished, and indeed considered superior in a spirit to other ladies of the court. After remaining a few days with my mother and grandmother, who were there, my brother visited his father. In a short time he declared that he was disgusted with letters, and joined the army, serving in the wars of Piedmont and Parma, where he acquired much honour in the space of five or six months, 
during which time he did not revisit his home. At the end of this period he went to see his mother at Pau. He made his reverence to the Queen of Navarre as she returned from Vespas, and she, who was the best princess in the world, received him cordially, and taking his hand, led him about the church for an hour or two. She demanded news regarding the wars of Piedmont and Italy, and many other particulars, to which my brother replied so well that she was greatly pleased with him. He was a very handsome young man of twenty-four years. After talking gravely and engaging him in earnest conversation, walking up and down the church, she directed her steps toward the tomb of Mademoiselle de la Roche, who had been dead for three months. She stopped here, and again took his hand, saying, My cousin, thus addressing him because a daughter of Dalbert was married into our family of Baudet, but of this I do not boast, for it has not helped me particularly. Do you not feel something move below your feet? No, madame, he replied. But reflect again, my cousin, she insisted. My brother answered, madame, I feel nothing move. I stand upon a solid stone. Then I will explain, said the queen, without keeping you longer in suspense, that you stand upon the tomb and over the body of your poor, dearly loved Mademoiselle de la Roche, who is interred here, and that our friends may have sentiment for us at our death, render a pious homage here. You cannot doubt that the gentle creature, dying so recently, must have been affected when you approached. In remembrance, I beg you to say a paternoster and an Ave Maria and a deep profundus and sprinkle holy water. Thus you will win the name of a very faithful lover and a good Christian. M. Constabula de Monorosi From Lives of Distinguished Men and Great Captains He never failed to say and keep up his patronosters every morning. Whether he remained in the house, or mounted his horse and went out to the field to join the army. It was a common saying among the soldiers that one must beware the paternosters of the constable, for as disorders were very frequent, he would say, while mumbling and muttering his paternosters all the time, Go and fetch that fellow, and hang me him up to the tree. Out with a file of arquebusiers here, before me this instant for the execution of this man burn me this village instantly cut me to pieces at once all these villain peasants who have dared to hold this church against the king all this without ever ceasing from his paternosters till he had finished them thinking that he would have done very wrong to put them off to another time so conscientious was he. Two Famous Entertainments From Lives of Courtly Women I have read in a Spanish book called El Voyage del Principe, The Voyage of the Prince, made by the King of Spain in the Pace Bars in the time of the Emperor Charles, his father, about the wonderful entertainments given in the rich cities. The most famous was that of the Queen of Hungary in the lovely town of Baines, which passed into a proverb, Mars bravas culas frestas de Baines, more magnificent than the festivals of Baines. Among the displays which were seen during the siege of the counterfeit castle, she ordered for one day a fete in honour of the emperor her brother, Queen Eleanor, her sister, and the gentlemen and ladies of the court. Toward the end of the feast a lady appeared, with six arid nymphs, 
dressed as huntresses in classic costumes of silver and green, glittering with jewels to imitate the light of the moon. Each one carried a bow and arrows in her hand and wore a quiver on her shoulder. Their buskins were of cloth of silver. They entered the hall, leading their dogs after them, and placed on the table in front of the emperor all kinds of venison pasties supposed to have been the spoils of the chase. After them came the goddess of shepherds and her six nymphs, dressed in cloth of silver, garnished with pearls. They wore knee breeches beneath their flowing robes and white pumps, and brought in various products of the dairy. Then entered the third division, Pomana and her nymphs, bearing fruit of all descriptions. This goddess was the daughter of Dona Beatrix Pachille, Countess of Dutrema, lady-in-waiting to Queen Eleanor, and was but nine years old. She was now Madame l'Admiral de Chestion, whom the Admiral married for his second wife. Approaching with her companions, she presented her gifts to the Emperor with an eloquent speech delivered so beautifully that she received the admiration of the entire assembly, and all predicted that she would become a beautiful, charming, graceful, and captivating lady. She was dressed in cloth of silver and white, with white buskins, and a profusion of precious stones, emeralds, coloured like some of the fruit she bore. After making these presentations, she gave the emperor a palm of victory made of green enamel, the fronds tipped with pearls and jewels. This was very rich and gorgeous. To Queen Eleanor she gave a fan, containing a mirror set, with gems of great value. Indeed, the Queen of Hungary showed that she was a very excellent lady, and the Emperor was proud of a sister worthy of himself. All the young ladies who impersonated these mythical characters were selected from the suits of France, Hungary, and Madame de Lorraine, and were therefore French, Italian, Flemish, German, and of Lorraine. None of them lacked beauty. At the same time that these fetes were taking place at Baines, Henry II made his entree in Piedmont and at his garrisons in Lyons, where were assembled the most brilliant of his courtiers and court ladies. If the representation of Diana and her chase given by the Queen of Hungary was found beautiful, the one at Lyons was more beautiful and complete. As the king entered the city, he saw obelisks of antiquity to the right and left, and a wall of six feet was constructed along the road to the courtyard, which was filled with underbrush and planted thickly with trees and shrubbery. In this miniature forest, were hidden deer and other animals. As soon as his majesty appeared, to the sound of horns and trumpets, Diana issued forth with her companions, dressed in the fashion of a classic nymph, with her quiver at her side and a bow in her hand. Her figure was draped in black and gold sprinkled with silver stars. The sleeves were of crimson satin bordered with gold, and the garment looped up above the knee, revealed her buskins of crimson satin covered with pearls and embroidery. Her hair was entwined with magnificent strings of rich pearls and gems of much value, and above her brow was placed a crescent of silver surrounded by little diamonds. Gold could never have suggested half so well as the shining silver the white light of the real crescent. Her companions were attired in classic costumes made of taffetas of various colours, shot with gold, 
and the ringlets were adorned with all kinds of glittering gems other nymphs carried darts of brazil wood tipped with black and white tassels and carried horns and trumpets suspended by ribbons of white and black when the king appeared a lion which had long been under training ran from the wood and lay at the feet of the goddess who bound him with a leash of white and black and led him to the king accompanying her action with a poem of ten verses which she delivered most beautifully like the lion so ran the lines the city of lions lay at his majesty's feet gentle gracious and obedient to his command this spoken diana and her nymphs made low bows and retired note that diana and her companions were married women widows and young girls taken from the best society in lions and there was no fault to be found with the way they performed their parts the king the princess and the ladies and gentlemen of the court were ravished madame du volantineva called diana of poitiers whom the king served and in whose name the mock chase was arranged was not less content end of section 1 recording by jyoti taravnat section 2 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by miriam spiegel library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 by various authors section 2 a homecoming by fredrika bremer 1801 to 1865 Frederica Bremer was born at Turla Manor House near Abo in Finland on the 17th of August 1801 In 1804 the family removed to Stockholm and 2 years later to a large estate at Arsta some 20 miles from the capital which was her subsequent home At Arsta the father of Frederica who had amassed a fortune in the iron industry in Finland set up an establishment in accord with his means the manor house built 2 centuries before had become in some parts dilapidated but it was ultimately restored and improved beyond its original condition from its windows on one side the eye stretched over nearly 5 miles of meadows fields and villages belonging to the estate in spite of its surroundings however frederica's childhood was not a happy one her mother was severe and impatient of petty faults and the child's mind became embittered her father was reserved and melancholy frederica herself was restless and passionate although of an affectionate nature among the other children she was the ugly duckling who was misunderstood and whose natural development was continually checked and frustrated her talents were exhibited in a variety of directions her first verses in french to the morn were written at the age of 8 subsequently she wrote comedies for home production prose and verse of all sorts and kept a journal which has been preserved in 1821 the whole family went on a tour abroad from which they did not return until the following year having visited in the meantime germany switzerland and france and spent the winter in paris this year among new scenes and surroundings seems to have brought home to frederica upon the resumption of her old life in the country its narrowness and its isolation she was entirely shut off from all desired activity her illusions vanished one by one i was conscious she says in her short autobiography of being born with powerful wings but i was conscious of their being clipped and she fancied that it would remain so her attention however was fortunately attracted from herself to the poor and sick in the country round about and she presently became to the whole region a nurse and a helper denying herself all sorts of comforts that she might give them to others and braving storm and hunger on her errands of mercy in order to earn money for her charities she painted miniature portraits of the crown princess and the king and secretly sold them 
her desire to increase the small sums she thus gained induced her to seek a publisher for a number of sketches she had written her brother readily disposed of the manuscript for a hundred rix dollars and her first book techningar ur Fredrikslifvet, sketches of early life appeared in eighteen twenty eight but without the name of the author of whose identity the publisher himself was left in ignorance the book was received with such favor that the young author was induced to try again and what had originally been intended as a second volume of the sketches appeared in eighteen thirty as familian h the h family its success was immediate and unmistakable it not only was received with applause but created a sensation and swedish literature was congratulated on the acquisition of a new talent among its writers the secret of frederica's authorship which had as yet not been confided even to her parents was presently revealed to the poet and later bishop franzen an old friend of the family shortly afterward the swedish academy of which franzen was secretary awarded her its lesser gold medal as a sign of appreciation a third volume met with even greater success than its predecessors and seemed definitely to point out the career which she subsequently followed and from this time until the close of her life she worked diligently in her chosen field she rapidly acquired an appreciative public in and out of sweden many of her novels and tales were translated into various languages several of them appearing simultaneously in swedish and english in eighteen forty four the swedish academy awarded her its great gold medal of merit several long journeys abroad mark the succeeding years to denmark and america from eighteen forty eight to eighteen fifty seven to switzerland belgium france italy palestine and greece from eighteen fifty six to eighteen sixty one to germany in eighteen sixty two returning the same year the summer months of eighteen sixty four she spent at arsta which since eighteen fifty three had passed out of the hands of the family she removed there the year after and died there on the thirty first of december frederica bremer's most successful literary work was in the line of her earliest writings descriptive of the everyday life of the middle classes her novels in this line have an unusual charm of expression whose definable elements are an unaffected simplicity and a certain quiet humor which admirably fits the chosen melu besides the ones already mentioned presidenten's daughter the president's daughter granarna the neighbors hemet the home nina and others cultivated this field later she drifted into tendency fiction making her novels the vehicles for her opinions on important public questions such as religion philanthropy and above all the equal rights of women these later productions of which hertha and siskonliff are the most important are far inferior to her earlier work she had however the satisfaction of seeing the realization of several of the movements which she had so ardently espoused the law that unmarried women in sweden should attain their majority at twenty-five years of age the organization at stockholm of a seminary for the education of women teachers and certain parliamentary reforms in addition to her novels and short stories she wrote some verse mostly unimportant and several books of travel among them hemen i nyverden homes in the new world containing her experiences of america life in the old world and greece and the greeks a homecoming from the neighbors letter one francisca w to maria m Rosenvik, first june eighteen blank here i am now dear maria in my own house and home at my own writing table and with my own bear and who then is bear no doubt you ask who else should he be but my own husband i call him bear because it so happens i am seated at the window the sun is setting two swans are swimming in the lake and furrow its clear mirror three cows my cows are standing on the verdant margin quiet fat and pensive and certainly think of nothing what excellent cows they are now the maid is coming up with the milk pail delicious milk in the country but what is not good in the country air and people food and feelings earth and sky everything there is fresh and cheering now i must introduce you to my place of abode no i must begin farther off upon yonder hill from which i first beheld the valley in which rosenvik lies the hill is some miles in the interior of smallland 
do you descry a carriage covered with dust? In it are seated Bear and his wedded wife. The wife is looking out with curiosity, for before her lies a valley so beautiful in the tranquillity of the evening. Below are green groves which fringe mirror-clear lakes. Fields of standing corn bend in silken undulations round grey mountains, and white buildings glance among the trees. Round about, pillars of smoke are shooting up vertically from the wood-covered hills to the serene evening sky. This seems to indicate the presence of volcanoes, but in point of fact it is merely the peaceful labor of the husbandmen burning the vegetation in order to fertilize the soil. At all events, it is an excellent thing, and I am delighted, bend forward, and am just thinking about a happy family in nature, paradise, and Adam and Eve, when suddenly Bear puts his great paws around me and presses me so that I am nearly giving up the ghost while, kissing me, he entreats me to be comfortable here. I was a little provoked, but when I perceived the heartfelt intention of the embrace, I could not but be satisfied. In this valley, then, was my permanent home. Here my new family was living. Here lay Rosenvik, and here I was to live with my Bear. We descended the hill, and the carriage rolled rapidly along the level way. Bear told me the names of every estate, both in the neighborhood and at a distance. I listened as if I were dreaming, but was roused from my reverie when he said with a certain stress, Here is the residence of Ma Chère Mère, and the carriage drove into a courtyard and stopped before a large and fine stone house. What, are we going to alight here? Yes, my love. This was by no means an agreeable surprise to me. I would gladly have first driven to my own home, there to prepare myself a little for meeting my husband's stepmother, of whom I was a little afraid, from the accounts I had heard of that lady, and the respect Bear entertained for her. This visit appeared entirely ma à propos to me, but Bear had his own ideas, and I perceived from his manner that it was not expedient then to offer any resistance. It was Sunday and on the carriage drawing up the tones of a violin became audible to me. "'Aha!' said Bear, so much the better, made a ponderous leap from the carriage, and lifted me out. Of hat-cases and packages no manner of account was to be taken. Bear took my hand, ushered me up the steps into the magnificent hall, and dragged me toward the door from whence the sounds of music and dancing were heard. "'See,' thought I, "'now I am to dance in this costume forsooth.' I wished to go in some place where I could shake the dust from my nose and my bonnet, where I could at least view myself in a mirror. Impossible. Bear, leading me by the arm, assured me that I looked most charming, and entreated me to mirror myself in his eyes. I then needs must be so discourteous as to reply that they were too small. He protested that they were only the clearer, and opened the door to the ballroom. Well, since you lead me to the ball, you shall also dance with me, you bear. I exclaimed in gaiety of despair, so to speak. With delight, cried Bear, and at the same moment we found ourselves in the salon. My alarm diminished considerably when I perceived in the spacious room only a crowd of cleanly attired maids and serving men who were sweeping merrily about with one another. They were so busied with dancing as scarcely to observe us. Bear then conducted me to the upper end of the apartment, and there, on a high seat, I saw a tall and strong lady of about fifty who was playing on a violin with zealous earnestness and beating time with her foot, which she stamped with energy. On her head she wore a remarkable and high projecting cap of black velvet, which I will call a helmet, because that word occurred to my mind at the very first view I had of her, and I know no one more appropriate. She looked well, but singular. It was the grand lady of General Mansfeld, my husband's stepmother, ma chère mère, she speedily cast her large dark brown eyes on me, instantly ceased playing, laid aside the violin, and drew herself up with a proud bearing, but an air of gladness and frankness. Bear led me towards her. I trembled a little, bowed profoundly, and kissed ma chère mère's hand. She kissed my forehead, and for a while regarded me with such a keen glance that I was compelled to abase my eyes, on which she again kissed me most cordially on lips and forehead, and embraced me almost as lustily as Bear had. Now it was Bear's turn. He kissed the hand of ma chère mère right respectfully. She, however, offered him her cheek, and they appeared very friendly. "'Welcome, my dear friends,' said ma chère mère, with a loud masculine voice. "'It was handsome in you to come to me before driving to your own home. 
I thank you for it. I would indeed have given you a better reception had I been prepared. At all events, I know that welcome is the best cheer. I hope, my friends, you stay the evening here. Bear excused us, and said that we desired to get home soon, that I was fatigued from the journey, but that we would not drive by Carlsfors without paying our respects to ma chère mère. Well, very good, very good, said ma chère mère, with satisfaction. We will shortly talk further about that in the chamber there, but first I must say a few words to the people here. Hark ye, good friends, and ma chère mère knocked with the bow on the back of the violin, till a general silence ensued in the salon. My children, she pursued in a solemn manner, I have to tell you, a plague upon you, will you not be still there at the lower end? I have to inform you that my dear son, Lars Anders Werner, has now led home as his wedded wife, Francesca Bruin, whom you see at his side. Marriages are made in heaven, my children, and we will supplicate heaven to complete its work in blessing this conjugal pair. We will this evening together drink a bumper to their prosperity. That will do. Now you can continue your dancing, my children. Olaf, come you here, and do your best in playing. While a murmur of exultation and congratulations went through the assembly, ma chère mère took me by the hand and led me, together with Bear, into another room. Here she ordered punch and glasses to be brought in. In the interim she thrust her two elbows on the table, placed her clenched hands under her chin, and gazed steadfastly at me, but with a look which was rather gloomy than friendly. Bear, perceiving that ma chère mère's review embarrassed me, broached the subject of the harvest or rural affairs. Ma chère mère vented a few sighs, so deep that they rather resembled groans, appeared to make a violent effort to command herself, answered Bear's questions, and on the arrival of the punch drank to us, saying, with a serious look and voice, "'Son and son's wife, your health.' On this she grew more friendly, and said in a tone of pleasantry, which beseemed her very well, "'Lars Anders, I don't think people can say you have bought the calf in the sack. Your wife does not by any means look in bad case, and has a pair of eyes to buy fish with, Little she is, it is true, but little and bold is often more than a match for the great. I laughed, and so did ma chère mère also. I began to understand her character and manner. We gossiped a little while together in a lively manner, and I recounted some little adventures of travel which amused her exceedingly. After the lapse of an hour we arose to take leave, and ma chère mère said, with a really charming smile, I will not detain you this evening, delighted as I am to see you. I can well imagine that home is attractive. Stay at home to-morrow, if you will, but the day after to-morrow come and dine with me. As to the rest, you know well that you are at all times welcome. Fill now your glasses, and come and drink the folk's health. Sorrow we should keep to ourselves, but share joy in common. We went into the dancing-room with full glasses, ma chère mère leading the way as herald, they were awaiting us with bumpers, and ma chère mère addressed the people something in this strain. We must not indeed laugh until we get over the brook, but when we set out on the voyage of matrimony with piety and good sense, then may be applied the adage that, well begun is half won. And on that, my friends, we will drink a skull to this wedded pair you see before you, and wish that both they and their posterity may ever sit in the vineyard of our Lord. Skull! 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 resounded from every side. Bear and I emptied our glasses, and went about and shook a multitude of people by the hand, till my head was all confusion. When this was over, and we were preparing to prosecute our journey, ma chère mère came after us on the steps with a packet or bundle in her hand, and said in a friendly manner, Take this cold roast veal with you, children, for breakfast tomorrow morning. After that you must fatten and consume your own calves. But forget not, daughter-in-law, that I get back my napkin." No, you shan't carry it, dear child. You have enough to do with your bag and mantle. Lars Anders shall carry the roast veal. And as if Lars Anders had been still a little boy, she charged him with the bundle, showed him how he was to carry it, and Bear did as she said. Her last words were, Forget not that I get my napkin again. I looked with some degree of wonder at Bear, but he smiled and lifted me into the carriage. End of section 2《セクション3 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 3. Selected Excerpts from The Home, by Frederica Bremer. The Landed Proprietor Louise possessed the quality of being a good listener in a higher degree than anyone else in the family, and therefore she heard more than anyone else of his excellency, but not of him only, for Jacoby had always something to tell her, always something to consult her about, and in case she were not too much occupied with her thoughts about the weaving, he could always depend upon the most intense sympathy and the best advice, both with regard to moral questions and economical arrangements, dress, plans for the future, and so forth. He also gave her good advice, which, however, was very seldom followed, when she was playing postillion. He also drew patterns for her tapestry work, and was very fond of reading aloud to her, but novels rather than sermons. But he was not long allowed to sit by her side alone, for very soon a person seated himself at her other side, whom we will call the landed proprietor, as he was chiefly remarkable for the possession of a large estate in the vicinity of the town. The landed proprietor seemed to be disposed to dispute with the candidate, let us continue to call him so, as we are all, in one way or another, candidates in this world, the place which he possessed. The landed proprietor had, besides his estate, a very portly body, round, healthy-looking cheeks, a pair of large grey eyes, remarkable for their want of expression, and a little rosy mouth, which preferred mastication to speaking, which laughed without meaning, and which now began to direct Cousin Louise, for he considered himself related to the lagman, several short speeches, which we will recapitulate in the following chapter, headed Strange Questions. Cousin Louise, are you fond of fish? Bream, for instance, asked the landed proprietor one evening, as he seated himself by the side of Louise, who was busy working a landscape in tapestry. Oh, yes, Bream is a very good fish, she answered phlegmatically, without looking up. Oh, with wine sauce is delicious. I have splendid fishing on my estate, Ostenvik. Big fellows of bream. I fish for them myself. Who is the large fish there? inquired Jacoby of Henrik, with an impatient sneer. And what is it to him if your sister Louise is fond of bream or not? Because then she might like him too, mon cher. A very fine and solid fellow is my cousin, Thor of Ostenvik. I advise you to cultivate his acquaintance. What now, Gabrielle dear? What now, your highness? What is that which... Yes? What is it? I shall lose my head over that riddle, Mama dear. Come and help your stupid son. No, no, Mama knows it already. She must not say it, exclaimed Gabrielle with fear. What king do you place above all other kings, Magistar? asked Petra, for the second time, having this evening her raptus of questioning. Charles the Thirteenth answered the candidate, and listened for what Louise was going to reply to the landed proprietor. "'Do you like birds, cousin Louise?' asked the landed proprietor. "'Oh, yes, particularly the throstle,' answered Louise. "'Well, I am glad of that,' said the landed proprietor. "'On my estate, Ostenvik, there is an immense quantity of throstles. I often go out with my gun and shoot them for my dinner. piff paff! With two shots I have directly a whole dishful.' Petra, who was asked by no one, do you like birds, cousin, and who wished to occupy the candidate, did not let herself be deterred by his evident confusion, but for the second time put the following question. Do you think, Magister, that people before the flood were really worse than they are nowadays? Oh, much, much better, answered the candidate. Are you fond of roasted hair, cousin Louise? asked the landed proprietor. Are you fond of roasted hair, Magister? whispered Petra, waggishly to Jacoby. Brava, Petra, whispered her brother to her. Are you fond of cold meat, cousin Louise? asked the landed proprietor, as he was handing Louise to the supper table. Are you fond of landed proprietor? whispered Henrik to her as she left it. Louise answered just as a cathedral would have answered. She looked very solemn and was silent. After supper, Petra was quite excited and left nobody alone who by any possibility could answer her. Is reason sufficient for mankind? What is the ground of morals? What is properly the meaning of revelation? Why is everything so badly arranged in the state? Why must there be rich and poor? Etc., etc. Dear Petra, said Louise, 
what use can there be in asking those questions? It was an evening for questions. They did not end even when the company had broken up. Don't you think, Elise, said the lagman to his wife when they were alone, that our little Petra begins to be disagreeable with her continual questioning and disputing. She leaves no one in peace, and is stirred up herself the whole time. She will make herself ridiculous if she keeps on this way. Yes, if she does keep on so, but I have a feeling that she will change. I have observed her very particularly for some time, and do you know, I think there's really something very uncommon in that girl. Yes, yes, there is certainly something uncommon in her, her liveliness and the many games and schemes which she invents. Yes, don't you think they indicate a decided talent for the fine arts? And then her extraordinary thirst for learning. Every morning, between three and four o'clock, she gets up in order to read or write, or to work at her compositions. That is not at all a common thing. And may not her uneasiness, her eagerness to question and dispute, arise from a sort of intellectual hunger? Ah, from such hunger, which many women must suffer throughout their lives, from want of literary food, from such an emptiness of the soul arise disquiet, discontent, nay, innumerable faults. I believe you are right, Elise, said the lagman, and no condition in life is sadder, particularly in more advanced years, but this shall not be the lot of our Petra, that I will promise. What do you think now would benefit her most? My opinion is that a serious and continued plan of study would assist in regulating her mind. She is too much left to herself with her confused tendencies, with her zeal and her inquiry. I am too ignorant myself to lead and instruct her. You have too little time, and she has no one here who can properly direct her young and unregulated mind. Sometimes I almost pity her, for her sisters don't understand at all what is going on within her, and I confess it is often painful to myself. I wish I were more able to assist her. Petra needs some ground on which to take her stand. Her thoughts require more firmness, from the want of this comes her uneasiness. She is like a flower without roots, which is moved about by winds and waves. She shall take root. She shall find ground as sure as it is to be found in the world, said the lagman, with a serious and beaming eye, at the same time striking his hand on the book containing the law of West Gotha, so that it fell to the ground. We will consider more of this, Elise, continued he. Petra is still too young for us to judge with certainty of her talents and tendencies, but if they turn out to be what they appear, then she shall never feel any hunger so long as I live and can procure bread for my family. You know my family, the excellent Bishop B. Perhaps we can at first confide our Petra to his guidance. After a few years we shall see. She is still only a child. Don't you think that we ought to speak to Jacobi in order to get him to read and converse with her? Apropos, how is it with Jacobi? I imagine that he begins to be too attentive to Louise. Well, well, you are not so far wrong, and even our cousin, Thur of Ostenvik, have you perceived anything there? Yes, I did perceive something yesterday evening. What the deuce was his meaning with those stupid questions he put to her? Does cousin like this? Is cousin fond of that? I don't like that at all myself. Louise is not yet full grown, and already people will come and ask her, Does cousin like? Well, it may signify very little after all, which would perhaps please me best. What a pity, however, that our cousin is not a little more manly, for he has certainly got a most beautiful estate, and so near us. Yes, a pity, because, as he is at present, I am almost sure Louise will find it impossible to give him her hand. You do not believe that her inclination is toward Jacobi? To tell the truth, I fancy that this is the case. Nay, that would be very unpleasant and very unwise. I am very fond of Jacobi, but he has nothing, and is nothing. But, my dear, he may get something, and become something. I confess, dear Ernst, that I believe he would suit Louise better for a husband than anyone else I know, and I would with pleasure call him my son. Would you, Elise? Then I must also prepare myself to do the same. You have had the most trouble and most labor with the children, and it is therefore right that you should decide in their affairs. Ernst, you are so kind. Say just, Elise, but not more than just. Besides, it is my opinion that our thoughts and inclinations will not differ much. 
I confess that Louise appears to me to be a great treasure, and I know of nobody I could give her to with all my heart, but if Jacoby obtains her affections, I feel that I could not oppose their union, although it would be painful to me on account of his uncertain prospects. He is really dear to me, and we are under great obligations to him on account of Henrik. His excellent heart, his honesty, and his good qualities will make him as good a citizen as a husband and father, and I consider him to be one of the most agreeable men to associate with daily. But, God bless me, I speak as if I wished the union, but that is far from my desire. I would much rather keep my daughters at home, so long as they find themselves happy with me. But when girls grow up, there is never any peace to depend on. I wish all lovers and questioners a long way off. Here we could live all together as in a kingdom of heaven, now that we have gotten everything in such order. Some small improvements may still be wanted, but this will be all right if we are only left in peace. I have been thinking that we could so easily make a wardrobe here, do you see, on this side of the wall? Don't you think if we were to open— What, are you asleep already, my dear? Louise was often teased about Cousin Thor. Cousin Thor was often teased about Cousin Louise. He liked very much to be teased about his Cousin Louise, and it gave him great pleasure to be told that Ostenvik wanted a mistress, that he himself wanted a good wife, and that Louise Frank was decidedly one of the wisest and most amiable girls in the whole neighborhood, and of the most respectable family. The landed proprietor was half ready to receive congratulations on his betrothal. What the supposed bride thought about the matter, however, is difficult to divine. Louise was certainly always polite to her cousin Thor, but more indifference than attachment seemed to be expressed in this politeness, and she declined, with a decision astonishing to many a person, his constantly repeated invitations to make a tour of Ostenvik in his new landau driven by my chestnut horses, four in hand. It was said by many that the agreeable and friendly Jacobi was much nearer to Louisa's heart than the rich landed proprietor, but even towards Jacobi her behavior was so uniform, so quiet, and so unconstrained that nobody knew what to think. Very few knew so well as we do that Louise considered it in accordance with the dignity of a woman to show perfect indifference to the attentions, or du propre, of men, until they had openly and fully explained themselves. She despised coquetry to that degree that she feared everything which had the least appearance of it. Her young friends used to joke with her upon her strong notions in this respect, and often told her that she would remain unmarried. That may be, answered Louise calmly. One day she was told that a gentleman had said, I will not stand up for any girl who is not coquettish. Then he may remain sitting, answered Louise, with a great deal of dignity. Louise's views with regard to the dignity of woman, her serious and decided principles, and her manner of expressing them, amused her young friends, at the same time that they inspired them with great regard for her, and caused many little contentions and discussions in which Louise fearlessly, though not without some excess, defended what was right. These contentions, which began in merriment, sometimes ended quite differently. A young and somewhat coquettish married lady felt herself one day wounded by the severity with which Louise judged the coquetry of her sex, particularly of married ladies, and in revenge she made use of some words which awakened Louise's astonishment and anger at the same time. An explanation followed between the two, the consequence of which was a complete rupture between Louise and the young lady, together with an altered disposition of mind in the former, which she in vain attempted to conceal. She had been unusually joyous and lively during the first days of her stay at Axelholm, but now she became silent and thoughtful, often absent, and some people thought that she seemed less friendly than formerly towards the candidate, but somewhat more attentive to the landed proprietor, although she constantly declined his invitation to take a tour of Ostenvik. The evening after this explanation took place, Elise was engaged with Jacobi in a lively conversation in the balcony. "'And if,' said Jacobi, if I endeavor to win her affections, oh, tell me, would her parents, would her mother see it without displeasure? Ah, speak openly with me. The happiness of my life depends upon it. You have my approval and my good wishes, answered Elise. I tell you now what I have often told my husband, that I should very much like to call you my son. Oh, exclaimed Jacobi, deeply affected, falling on his knees and pressing Elise's hand to his lips. Oh, that every act in my life might prove my gratitude, my love. At this moment Louise, who had been looking for her mother, approached the balcony. 
She saw Jacoby's action and heard his words. She withdrew quickly, as if she had been stung by a serpent. From this time a great change was more and more perceptible in her. Silent, shy, and very pale, she moved about like a dreaming person in the merry circle at Axelholm, and willingly agreed to her mother's proposal to shorten her stay at this place. Jacoby, who was as much astonished as sorry at Louisa's sudden unfriendliness towards him, began to think the place was somehow bewitched, and wished more than once to leave it. A FAMILY PICTURE The family is assembled in the library. Tea is just finished. Louise, at the pressing request of Gabrielle and Petra, lays out the cards in order to tell the sisters their fortune. The candidate seats himself beside her and seems to have made up his mind to be a little more cheerful, but then the object looks more like a cathedral than ever. The landed proprietor enters, bows, blows his nose, and kisses the hand of his gracious aunt. Landed proprietor. Very cold this evening. I think we shall have frost. Elise. It is a miserable spring. We have just read a melancholy account of the famine in the northern provinces. These years of dearth are truly unfortunate. Landed proprietor. Oh, yes, the famine up there. No, let us talk of something else. That is too gloomy. I have had my peas covered with straw. Cousin Louise, are you fond of playing patience? I am very fond of it myself. It is so composing. At Ostenvik I have got very small cards for patients. I am quite sure you would like them, Cousin Louise. The landed proprietor seats himself on the other side of Louise. The candidate is seized with a fit of curious shrugs. Louise, this is not patience, but a little conjuring by means of which I can tell future things. Shall I tell your fortune, Cousin Thor? Landed proprietor, oh, yes, do tell my fortune, but don't tell me anything disagreeable. If I hear anything disagreeable in the evening, I always dream of it at night. Tell me now from the cards that I shall have a pretty little wife, a wife beautiful and amiable as Cousin Louise. The candidate, with an expression in his eyes as if he would send the landed proprietor head over heels to Ostenvik, I don't know whether Miss Louise likes flattery. Landed proprietor, who takes no notice of his rival. Cousin Louise, are you fond of blue? Louise. Blue? It is a pretty color, but I almost like green better. Landed proprietor. Well, that is very droll. It suits exceedingly well. At Ostenvik my drawing-room furniture is blue, beautiful light blue satin, but in my bedroom I have green moreen. Cousin Louise, I believe really. The candidate coughs as though he were going to be suffocated and rushes out of the room. Louise looks after him and sighs and afterwards sees in the card so many misfortunes for Cousin Thor that he is quite frightened. The peas frosted, conflagration in the drawing-room, and at last a basket, the mitten. The landed proprietor declares still laughingly that he will not receive a basket. The sisters smile and make their remarks. End of section 3「Section 4 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. By various authors, Section 4, Selected Poems of Clemens Brentano. Clemens Brentano, 1778-1842 to 1842. The intellectual upheaval in Germany at the beginning of this century brought a host of remarkable characters upon the literary stage, and none more gifted, more whimsical, more winning than Clemens Brentano, the erratic son of a brilliant family. Born September 8, 1778, at Ehrenbreitenstein, Brentano spent his youth among the stimulating influences which accompanied the renaissance of German culture. His grandmother, Sophie de la Roche, had been the close friend of Wieland, and his mother the youthful companion of Goethe. Clemens, after a vain attempt to follow in the mercantile footsteps of his father, went to Jena, where he met the Schlegels, and here his brilliant but unsteady literary career began. In 1803 he married the talented Sophie Moreau, but three years later his happiness was terminated by her death. His next matrimonial venture was, however, a failure. 
an elopement in 1808 with the daughter of a Frankfurt banker, was quickly followed by a divorce, and he thereafter led an uncontrolled life of an errant poet. Among his early writings, published under the pseudonym of Marie, were several satires and dramas and a novel entitled God Be, which he himself called A Romance Gone Mad. The meeting with Achim von Arnim, who subsequently married his sister Bettina, decided his fate. He embarked in literature once and for all in close association with von Arnim. Together they compiled a collection of several hundred folk songs of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries under the name of Des Knaben Wunderhorn, The Boy's Wonderhorn, 1806 to 1808. That so musical a people as the Germans should be masters of lyric poetry is but natural. Every longing, every impression, every impulse gushes into song, and in Des Knaben Wunderhorn we hear the tuneful voices of a naive race singing what they have seen or dreamt or felt during three hundred years. The work is dedicated to Goethe, who wrote an almost enthusiastic review of it for the literary gazette of Jena. Every lover or master of musical art, he says, should have this volume upon his piano. The Wunderhorn was greeted by the German public with extraordinary cordiality. It was in fact an epoch-making work, the pioneer in the new field of German folk poetry. It carried out in a purely national spirit the efforts which Herder had made in behalf of the folk songs of all peoples. It revealed the spirits of the time. 1806 was the year of the Battle of Jena, and Germany in her hour of deepest humiliation gave ear to the encouraging voices from out her own past. The editors of the Wunderhorn, said their friend Görres, have deserved of their countrymen a civic crown, for having saved from destruction what yet remained to be saved. And on this civic crown the poet's laurels are still green. Brentano's contagious laughter may even now be heard re-echoing through the pages of his book on The Philistine, 1811. His dramatic power is evinced in the broadly conceived play Die Gründung Prags, The Foundation of Prague, 1815. But it is upon two stories told in the simple style of the folk tale that his widest popularity is founded. Die Geschichte vom braven Kasperl und der schönen Annal, the story of good Kasper and pretty Annie, and his fable of Gockel, Hinkel und Gackeleia, both of the year 1838, are still an indispensable part of the reading of every German boy and girl. Like his brilliant sister, Brentano is a fascinating figure in literature. He was amiable and winning, full of quips and cranks, and with an inexhaustible fund of stories. Astonishing tales of adventure, related with great circumstantiality of detail, and of which he himself was the hero, played an important part in his conversation. Tieck once said he had never known a better improvisator than Brentano, nor one who could lie more gracefully. When Brentano was forty years of age, a total change came over his life. The witty and fascinating man of the world was transformed into a pious and gloomy ascetic. The visions of the stigmatized nun of Dülmen, Katharina Emmerich, attracted him, and he remained under her influence until her death in 1824. These visions he subsequently published as The Life of the Virgin Mary. The eccentricities of his later years bordered upon insanity. He died in the Catholic faith in the year 1842. The Nurse's Watch From The Boy's Wonderhorn The moon, it shines, my darling wines. The clock strikes twelve. God cheer the sick both far and near. God knoweth all. Mousy nibbles in the wall. The clock strikes one. Like day, dreams, all thy pillow play. The matin bell wakes the nun in convent cell. The clock strikes two. They go to choir in a row. The wind it blows, the cock it crows. The clock strikes three. The wagoner in his straw bed begins to stir. The steed he paws the floor, creaks the stable door. The clock strikes four. Tis plain, the coachman sifts his crane. The swallows laugh, the still air shakes. The sun awakes. The clock strikes five. The traveller must be gone. He puts his stockings on. The hen is clacking. The ducks are quacking. 
the clock strikes six. Awake, arise, thou lazy hag, come, ope thy eyes. Quick to the baker's run, the rolls are done, the clock strikes seven. This time the milk were in the oven, put in some butter, do, and some fine sugar, too. The clock strikes eight, now bring my baby's porridge straight. English by Charles T. Brooks The Castle in Austria From The Boy's Wonderhorn There lies a castle in Austria, right goodly to behold, wall tipped with marble stones so fair, with silver and with red gold. Therein lies captive a young boy, for life and death he lies bound, full forty fathoms under the earth, midst vipers and snakes around. His father came from Rosenberg, before the tower he went, my son, my dearest son, how hard is thy imprisonment! O oh, father, dearest father mine, so hardly I am bound, Full forty fathoms under the earth, midst vipers and snakes around. His father went before the Lord, let loose my captive to me. I have at home three casks of gold, and these for the boy I'll gee. Three casks of gold, they help you not that boy, and he must die. He wears round his neck a golden chain, therein doth his ruin lie. And if he thus wear a golden chain, he hath not stolen it, nay. A maiden good gave it to him, for true love did she say. They led the boy forth from the tower, and a sacrament took he. Help thou, rich Christ, from heaven high, it's come to an end with me. They led him to the scaffold place, up the ladder he must go. O headsman, dearest headsman, do but a short respite allow. A short respite thou must not grant, thou wouldst escape and fly. Reach me a silken handkerchief around his eyes to tie. Oh, do not, do not bind mine eyes, I must look on the world so fine. I see it today, then never more with these weeping eyes of mine. His father near the scaffold stood, and his heart it almost rends. O oh, my son, O oh, thou my dearest son, thy death I will avenge. O oh, father, dearest father mine, my death thou shalt not avenge. It would bring to my soul but heavy pains. Let me die in innocence. It is not for this life of mine, not for my body proud. Tis but for my dear mother's sake, at home she weeps so loud. Not yet three days had passed away, when an angel from heaven came down. Take ye the boy from the scaffold away, else the city shall sink under crown. And not six months had passed away, ere his death was avenged amain, and upwards of three hundred men for the boy's life were slain. Who is it that hath made this lay, hath sung it, and so on? That, in Vienna, in Austria, three hundred maidens fair have done. End of section 4 Recording by Dom Bombadil Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Literature Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 5, Selected Excerpts by Elisabeth Brentano. Elisabeth Brentano, also known as Bettina von Arnim, 1785 to 1859. No picture of German life at the beginning of this century would be complete which did not include the distinguished women who left their mark upon the time. Among these, Bettina von Arnim stands easily foremost. There was something triumphant in her nature, which in her youth manifested itself in her splendid enthusiasm for the two greatest geniuses who dominated her life, Goethe and Beethoven and which, in the lean years when Germany was overclouded, maintained itself by an inexhaustible optimism. Her merry willfulness and wit covered a warm heart and a vigorous mind, 
and both of her great idols understood her and took her seriously. Elisabeth Brentano was the daughter of Goethe's friend, Maximilian de la Roche. She was born at Frankfurt on the Main in 1785, and was brought up after the death of her mother under the somewhat peculiar influence of the highly strung Caroline von Günderode. Through her filial intimacy with Goethe's mother, she came to know the poet, and out of their friendship grew the correspondence which formed the basis of Bettina's famous book, Goethe's Briefwechsel mit einem Kinde, Goethe's correspondence with a child. She attached herself with unbounded enthusiasm to Goethe, and he responded with affectionate tact. To him Bettina was the embodiment of the loving grace and willfulness of Mignon. In 1811 these relations were interrupted, owing to Bettina's attitude towards Goethe's wife. In the same year she married Achim von Arnim, one of the most refined poets and noblest characters of that brilliant circle. The marriage was an ideal one. Each cherished and delighted in the genius of the other. But in 1831 the death of von Arnim brought this happiness to an end. Goethe died in the following year, and Germany went into mourning. Then, in 1835, Bettina appeared before the world for the first time as an authoress, in Goethe's correspondence with a child. The dithyrambic exaltation, the unrestrained but beautiful enthusiasm of the book, came like an electric shock. Into an atmosphere of spiritual stagnation, these letters brought a fresh access of vitality and hope. Bettina's old friendly relations with Goethe had been resumed later in life and in a letter written to her niece she gives a charming account to the visit to the poet in 1824 which proved to be her last. This letter first saw the light in 1896, and an extract from it has been included below. The inspiration which went out from Bettina's magnetic nature was profound. She had her part in every great movement of her time, from the liberation of Greece to the fight with cholera in Berlin. During the latter, her devotion to the cause of the suffering poor in Berlin opened her eyes to the miseries of the common people, and she wrote a work full of indignant fervor, Dies Buch gehört dem König, this book belongs to the king, in consequence of which her welcome at the court of Frederick Wilhelm IV grew cool. A subsequent book, written in a similar vein, was suppressed. But Bettina's love of the people, as of every cause in which she was interested, was genuine and not to be quenched. She acted upon the maxim once expressed by Emerson, every brave heart must treat society as a child, and never allow it to dictate. Emerson greatly admired Bettina, and Louisa M. Alcott relates that she first made acquaintance with the famous correspondence when in her girlhood she was left to browse in Emerson's library. Bettina's influence was most keenly felt by the young, and she had the youth of Germany at her feet. She died in 1859. There is in Weimar a picture in which are represented the literary men of the period, grouped as in Raphael's school of Athens, with Goethe and Schiller occupying the centre. Upon the broad steps, which lead to the elevation where they are standing, is the girlish figure of Bettina, bending forward and holding a laurel wreath in her hand. This is the position which she occupies in the history of German literature. Dedication to Goethe from Goethe's Correspondence with a Child Thou who knowest love, and the refinement of sentiment, oh, how beautiful is everything in thee! How the streams of life rush through thy sensitive heart, and blunge with force into the cold waves of thy time, then boil and bubble up till mountain and vale flush with the glow of life, and the forests stand with glistening boughs upon the shore of thy being, and all upon which rests thy glance, is filled with happiness and life. O oh God, how happy were I with thee, and were I winging my flight far over all times, and far over thee, I would fold my pinions and yield myself wholly to the domination of thine eyes. Men will never understand thee, and those nearest to thee will most thoroughly disown and betray thee. I look into the future, and I hear them cry, Stone him! Now, when thine own inspiration, like a lion, stands beside thee and guards thee, vulgarity ventures not to approach thee. Thy mother said recently, The men today are all like churning, who always say, We the superfluous learned. And she speaks truly, for he is superfluous. 
rather be dead than superfluous. But I am not so, for I am thine, because I recognize thee in all things. I know that when the clouds lift themselves up before the sun god, they will soon be depressed by his fiery hand. I know that he endures no shadow except that which his own fame seeks. The rest of consciousness will overshadow thee. I know when he descends in the evening that he will again appear in the morning of golden front. Thou art eternal, therefore it is good for me to be with thee. When in the evening I am alone in my dark room, and the neighbor's lights are thrown upon my wall, they sometimes light up thy bust. Or when all is silent in the city, here and there a dog barks or a cock crows. I know not why, but it seems something beyond human to me. I know what I shall do to still my pain. I would fain speak with thee otherwise than with words. I would fain press myself to thy heart. I feel that my soul is aflame. How fearful still is the air before the storm! So stand now my thoughts, cold and silent, and my heart surges like the sea. Dear, dear Goethe, a reminiscence of thee breaks the spell. The signs of fire and warfare sink slowly down in my sky, and thou art like the in-streaming moonlight. Thou art great and glorious, and better than all that I have ever known and experienced up to this time. Thy whole life is so good. To Goethe Kassel, August 13th, 1807 Who can interpret and measure what is passing within me? I am happy now in remembrance of the past, which as ghastly was when the past was the present. To my sensitive heart, the surprise of being with thee, and the coming and going and returning in a few blessed days, this was all like clouds fitting across my heaven. Through my too near presence I feared it might be darkened by my shadow, as it is ever darker when it nears the earth. Now in the distance it is mild and lofty and ever clear. I would fain press thy dear hand with both of mine to my bosom, and say to thee, How peace and content have come to me since I have known thee. I know that the evening has not come when life's twilight gathers in my heart. Oh, would it wear so! Would that I have lived out my days, that my wishes and joys were fulfilled, and that they could all be heaped upon thee, that thou might be therewith decked and crowned as of evergreen base. When I was alone with thee on that evening, I could not comprehend thee. Thou didst smile at me because I was moved, and laughed at me because I wept. But why? And yet it was thy laughter, the tone of thy laughter, which moved me to tears and I am content and see, under the cloak of this riddle, roses burst forth which bring alike from sadness and joy. Yes, thou art right, prophet. I shall yet with light heart struggle up through chest and mirth. I shall weary myself with struggling as I did in my childhood. Ah, it seems as if it were but yesterday. One of the exuberance of joy, I wandered through the blossoming fields, pulling up the flowers by the roots, and throwing them into the water. But I wish to seek rest in a warm, firm earnestness, and there at hand standest thou, smiling prophet. I say to thee yet once more, whoever in this wide world understands what is passing within me, who am so restful in thee, so silent, so unwavering in my feeling. I could, like the mountains, bear nights and days in the past without disturbing thee in thy reflections. And yet, when at times the wind bears the fragrance and the germs together from the blossoming world up to the mountain heights, they will be intoxicated with the lights as I was yesterday. Then I loved the world, then I was as glad as a gushing, murmuring spring in which the sun for the first time shines. Farewell, sublime one, who blindness then intimidates me. From this steep rock upon which my love, as in life danger ventured, I cannot clamber down, I cannot think of descending, for I should break my neck in the attempt. Bettina's Last Meeting with Goethe From a letter to her niece in 1824 
first published in 1896. In the evening I was alone again with Goethe. Had anyone observed this, he would have had something to tell to posterity. Goethe's peculiarities were exhibited to the full. First he would growl at me, then to make it all up again he would caress me with the most flattering words. His bottle of wine he kept in the adjoining room, because I had reproached him for his drinking the night before. On some pretext or other, he disappeared from the scene half a dozen times in order to drink a glass. I pretended to notice nothing, but at parting I told him that twelve glasses of wine wouldn't hurt him, and that he had had only six. How do you know that so positively? he said. I heard the gurgle of the bottle in the next room, and I heard you drinking, and then you have betrayed yourself to me, as Solomon in the Song of Songs betrayed himself to his beloved by your breath. You are an arrogant rogue, he said. Now take yourself off. And he brought the candle to light me out. But I sprang in front of him and knelt upon the threshold of the room. Now I shall see if I can shut you in, and whether you are a good spirit or an evil one, like the rat in Faust. I kiss this threshold and bless it, for over it daily passes the most glorious human spirit and my best friend. Over you and your love I shall never pass, he answered. It is too dear to me. And around your spirit I creep so. And he carefully paced around the spot where I was kneeling. For you are too artful, and it is better to keep on good terms with you. And so he dismissed me with tears in his eyes. I remained standing in the dark before his door to gulp down my emotion. I was thinking that this door, which I had closed with my own hand, had separated me from him in all probability forever. Whoever comes near him must confess that his genius has partly passed into goodness. The fiery sun of his spirit is transformed at its setting into a soft purple light. In Goethe's Garden I from this hillock all my world survey. Yon vale, bedecked by nature's fairy fingers, Where the still by-road picturesquely lingers, The cottage white, whose quaint charms grace the way. These are the scenes that o'er my heart hold sway. I from this hillock all my world survey, Though I ascend to heights fair lands dividing, Where stately ships I see the ocean riding, While cities skirt the view in proud array, Nought prompts my heart's impulses to obey. I from this hillock all my world survey, And could I stand while paradise is crying, Still for these verdant meats should I be sighing, Where thy dear roof peaks skirt the verdant way, Beyond these bounds my heart longs not to stray. End of section 5 Recording by Dom Bombadil Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosehip Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors, Section 6, Selected Excerpts of Speeches by John Bright. John Bright, 1811-1889 John Bright was the modern representative of the ancient tribunes of the people or demagogues, in the original and perfectly honourable sense, and a full comparison of his work and position with those of the Cleons or the Gracchi would almost be an outline of the respective people's polities and problems. He was a higher type of man and politician than Cleon, largely because the English aristocracy is not an unpatriotic and unprincipled clique like the Athenian, 
ready to use any weapon from murder down or to make their country a province of a foreign empire rather than give up their class monopoly of power. But like his prototype, he was a democrat by nature as well as profession, the welfare of the common people at once his passion and his political livelihood, full of faith that popular instincts are both morally right and intellectually sound and all his own instincts and most of his labours antagonistic to those of the aristocracy. It is a phase of the same fact to say that he also represented the active force of religious feeling in politics as opposed to pure secular statesmanship. The son of a Quaker manufacturer of Rochdale, England, and born near that place November 16, 1811, he began his public career when a mere boy as a stirring and effective temperance orator, his ready eloquence and intense earnestness prevailing over an ungraceful manner and a bad delivery. He wrought all his life for popular education and for the widest extension of the franchise, and being a Quaker and a member of the Peace Society, he opposed all war on principle, fighting the Crimean War bitterly and leaving the Gladstone Cabinet in 1882 on account of the bombardment of Alexandria. He was retired from the service of the public for some time on account of his opposition to the Crimean War, but Mr. Gladstone, who differed from him on this point, calls it the action of his life most worthy of honour. He was perhaps the most warlike opponent of war ever high in public life, the pugnacious and aggressive agitator pouring out floods of fiery oratory to the effect that nobody ought to fight anybody, was a curious paradox. He was by far the most influential English friend of the North in the Civil War, and the magic of his eloquence and his name was a force of perhaps decisive potency in keeping the working classes on the same side so that mass meetings of unemployed labourers with half-starving families resolved that they would rather starve altogether than help to perpetuate slavery in America. He shares with Richard Cobden the credit of having obtained free trade for England. Bright's thrilling oratory was second only to Cobden's organising power in winning the victory and both had the immense weight of manufacturers opposing their own class. That he opposed the game laws and favoured electoral reform is a matter of course. Mr. Bright entered on an active political career in 1839, when he joined the Anti-Corn Law League. He first became a Member of Parliament in 1843 and illustrates a most valuable feature of English political practice. When a change of feeling in one place prevented his re-election, he selected another which was glad to honour itself by having a great man represent it, so that the country was not robbed of a statesman by a village faction and there being no spoils system, he did not have to waste his time in office jobbing to keep his seat. He sat first for Durham, then for Manchester, and finally for Birmingham, remaining in public life over forty years, and never had to make a deal or get anyone an office in all that period. He was in Mr. Gladstone's cabinet from 1868 to 1870, and again from 1873 to 1882. On the home rule question, the two old friends and long co-workers divided. Mr. Bright, with more than half the oldest and sincerest friends of liberty and haters of oppression in England, holding the step to be political suicide for the British Empire. As an orator, Mr. Bright stood in a sense alone. He was direct and logical. 
he carefully collected and massed his facts and used strong homely saxon english and short crisp words he was a master of telling epigram whose force lay in its truth as much as in its humour several volumes of his speeches have been published on public affairs on parliamentary reform on questions of public policy on the american question etc his life has been written by gilchrist smith robertson and others he died march twenty seventh eighteen eighty nine from the speech on the corn laws eighteen forty three it must not be supposed because i wish to represent the interest of the many that i am hostile to the interest of the few but is it not perfectly certain that if the foundation of the most magnificent building be destroyed and undermined the whole fabric itself is in danger is it not certain also that the vast body of the people who form the foundation of the social fabric if they are suffering if they are trampled upon if they are degraded if they are discontented if their hands are against every man and every man's hands are against them if they do not flourish as well reasonably speaking as the classes who are above them because they are richer and more powerful then are those classes as much in danger as the working classes themselves there never was a revolution in any country which destroyed the great body of the people there have been convulsions of a most dire character which have overturned old established monarchies and have hurled thrones and sceptres to the dust there have been revolutions which have brought down most powerful aristocracies and swept them from the face of the earth for ever but never was there a revolution yet which destroyed the people and whatever may come as a consequence of the state of things in this country of this we may rest assured that the common people that the great bulk of our countrymen will remain and survive the shock though it may be that the crown and the aristocracy and the church may be levelled with the dust and rise no more in seeking to represent the working classes and in standing up for their rights and liberties i hold that i am also defending the rights and liberties of the middle and richer classes of society doing justice to one class cannot inflict injustice on any other class and justice and impartiality to all is what we all have a right to from government and we have a right to clamour and so long as i have breath so long will i clamour against the oppression which i see to exist and in favour of the rights of the great body of the people what is the condition in which we are i have already spoken of ireland you know that hundreds of thousands meet there week after week in various parts of the country to proclaim to all the world the tyranny under which they suffer you know that in south wales at this moment there is an insurrection of the most extraordinary character going on and that the government is sending day after day soldiers and artillery amongst the innocent inhabitants of that mountainous country for the purpose of putting down the insurrection thereby raised and carried on you know that in the staffordshire ironworks almost all the workmen are now out and in want of wages from want of employment and from attempting to resist the inevitable reduction of wages which must follow restriction upon trade you know that in august last lancashire and yorkshire rose in peaceful insurrection to proclaim to the world and in face of heaven the wrongs of an insulted and oppressed people i know that my own neighbourhood is unsettled and uncomfortable i know 
that in your own city your families are suffering. Yes, I have been to your cottages and seen their condition. Thanks to my canvas of Durham, I have been able to see the condition of many honest and independent, or ought to be independent, and industrious artisans. I have seen even free men of your city sitting, looking disconsolate and sad. Their hands were ready to labour, their skill was ready to produce all that their trade demanded. They were as honest and industrious as any man in this assembly, but no man hired them. They were in a state of involuntary idleness and were driving fast to the point of pauperism. I have seen their wives, too, with three or four children about them, one in the cradle, one at the breast. I have seen their countenances, and I have seen the signs of their sufferings. I have seen the emblems and symbols of affliction such as I did not expect to see in this city. I, and I have seen those little children, who at not a distant day will be the men and women of this city of Durham. I have seen their poor little wan faces and anxious looks, as if the furrows of old age were coming upon them before they had escaped from the age of childhood. I have seen all this in this city, and I have seen far more in the neighbourhood from which I have come. You have seen, in all probability, people from my neighbourhood walking your streets and begging for that bread which the Corn Laws would not allow them to earn. Bread-taxed weaver all can see what the tax hath done for thee, and thy children, vilely led, singing hymns for shameful bread, till the stones of every street know their little naked feet. This is what the Corn Law does for the weavers of my neighbourhood and for the weavers and artisans of yours. From the speech on incendiarism in Ireland, 1844. The great and all-present evil of the rural districts is this. You have too many people for the work to be done, and you, the landed proprietors, are alone responsible for this state of things. And to speak honestly, I believe many of you know it. I have been charged with saying out of doors that this house is a club of landowners legislating for landowners. If I had not said it, the public must long ago have found out that fact. My honourable friend, the member for Stockport, on one occasion, proposed that before you passed a law to raise the price of bread, you should consider how far you had the power to raise the rates of wages. What did you say to that? You said that the labourers did not understand political economy, or they would not apply to Parliament to raise wages, that Parliament could not raise wages. And yet the very next thing you did was to pass a law to raise the price of produce of your own land at the expense of the very class whose wages you confessed your inability to increase. What is the condition of the county of Suffolk? Is it not notorious that the rents are as high as they were fifty years ago, and probably much higher? But the return for the farmer's capital is much lower, and the condition of the labourer is very much worse. The farmers are subject to the law of competition, and rents are thereby raised from time to time, so as to keep their profits down to the lowest point, and the labourers, by the competition amongst them, are reduced to the point below which life cannot be maintained. Your tenants and labourers are being devoured by this excessive competition, whilst you, their magnanimous landlords, shelter yourselves from all competition by the corn law yourselves have passed, and make the competition of all other classes serve still more to swell your rentals. 
it was for this object the Corn Law was passed, and yet in the face of your countrymen you dare to call it a law for the protection of native industry. Again, a rural police is kept up by the gentry. The farmers say for the sole use of watching game and frightening poachers, for which formerly they had to pay watchers. Is this true, or is it not? I say, then, you care everything for the rights, and for something beyond the rights, of your own property, but you are oblivious to its duties. How many lives have been sacrificed during the past year to the childish infatuation of preserving game? The noble lord, the member for North Lancashire, could tell of a gamekeeper killed in an affray on his father's estate in that county. For the offence, one man was hanged, and four men are now on their way to penal colonies. Six families are thus deprived of husband and father, that this wretched system of game-preserving may be continued in a country densely peopled as this is. The Marquis of Normanby's gamekeeper has been murdered also, and the poacher who shot him only escaped death by the intervention of the Home Secretary. At Godalming, in Surrey, a gamekeeper has been murdered, and at Buckhill, in Buckinghamshire, a person has recently been killed in a poaching affray. This insane system is the cause of a fearful loss of life. It tends to the ruin of your tenantry, and is the fruitful cause of the demoralization of the peasantry. But you are caring for the rights of property, for its most obvious duties you have no concern. With such a policy, what can you expect but that which is now passing before you? It is the remark of a beautiful writer that to have known nothing but misery is the most portentous condition under which human nature can start on its course. Has your agricultural labourer ever known anything but misery? He is born in a miserable hovel, which in mockery is termed a house or a home. He is reared in penury. He passes a life of hopeless and unrequited toil, and the jail or the union house is before him as the only asylum on this side of the pauper's grave. Is this the result of your protection to native industry? Have you cared for the labourer till, from a home of comfort, he has but a hovel for shelter? And have you cherished him into starvation and rags? I tell you what your boasted protection is. It is a protection of native idleness at the expense of the impoverishment of native industry. From the speech on non-recognition of the Southern Confederacy, 1861. I advise you, and I advise the people of England, to abstain from applying to the United States doctrines and principles which we never apply to our own case. At any rate, they, the Americans, have never fought for the balance of power in Europe. They have never fought to keep up a decaying empire. They have never squandered the money of their people in such a phantom expedition as we have been engaged in. And now, at this moment, when you are told that they are going to be ruined by their vast expenditure, why, the sum that they are going to raise in the great emergency of this grievous war is not greater than what we raise every year during a time of peace. They say they are not going to liberate slaves. No, the object of the Washington government is to maintain their own constitution and to act legally as it permits and requires. No man is more in favour of peace than I am. No man has denounced war more than I have, probably, in this country. Few men in their public life have suffered more obloquy I had almost said more indignity in consequence of it. But I cannot for the life of me see, upon any of those principles upon which states are governed now, I say nothing of the literal word of the New Testament. 
I cannot see how the state of affairs in America with regard to the United States government could have been different from what it is at this moment. We had a heptarchy in this country, and it was thought to be a good thing to get rid of it and have a united nation. If the 33 or 34 states of the American Union can break off whenever they like, I can see nothing but disaster and confusion throughout the whole of that continent. I say that the war, be it successful or not, be it Christian or not, be it wise or not, is a war to sustain the government and to sustain the authority of a great nation, and that the people of England, if they are true to their own sympathies, to their own history, and to their own great act of 1834, to which reference has already been made, will have no sympathy with those who wish to build up a great empire on the perpetual bondage of millions of their fellow men. From the Speech on the State of Ireland, 1866 I think I was told in 1849, as I stood in the burial ground at Skibbereen, that at least four hundred people who had died of famine were buried within the quarter of an acre of ground on which I was then looking. It is a country, too, from which there has been a greater emigration by sea within a given time than has been known at any time from any other country in the world. It is a country where there has been, for generations past, a general sense of wrong, out of which has grown a chronic state of insurrection. And at this very moment when I speak, the general safeguard of constitutional liberty is withdrawn, and we meet in this hall, and I speak here tonight, rather by the forbearance and permission of the Irish executive, than under the protection of the common safeguards of the rights and liberties of the people of the United Kingdom. I venture to say that this is a miserable and humiliating picture to draw of this country. Bear in mind that I am not speaking of Poland, suffering under the conquest of Russia. There is a gentleman, now a candidate for an Irish county, who is very great upon the wrongs of Poland. But I have found him always in the House of Commons, taking sides with that great party which has systematically supported the wrongs of Ireland. I am not speaking of Hungary, or of Venice, as she was under the rule of Austria, or of the Greeks under the dominion of the Turk. But I am speaking of Ireland, part of the United Kingdom, part of that which boasts itself to be the most civilised and the most Christian nation in the world. I took the liberty recently, at a meeting in Glasgow, to say that I believed it was impossible for a class to govern a great nation wisely and justly. Now in Ireland, there has been a field in which all the principles of the Tory party have had their complete experiment and development. You have had the country gentleman in all his power. You have had any number of Acts of Parliament which the ancient Parliament of Ireland or the Parliament of the United Kingdom could give him. You have had the established church supported by the law, even to the extent, not many years ago, of collecting its revenues by the aid of military force. In point of fact, I believe it would be impossible to imagine a state of things in which the Tory party should have a more entire and complete opportunity for their trial than they have had within the limits of this island. And yet, what has happened? This, surely that the kingdom has been continually weakened, that the harmony of the empire has been disturbed, and that the mischief has not been confined to the United Kingdom, but has spread to the colonies. I am told, you can answer it if I am wrong, that it is not common in Ireland now to give leases to tenants, especially to Catholic tenants. If that be so, 
then the security for the property rests only upon the good feeling and favour of the owner of the land, for the laws, as we know, have been made by the land owners, and many propositions for the advantage of the tenants have unfortunately been too little considered by Parliament. The result is that you have bad farming, bad dwelling houses, bad temper, and everything bad connected with the occupation and cultivation of land in Ireland. One of the results, a result the most appalling, is this, that your population is fleeing your country and seeking refuge in a distant land. On this point, I wish to refer to a letter which I received a few days ago from a most esteemed citizen of Dublin. He told me that he believed that a very large portion of what he called the poor amongst Irishmen sympathised with any scheme or any proposition that was adverse to the imperial government. He said further that the people here are rather in the country than of it, and that they are looking more to America than they are looking to England. I think there is a good deal in that. When we consider how many Irishmen have found a refuge in America, I do not know how we can wonder at that statement. You will recollect that when the ancient Hebrew prophet prayed in his captivity, he prayed with his window open towards Jerusalem. You know that the followers of Muhammad, when they pray, turn their faces towards Mecca. When the Irish peasant asks for food and freedom and blessing, his eye follows the setting sun, the aspirations of his heart reach beyond the wide Atlantic, and in spirit he grasps hands with the great republic of the West. If this be so, I say then that the disease is not only serious, but it is desperate. But desperate as it is, I believe there is a certain remedy for it if the people and Parliament of the United Kingdom are willing to apply it. I believe that at the root of a general discontent there is in all countries a general grievance and general suffering. The surface of society is not incessantly disturbed without a cause. I recollect in the poem of the greatest of Italian poets, he tells us that as he saw in vision the Stygian lake and stood upon its banks, he observed the constant commotion upon the surface of the pool, and his good instructor and guide explained to him the cause of it. This, too, for certain know, that underneath the watered wells a multitude, whose sighs into these bubbles make the surface heave, as thine eye tells thee wheresoe'er it turn. And I say that in Ireland, for generations back, the misery and the wrongs of the people have made their sign, and have found a voice in constant insurrection and disorder. I have said that Ireland is a country of many wrongs and of many sorrows, her past lies almost in shadow, her present is full of anxiety and peril, her future depends on the power of her people to substitute equality and justice for supremacy, and a generous patriotism for the spirit of faction. In the effort now making in Great Britain to create a free representation of the people, you have the deepest interest. The people never wish to suffer, and they never wish to inflict injustice. They have no sympathy with the wrongdoer, whether in Great Britain or in Ireland, and when they are fairly represented in the Imperial Parliament, as I hope they will one day be, they will speedily give an effective and final answer to that old question of the Parliament of Kilkenny. How comes it to pass that the king has never been the richer for Ireland. From the speech on the Irish Established Church, 1868 I am one of those who do not believe that the Established Church of Ireland, of which I am not a member, would go to absolute ruin in the manner of which many of its friends are now so fearful. There was a paper sent to me this morning called 
an address from the Protestants of Ireland to their Protestant brethren of Great Britain. It is dated 5 Dawson Street, and is signed by John Trant Hamilton, T. A. Lefroy, and R. W. Gamble. The paper is written in a fair and mild, and I would even say, for persons who have these opinions, in a kindly and just spirit. But they have been alarmed, and I would wish, if I can, to offer them consolation. They say they have no interest in protecting any abuses of the established church, but they protest against their being now deprived of the church of their fathers. Now I am quite of opinion that it would be a most monstrous thing to deprive the Protestants of the church of their fathers, and there is no man in the world who would more strenuously resist even any step in that direction than I would, unless it were Mr. Gladstone the author of the famous resolutions. The next sentence goes on to say, We ask for no ascendancy. Having read that sentence, I think that we must come to the conclusion that these gentlemen are in a better frame of mind than we thought them to be in. I can understand easily that these gentlemen are very sorry and doubtful as to the depths into which they are to be plunged, but I disagree with them in this, that I think there would still be a Protestant church in Ireland when all is done that Parliament has proposed to do. The only difference will be that it will not then be an establishment, that it will have no special favour or grant from the State, that it will stand in relation to the State just as your church does, and just as the churches of the majority of the people of Great Britain at this moment stand. There will then be no Protestant bishops from Ireland to sit in the House of Lords. But he must be the most enthusiastic Protestant and churchman who believes that there can be any advantage to his church and to Protestantism generally in Ireland from such a phenomenon. End of section 6 Section 7 of The World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors, Section 7, Selected Excerpts from The Privations, by Brillard Savarin. Brilia Savarin, seventeen fifty five to eighteen twenty six. Brilla Savarin was a French magistrate and legislator, whose reputation as man of letters rests mainly upon a single volume, his inimitable Physiologie du Goût. Although writing in the present century, he was essentially a Frenchman of the old regime. Having been born in 1755 at Belly, almost on the borderline of Savoy, where he afterwards gained distinction as an advocate. In later life, he regretted his native province chiefly for its big peckers superior in his opinion to ortolans or robins and for the cuisine of the innkeeper genin where the old timers of belly used to gather to eat chestnuts and drink the new white wine known as van borou 
after holding various minor offices in his department, Savarin became mayor of Belly in 1793, but the reign of terror soon forced him to flee to Switzerland and join the colony of French refugees at Lausanne. Souvenirs of this period are frequent in his Physiologie du Goût, all eminently gastronomic, as befits his subject matter, but full of interest, as showing his unfailing cheerfulness amidst the vicissitudes and privations of exile. He fled first to Dole, to obtain from the representative pro a safe conduct, which was to save me from going to prison, and there probably to the scaffold, and which he ultimately owed to Madame Pro, with whom he spent the evening playing duets, and who declared, Citizen, any one who cultivates the fine arts as you do cannot betray his country. It was not the safe conduct, however, but an unexpected dinner which he enjoyed on his route, that made this a red-letter day to Savarin. What a good dinner! I will not give the details, but an honourable mention is due to a fricassee of chicken, of the first order, such as cannot be found except in the provinces, and so richly dowered with truffles that there were enough to put new life into old Tithonus himself. The whole episode is told in Savarin's happiest vein, and well-nigh justifies his somewhat complacent conclusion that any one who, with a revolutionary committee at his heels, could so conduct himself, assuredly has the head and the heart of a Frenchman. Natural Scenery did not appeal to Savarin. To him, Switzerland meant the restaurant of the Lyon d'Agen at Lausanne, where for only fifteen bats we passed in review three complete courses. The table d'hôte of the Rue de Rosny and the little village of Moudon where the cheese fondue was so good. Circumstances, however, soon necessitated his departure for the United States, which he always gratefully remembered as having afforded him an asylum, employment, and tranquillity. For three years he supported himself in New York, giving French lessons, and at night playing in a theatre orchestra. I was so comfortable there, he writes, that in the moment of emotion which preceded departure, all that I asked of heaven, a prayer which it has granted, was never to know greater sorrow in the old world than I had known in the new. Returning to France in 1796, Savarin settled in Paris, and after holding several offices under the directory, became a judge in the Cour de Cassation, the French court of last resort, where he remained until his death in 1826. Although an able and conscientious magistrate, Savarin was better adapted to play the kindly friend and cordial host than the stern and impartial judge. He was a convivial soul, a lover of good cheer and free-handed hospitality, and to-day, while almost forgotten as a jurist, his name has become immortalised as the representative of gastronomic excellence. His Physiologie du Goût, that Ola Podrida, which defies analysis, as Balzac calls it, 
belongs, like Walton's complete angler, or White's Selborne, among those unique gems of literature, too rare in any age, which owe their subtle and imperishable charm primarily to the author's own delightful personality. Savarin spent many years of loving care in polishing his manuscript, often carrying it to court with him, where it was one day mislaid, but luckily for future generations of epicures, was afterward recovered. The book is a charming badinage, a bizarre ragout of gastronomic precepts and spicy anecdote, doubly piquant for its prevailing tone of mock seriousness and intentional grandiloquence. In emulation of the poet Lamartine, Savarin divided his subject into meditations, of which the seventh is consecrated to the theory of frying, and the twenty-first to corpulence. In the familiar aphorism, Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you what you are, he strikes his keynote. Man's true superiority lies in his palate. The pleasure of eating we have in common with the animals. The pleasure of the table is peculiar to the human species. Gastronomy, he proclaims, the chief of all sciences. It rules life in its entirety, for the tears of the newborn infant summon the breast of its nurse, and the dying man still receives with some pleasure the final potion which, alas, he is not destined to digest. Occasionally, he affects an epic strain, invoking Gasteria, the tenth muse, who presides over the pleasures of taste. It is the fairest of the muses who inspires me. I will be clearer than an oracle, and my precepts will traverse the centuries. Beneath his pen, soup, the first consolation of the needy stomach assumes fresh dignity, and even the humble fowl becomes to the cook what the canvas is to the painter, or the cap of Fortunatus to the charlatan. But like the worthy epicure that he was, Savarin reserved his highest flights of eloquence for such rare and toothsome viands as the poulard fan de bresse, the pheasant, an enigma of which the key word is known only to the adepts, a surte of truffles, the diamonds of the kitchen, or best of all truffled turkeys, whose reputation and price are ever on the increase, benign stars whose apparition renders the gourmands of every category sparkling, radiant, and quivering. But the true charm of the book lies in Savarin's endless fund of piquant anecdotes, reminiscences of bygone feasts, over which the reader's mouth waters. Who can read, without a covetous pang, his account of the day at home with the Bernardins, or of his entertainment of the Dubois brothers? A bonbon, which I have put into the reader's mouth, to recompense him for his kindness in having read me with pleasure. Physiologie du Good was not published until 1825, and then anonymously, presumably because he thought its tone inconsistent with his dignity as magistrate. It would almost seem that he had a presentiment of impending death, 
for in the midst of his brightest variete he has incongruously inserted a dolorous little poem, the burden of each verse being Je vais mourir. The physiology du goût is now accessible to English readers. In the versions of R. E. Anderson, London, 1877, and in a later one published in New York. But there is a subtle flavour to the original, which defies translation. From The Physiology of Taste The Privations First parents of the human species, whose gourmandizing is historic, you who fell for the sake of an apple, what would you not have done for a turkey with truffles? But there were, in the terrestrial paradise, neither cooks nor confectioners. How I pity you! Mighty kings, who laid proud Troy in ruins, your valour will be handed down from age to age but your table was poor. Reduced to a rump of beef and a chine of pork, you were ever ignorant of the charms of the matalot and the delights of a fricassee of chicken. How I pity you! Aspasia, Chloe, and all of you whose forms the chisel of the Greeks immortalized to the despair of the bells of to-day, never did your charming mouths enjoy the smoothness of a meringue a la vanille or a la rose. Hardly did you rise to the height of a spice-cake. How I pity you! Gentle priestesses of Vesta, at one and the same time burdened with so many honours, and menaced with such horrible punishments, would that you might at least have tasted those agreeable syrups which refresh the soul, those candied fruits which brave the seasons, those perfumed creams, the marvel of our day. How I pity you! Roman financiers, who made the whole known universe pay tribute, never did your far-famed banquet halls witness the appearance of those succulent jellies, the delight of the indolent, nor those varied ices whose cold would brave the torrid zone. How I pity you! Invincible paladins, celebrated by flattering minstrels, when you had cleft in twain the giants, set free the ladies, and exterminated armies. Never, alas, never did a dark-eyed captive offer you the sparkling champagne, the malmsey of Madeira, the liqueurs, creation of this great century, you were reduced to ale, or to some cheap herb-flavoured wine. How I pity you! Croziered and mitred abbots, dispensers of the favours of heaven, and you terrible Templars, who donned your armour for the extermination of the Saracens, you knew not the sweetness of chocolate which restores, nor the Arabian bean which promotes thought. How I pity you! Superb Chatelains, who during the loneliness of the Crusades raised into highest favour your chaplains and your pages, you never could share with them the charms of the biscuit, 
and the delights of the macaroon. How I pity you! And lastly you, gastronomers of 1825, who already find satiety in the lap of abundance, and dream of new preparations, you will not enjoy those discoveries which the sciences have in store for the year 1900, such as esculent minerals and liqueurs resulting from a pressure of a hundred atmospheres, you will not behold the importations which travellers yet unborn shall cause to arrive from that half of the globe which still remains to be discovered or explored. How I pity you! On the Love of Good Living I have consulted the dictionaries under the word gourmandise, and am by no means satisfied with what I find. The love of good living seems to be constantly confounded with gluttony and veracity, whence I infer that our lexicographers, however otherwise estimable, are not to be classed with those good fellows amongst learned men, who can put away gracefully a wing of partridge and then, by raising the little finger, wash it down with a glass of Lafitte, or clove Vougio. They have utterly forgot that social love of good eating, which combines in one Athenian elegance, Roman luxury, and Parisian refinement. It implies discretion to arrange, skill to prepare. It appreciates energetically and judges profoundly. It is a precious quality, almost deserving to rank as a virtue, and is very certainly the source of much unqualified enjoyment. Gourmandise, or the love of good living, is an impassioned rational. Gourmandise, or the love of good living, is an impassioned rational and habitual preference for whatever flatters the sense of taste. It is opposed to excess. Therefore, every man who eats to indigestion, or makes himself drunk, runs the risk of being erased from the list of its votaries. Gourmandise also comprises a love for dainties or titbits, which is merely an analogous preference, limited to light, delicate or small dishes, to pastry and so forth. It is a modification allowed in favour of the women, or men of feminine tastes. Regarded from any point of view, the love of good living deserves nothing but praise and encouragement. Physically, it is the result and proof of the digestive organs being healthy and perfect. Morally, it shows implicit resignation to the commands of nature, who, in ordering man to eat that he may live, gives him appetite to invite, flavour to encourage, and pleasure to reward. From the political economist's point of view, the love of good living is a tie between nations, uniting them by the interchange of the various articles of food which are in constant use. Hence the voyage from pole to pole of wines, sugars, fruits, and so forth. What else sustains the hope and emulation of that crowd of fishermen, huntsmen, gardeners, and others, who daily stock the most sumptuous larders with the results of their skill and labour? What else supports the industrious army of cooks, pastry-cooks, confectioners, and many other food-preparers, with all their various assistants? These various branches of industry derive their support in a great measure from the largest incomes, 
but they also rely upon the daily wants of all classes. As society is at present constituted, it is almost impossible to conceive of a race living solely on bread and vegetables. Such a nation would infallibly be conquered by the armies of some flesh-eating race, like the Hindus, who have been the prey of all those, one after another, who cared to attack them, or else it would be converted by the cooking of the neighbouring nations, as ancient history records of the Boeotians, who acquired a love for good living after the battle of Lutre. Good living opens out great resources for replenishing the public purse. It brings contributions to town dues, to the custom-house, and other indirect contributions. Everything we eat is taxed, and there is no exchequer that is not substantially supported by lovers of good living. Shall we speak of that swarm of cooks who have for ages been annually leaving France to improve foreign nations in the art of good living? Most of them succeed, and in obedience to an instinct which never dies in a Frenchman's heart, bring back to their country the fruits of their economy. The sum thus imported is greater than might be supposed, and therefore they, like the others, will be honoured by posterity. But if nations were grateful, then Frenchmen, above all other races, ought to raise a temple and altar to gourmandise. By the Treaty of November 1815, the Allies imposed upon France the condition of paying thirty million sterling in three years, besides claims for compensation and various requisitions, amounting to nearly as much more. The apprehension, or rather certainty, became general that a national bankruptcy must ensue, more specially as the money was to be paid in specie. Alas! said all who had anything to lose, as they saw the fatal tumbrel pass to be filled in the Rue Vivienne. There is our money emigrating in a lump. Next year we shall fall on our knees before a crown piece. We are about to fall into the condition of a ruined man. Speculations of every kind will fail. It will be impossible to borrow. There will be nothing but weakness, exhaustion, civil death. These terrors were proved false by the result, and to the great astonishment of all engaged in financial matters. The payments were made without difficulty, credit rose, loans were eagerly caught at, and during all the time this superpurgation lasted, the balance of exchange was in favour of France. In other words, more money came into the country than went out of it. What is the power that came to our assistance? Who is the divinity that worked this miracle? The love of good living. When the Britons, Germans, Teutons, Cimmerians, and Scythians made their eruption into France, they brought a rare veracity, and stomachs of no ordinary capacity. They did not long remain satisfied with the official cheer which a forced hospitality had to supply them with. They aspired to enjoyments of greater refinement, and soon the Queen City was nothing but a huge refectory. Everywhere they were seen eating, those intruders. In the restaurants, the eating-houses, the inns, the taverns, the stalls, and even in the streets, they gorged themselves 
with flesh, fish, game, truffles, pastry, and especially with fruit. They drank with an avidity equal to their appetite, and always ordered the most expensive wines, in the hope of finding in them some enjoyment hitherto unknown, and seemed quite astonished when they were disappointed. Superficial observers did not know what to think of this menagerie without bounds or limits, but your genuine Parisian laughed and rubbed his hands. We have them now, said he, and to-night they'll have paid us back more than was counted out to them this morning from the public treasury. That was a lucky time for those who provide for the enjoyments of the sense of taste. Varey made his fortune. Ashard laid the foundation of his, Beauvilliers made a third, and Madame Soulot, whose shop in the Palais Royal was a mere box of a place, sold as many as twelve thousand tarts a day. The effect still lasts. Foreigners flow in from all quarters of Europe to renew during peace the delightful habits which they contracted during the war. They must come to Paris, and when they are there they must be regaled at any price. If our funds are in favour, it is due not so much to the higher interest they pay, as to the instinctive confidence which foreigners cannot help placing in a people amongst whom every lover of good living finds so much happiness. Love of good living is by no means unbecoming in women. It agrees with the delicacy of their organization, and serves as a compensation for some pleasures which they are obliged to abstain from, and for some hardships to which nature seems to have condemned them. There is no more pleasant sight than a pretty gourmand under arms. Her napkin is nicely adjusted. One of her hands rests on the table. The other carries to her mouth little morsels artistically carved, or the wing of a partridge which must be picked. Her eyes sparkle her lips are glossy, her talk is cheerful, all her movements graceful, nor is there lacking some spice of the coquetry which accompanies all that women do. With so many advantages she is irresistible, and Cato the censor himself could not help yielding to the influence. The love of good living is in some sort instinctive in women, because it is favourable to beauty. It has been proved by a series of rigorously exact observations that by a succulent, delicate, and choice regimen, the external appearances of age are kept away for a long time. It gives more brilliancy to the eye, more freshness to the skin, more support to the muscles. And as it is certain in physiology that wrinkles, those formidable enemies of beauty, are caused by the depression of muscle, it is equally true that other things being equal, those who understand eating are comparatively four years younger than those ignorant of that science. Painters and sculptors are deeply impenetrated with this truth, for in representing those who practice abstinence by choice or duty, as misers or anchorites, they always give them the pallor of disease, the leanness of misery, 
and the wrinkles of decrepitude. Good living is one of the main links of societies, by gradually extending that spirit of conviviality by which different classes are daily brought closer together and welded into one whole, by animating the conversation and rounding off the angles of conventional inequality. To the same cause we can also ascribe all the efforts a host makes to receive his guests properly, as well as their gratitude for his pains so well bestowed. What disgrace should ever be heaped upon those senseless feeders who with unpardonable indifference swallow down morsels of the rarest quality, or gulp with unrighteous carelessness some fine-flavoured and sparkling wine. As a general maxim, whoever shows a desire to please will be certain of having a delicate compliment paid him by every well-bred man. Again, when shared, the love of good living has the most marked influence on the happiness of the conjugal state. A wedded pair, with this taste in common, have once a day at least a pleasant opportunity of meeting, for even when they sleep apart, and a great many do so, they at least eat at the same table. They have a subject of conversation which is ever new. They speak not only of what they are eating, but also of what they have eaten, or will eat, of dishes which are in vogue, of novelties, etc. Everybody knows that a familiar chat is delightful. Music, no doubt, has powerful attractions for those who are fond of it, but one must set about it. It is an exertion. Besides, one sometimes has a cold, the music is mislaid, the instruments are out of tune, one has a fit of the blues, or it is a forbidden day, whereas, in the other case, a common want summons the spouses to table, the same inclination keeps them there, they naturally show each other these little attentions as a proof of their wish to oblige, and the mode of conducting their meals has a great share in the happiness of their lives. This observation, though new in France, has not escaped the notice of Richardson, the English moralist. He has worked out the idea in his novel Pamela by painting the different manner in which two married couples finish their day. The first husband is a lord, an eldest son, and therefore heir to all the family property. The second is his younger brother, the husband of Pamela, who has been disinherited on account of his marriage, and lives on half-pay, in a state but little removed from abject poverty. The lord and lady enter their dining-room by different doors, and salute each other coldly, though they have not met the whole day before. Sitting down at a table which is magnificently covered, surrounded by lackeys in brilliant liveries, they help themselves in silence and eat without pleasure, as soon, however, as the servants have withdrawn, a sort of conversation is begun between the pair which quickly shows a bitter tone, passing into a regular fight, and they rise from the table in a fury of anger, and go off to their separate apartments, to reflect upon the pleasures of a single life. The younger brother, on the contrary, is on reaching his unpretentious home, received with a gentle loving heartiness, and the fondest caresses, he sits down to a frugal meal, but everything he eats is excellent, and how could it be otherwise, 
It is Pamela herself who has prepared it all. They eat with enjoyment, talking of their affairs, their plans, their love for each other. A half-bottle of Madeira serves to prolong their repast and conversation, and soon after they retire together to forget in sleep their present hardships, and to dream of a better future. All honour to the love of good living, such as it is the purpose of this book to describe, so long as it does not come between men and their occupations or duties, for as all the debaucheries of a Sardanapalus cannot bring disrespect upon womankind in general, so the excesses of a Vitalius need not make us turn our backs upon a well-appointed banquet. Should the love of good living pass into gluttony, veracity, intemperance, it then loses its name and advantages, escapes from our jurisdiction, and falls within that of the moralist, to ply it with good counsel, or of the physician, who will cure it by his remedies. End of section 7「Section 8 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern. Volume 6 by Various Authors Section 8 On the Love of Good Living by Bria Savarin I have consulted the dictionaries under the word gourmandise, and am by no means satisfied with what I find. The love of good living seems to be constantly confounded with gluttony and veracity, whence i infer that our lexicographers however otherwise estimable are not to be classed with those good fellows amongst learned men who can put away gracefully a wing of partridge and then by raising the little finger wash it down with a glass of lafitte or clos rougeau they have utterly forgot that social love of good eating which combines in one Athenian elegance, Roman luxury, and Parisian refinement. It implies discretion to arrange, skill to prepare. It appreciates energetically and judges profoundly. It is a precious quality almost deserving to rank as a virtue, and is very certainly the source of much unqualified enjoyment. Gourmandise, or the love of good living, is an impassioned, rational, and habitual preference for whatever flatters the sense of taste. It is opposed to excess. Therefore, every man who eats to indigestion, or makes himself drunk, runs the risk of being erased from the list of its votaries. Gourmandise also comprises a love for dainties or titbits, which is merely an analogous preference limited to light, delicate, or small dishes, to pastry, and so forth. It is a modification allowed in favour of the women, or men, of feminine tastes. Regarded from any point of view, the love of good living deserves nothing but praise and encouragement. Physically, it is the result and proof of the digestive organs being healthy and perfect. 
morally. It shows implicit resignation to the commands of nature, who in ordering man to eat that he may live, gives him appetite to invite, flavour to encourage, and pleasure to reward. From the political economist's point of view, the love of good living is a tie between nations, uniting them by the interchange of various articles of food which are in constant use. Hence the voyage from pole to pole of wine, sugars, fruits, and so forth. What else sustains the hope and emulation of that crowd of fishermen, huntsmen, gardeners, and others, who daily stock the most sumptuous larders with the results of their skill and labour? What else supports the industrious army of cooks, pastry-cooks, confectioners, and many other food-preparers, with all their various assistants? These various branches of industry derive their support in a great measure from the largest incomes, but they also rely upon the daily wants of all classes. As society is at present constituted, it is almost impossible to conceive of a race living solely on bread and vegetables. Such a nation would infallibly be conquered by the armies of some flesh-eating race, like the Hindus, who have been the prey of all those one after another who cared to attack them, or else it would be converted by the cooking of the neighbouring nations, as ancient history records of the Boeotians, who acquired a love for good living after the battle of Leuctra. Good living opens out great resources for replenishing the public purse. It brings contributions to town dues, to the custom house, and other indirect contributions. Everything we eat is taxed, and there is no exchequer that is not substantially supported by lovers of good living. Shall we speak of that swarm of cooks? who have for ages been annually leaving France to improve foreign nations in the art of good living. Most of them succeed, and in obedience to an instinct which never dies in a Frenchman's heart, bring back to their country the fruits of their economy. The sum thus imported is greater than might be supposed, and therefore they, like the others, will be honoured by posterity. But if nations were grateful, then Frenchmen, above all other races, ought to raise a temple and altars to gourmandise. By the Treaty of November 1815, the Allies imposed upon France the condition of paying thirty million sterling in three years, besides claims for compensation and various requisitions, amounting to nearly as much more. The apprehension, or rather certainty, became general that a national bankruptcy must ensue, more especially as the money was to be paid in specie. Alas, said all who had anything to lose, as they saw the fatal tumbrel pass to be filled in the Rue Vivienne, there is our money emigrating in a lump. Next year we shall fall on our knees before a crown piece. We are about to fall into the condition of a ruined man." speculations of every kind will fail it will be impossible to borrow there will be nothing but weakness exhaustion civil death these terrors were proved false by the result and to the great astonishment of all engaged in financial matters the payments were made without difficulty credit rose loans were eagerly caught at and during all the time this superpurgation lasted, the balance of exchange was in favour of France. In other words, more money came into the country than went out of it. What is the power that came to our assistance? Who is the divinity that worked this miracle? The love of good living. 
when the Britons, Germans, Teutons, Cimmerians, and Scythians made their eruption into France, they brought a rare veracity, and stomachs of no ordinary capacity. They did not long remain satisfied with the official cheer which a forced hospitality had to supply them with. They aspired to enjoyments of greater refinement, and soon the Queen City was nothing but a huge refectory. Everywhere they were seen eating these intruders, in the restaurants, the eating-houses, the inns, the taverns, the stalls, and even in the streets. They gorged themselves with flesh, fish, game, truffles, pastry, and especially with fruit. They drank with an avidity equal to their appetite, and always ordered the most expensive wines, in the hope of finding in them some enjoyment hitherto unknown, and seemed quite astonished when they were disappointed. Superficial observers did not know what to think of this menagerie without bounds or limits, but your genuine Parisian laughed and rubbed his hands. We have them now, said he, and to-night they'll have paid us back more than was counted out to them this morning from the public treasury. That was a lucky time for those who provide with the enjoyments of the sense of taste. Varey made his fortune, Accard laid the foundation of his, Beauvilliers made a third, and Madame Sulot, whose shop in the Palais Royal was a mere box of a place, sold as many as twelve thousand tarts a day. The effect still lasts. Foreigners flow in from all quarters of Europe to renew during peace the delightful habit which they contracted during the war. They must come to Paris, and when they are there they must be regaled at any price. If our funds are in favour, it is due not so much to the higher interest they pay as to the instinctive confidence which foreigners cannot help placing in a people amongst whom every lover of good living finds so much happiness. Love of good living is by no means unbecoming in women. It agrees with the delicacy of their organization, and serves as a compensation for some pleasures which they are obliged to abstain from, and for some hardships to which nature seems to have condemned them. There is no more pleasant sight than a pretty gourmand under arms. A napkin is nicely adjusted. One of her hands rests on the table. The other carries to her mouth little morsels artistically carved, or the wing of a partridge which must be picked. Her eyes sparkle. Her lips are glossy. Her talk is cheerful all her movements graceful, nor is there lacking some spice of the coquetry which accompanies all that women do. With so many advantages she is irresistible, and Cato the censor himself could not help yielding to the influence. The love of good living is in some sort instinctive in women, because it is favourable to beauty. It has been proved by a series of rigorously exact observations, that by a succulent, delicate, and choice regimen, the external appearances of age are kept away for a long time. It gives more brilliancy to the eye, more freshness to the skin, more support to the muscles, and as it is certain in physiology that wrinkles those formidable enemies of beauty, are caused by the depression of muscle. It is equally true that, other things being equal, those who understand eating are comparatively four years younger than those ignorant of that science. Painters and sculptors are deeply impenetrated with this truth, for in representing those who practice abstinence by choice or duty as misers or anchorites, they always give them the pallor of disease, the leanness of misery, and the wrinkles of decrepitude. Good living is one of the main links of society, by gradually extending that spirit of conviviality, 
by which different classes are daily brought closer together and welded into one whole by animating the conversation and rounding off the angles of conventional inequality to the same cause we can also ascribe all the efforts a host makes to receive his guests properly as well as their gratitude for his pains so well bestowed what disgrace should ever be heaped upon those senseless feeders who with unpardonable indifference swallow down morsels of the rarest quality or gulp with unrighteous carelessness some fine flavoured and sparkling wine as a general maxim whoever shows a desire to please will be certain of having a delicate compliment paid him by every well-bred man again when shared the love of good living has the most marked influence on the happiness of the conjugal state a wedded pair with this taste in common have once a day at least a pleasant opportunity of meeting for even when they sleep apart and a great many do so they at least eat at the same table they have a subject of conversation which is ever new they speak not only of what they are eating but also of what they have eaten or will eat of dishes which are in vogue of novelties etc everybody knows that a familiar chat is delightful music no doubt has powerful attractions for those who are fond of it but one must set about it it is an exertion besides one sometimes has a cold the music is mislaid the instruments are out of tune one has a fit of the blues or it is a forbidden day whereas in the other case a common one summons the spouses to table the same inclination keeps them there they naturally show each other these little attentions as a proof of their wish to oblige and the mode of conducting their meals has a great share in the happiness of their lives this observation though new in france has not escaped the notice of richardson the english moralist he has worked out the idea in his novel pamela by painting the different manner in which two married couples finish their day the first husband is a lord an eldest son and therefore heir to all the family property the second is his younger brother the husband of pamela who has been disinherited on account of his marriage and lives on half pay in a state but little removed from abject poverty the lord and lady enter their dining-room by different doors and salute each other coldly though they have not met the whole day before sitting down at a table which is magnificently covered surrounded by lackeys in brilliant liveries they help themselves in silence and eat without pleasure as soon however as the servants have withdrawn a sort of conversation is begun between the pair which quickly shows a bitter tone passing into a regular fight and they rise from the table in a fury of anger and go off to their separate apartments to reflect upon the pleasures of a single life the younger brother on the contrary is on reaching his unpretentious home received with a gentle loving heartiness and the fondest caresses he sits down to a frugal meal but everything he eats is excellent and how could it be otherwise it is pamela herself who has prepared it all they eat with enjoyment talking of their affairs their plans their love for each other a half bottle of madeira serves to prolong their repast and conversation and soon after they retire together to forget in sleep their present hardships and to dream of a better future all honour to the love of good living such as it is the purpose of this book to describe so long as it does not come between men and their occupations or duties for as all the debaucheries of a sardanopolis cannot bring disrespect upon womankind in general so the excesses of vitellius need not make us turn our backs upon a well-appointed banquet should the love of good living pass into gluttony veracity 
intemperance, it then loses its name and advantages, escapes from our jurisdiction, and falls within that of the moralist to ply it with good counsel, or of the physician, who will cure it by his remedies. End of section 8 Section 9 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. Section 9. Biographical Note on Charlotte Bronte and Her Sisters, 1816-1855. The least that can be said of Charlotte Bronte is that she is a unique figure in literature. Nowhere else do we find another personality combining such extraordinary qualities of mind and heart, qualities strangely contrasted, but still more strangely harmonized. At times they are baffling, but always fascinating. Nowhere else do we find so intimate an association of the personality of the author with the work so thorough an identification with it of the author's life even to the smaller details so true is this in the case of charlotte bronte that the four novels jane eyre shirley villette and the professor might with some justice be termed charlotte bronte her life and her friends her works were in large part an expression of herself at times the best expression of herself of her actual self in experience and of her spiritual self in travail and in aspiration it is manifestly impossible therefore to consider the works of charlotte bronte with justice apart from herself a correct understanding of her books can be obtained only from a study of her remarkable personality and of the sad circumstances of her life Public interest in Charlotte Bronte was first roused in 1847. In October of that year there appeared in London a novel that created a sensation, the like of which had not been known since the publication of Waverley. Its stern and paradoxical disregard for the conventional, its masculine energy, and its intense realism startled the public and proclaimed to all in accents unmistakable that a new strange and splendid power had come into literature but yet a woman and with the success of jane eyre came a lively curiosity to know something of the personality of the author this was not gratified for some time there were many conjectures all of them far amiss the majority of readers asserted confidently that the work must be that of a man the touch was unmistakably masculine. In some quarters it met with hearty abuse. The Quarterly Review, in an article still notorious for its brutality, condemned the book as coarse, and stated that if Jane Eyre were really written by a woman, she must be an improper woman who had forfeited the society of her sex. This was said in December 1848 of one of the noblest and purest of womankind. It is not a matter of surprise that the identity of this audacious speculator was not revealed. The recent examination into the topic by Mr. Clement Shorter seems, however, to fix the authorship of the notice on Lady Eastlake, at that time Miss Driggs. But hostile criticism of the book and its mysterious author could not injure its popularity. The story swept all before it, press and public whatever might be the source the work stood there and spoke for itself in commanding terms at length the mystery was cleared a shrewd yorkshireman guessed and published the truth and the curious world knew that the author of jane eyre was the daughter of a clergyman in the little village of haworth and that the literary sensation of the day found its source in a nervous shrinking awkward plain delicate young creature of thirty-one years of age whose life with the exception of two years had been spent on the bleak and dreary moorlands of yorkshire and for the most part in the narrow confines of a grim grey stone parsonage there she had lived a pinched and meagre little life full of sadness and self-denial with two sisters more delicate than herself a dissolute brother and a father her only parent a stern and forbidding father 
this was no genial environment for an author even if helpful to her vivid imagination nor was it a temporary condition it was a permanent one nearly all the influences in charlotte bronte's life were such as these which would seem to cramp if not to stifle sensitive talent her brother branwell physically weaker than herself though unquestionably talented and for a time the idol and hope of the family became dissipated irresponsible untruthful and a ne'er-do-weel and finally yielding to circumstances ended miserably a life of failure but charlotte bronte's nature was one of indomitable courage that circumstances might shadow but could not obscure out of the meagre elements of her narrow life she evolved works that stand among the imperishable things of english literature it is a paradox that finds its explanation only in a statement of natural sources primitive bardic the sources of the early epics the sources of such epics as cadman and beowulf bore she wrote from a sort of necessity it was in obedience to the commanding authority of an extraordinary genius a creative power that struggled for expression and much of her work deserves in the best and fullest sense the term inspired the facts of her life are few in number but they have a direct and significant bearing on her work she was born at thornton in the parish of bradford in eighteen sixteen four years later her father moved to haworth to the parsonage now indissolubly associated with her name and there mr bronte entered upon a long period of pastorate service that only ended with his death charlotte's mother was dead in eighteen twenty four charlotte and two older sisters maria and elizabeth went to a school at cowan's bridge it was an institution for clergymen's children a vivid picture of which appears in jane eyre it was so badly managed and the food was so poor that many of the children fell sick among them maria bronte who died in eighteen twenty five elizabeth followed her a few months later and charlotte returned to haworth where she remained for six years then went to school at roe head for a period of three years she was offered the position of teacher by miss wooler the principal at roe head but considering herself unfit to teach she resolved to go to brussels to study french she spent two years there and it was there that her intimate and misconstrued friendship for monsieur Heger developed the incidents of that period formed the material of a greater portion of her novel villette filled twenty-two volumes of from sixty to one hundred pages of fine writing and consisted of some forty complete novelettes or other stories and childish magazines on returning to haworth she endeavored together with her sister emily to establish a school at their home but pupils were not to be had and the outlook was discouraging two periods of service as governess and the ill health that had followed had taught charlotte the danger that threatened her her experiences as a governess in the sedgwick family were pictured by and by in jane eyre in a letter to miss ellen nussey written at this time she gives a dark vignette of her situation with her two sisters emily and anne she lived a quiet and retired life the harsh realities about them the rough natures of the yorkshire people impelled the three sisters to construct in their home an ideal world of their own and in this their pent-up natures found expression their home was lonely and gloomy mr clement k shorter in his recent study of the novelist and her family says that the house is much the same to-day though its immediate surroundings are brightened he writes one day emily confided to charlotte that she had written some verses charlotte answered with a similar confidence and then anne acknowledged that she too had been secretly writing this mutual confession brought about a complete understanding and sympathy and from that time on the sisters worked together reading their literary productions to one another and submitting to each other's criticism this was however by no means charlotte's first literary work she has left a catalogue of books written by her between eighteen twenty nine and eighteen thirty her first printed work however appeared in a volume of poems by acton ellis and currer bell published in eighteen forty six at the expense of the authors under these names the little book of the bronte sisters went forth to the world 
was reviewed with mild favor in some few periodicals and was lost to sight then came a period of novel writing as a result emily bronte's wuthering heights anne bronte's agnes gray and charlotte bronte's the professor set out together to find a publisher the last named was unsuccessful but on the day it was returned to her charlotte bronte began writing jane eyre that first masterpiece was shaped during a period of sorrow and discouragement her father was ill and in danger of losing his eyesight her brother branwell was sinking into the slough of disgrace no wonder jane eyre is not a story of sunshine and roses she finished the story in eighteen forty seven and it was accepted by the publishers promptly upon examination after its publication and the sensation produced charlotte bronte continued her literary work quietly and unaffected by the furor she had aroused a few brief visits to london where attempts were made to lionize her very much to her distaste a few literary friendships notably those with thackeray george henry lewis mrs gaskell and harriet martineau were the only features that distinguished her literary life from the simple life she had always led and continued to lead at haworth she was ever busy if not ever at her desk success had come she was sane in the midst of it she wrote slowly and only as she felt the impulse and when she knew she had found the proper impression in eighteen forty nine shirley was published in eighteen fifty three appeared villette her last finished work and the one considered by herself the best in eighteen fifty four she married her father's curate mr a b nichols she had lost her brother branwell and her two sisters emily and anne sorrow upon sorrow had closed like deepening shadows about her all happiness in life for her had apparently ended when this marriage brought a brief ray of sunshine it was a happy union and seemed to assure a period of peace and rest for the sorely tried soul only a few short months however and fate as if grudging her even the bit of happiness snapped the slender threads of her life and the whole sad episode of her existence was ended she died march thirty first eighteen fifty five leaving her husband and father to mourn together in the lonely parsonage she left a literary fragment the story entitled emma which was published with an introduction by thackeray such are the main facts of this reserved life of charlotte bronte are they dull and commonplace some of them are indeed inexpressibly sad tragedy is beneath all the bitter chronicle the sadness of her days can be appreciated by all who read her books through all her stories there is an intense note especially in treating the pathos of existence that is unmistakably subjective there is a keen perception of the darker depths of human nature that could have been revealed to a human heart only by suffering and sorrow she did not allow sadness however to crush her spirit she was neither morbid nor melancholy but on the contrary charlotte was cheerful and pleasant in disposition and manner she was a loving sister and devoted daughter patient and obedient to a parent who afterwards made obedience a severe hardship there were other sides to her character she was not always calm she was not ever tender and a maker of allowances but who is such and she had good reason to be impatient with the world as she found it her character and disposition are partially reflected in jane eyre the calm clear mind the brave independent spirit are there but a fuller and more accurate picture of her character may be found in lucy snow the heroine of villette here we find especially that note of hopelessness that predominated in charlotte's character mrs gaskell in her admirable biography of charlotte bronte has called attention to this absence of hope in her nature charlotte indeed never allowed herself to look forward to happy issues she had no confidence in the future the pressure of grief apparently crushed all buoyancy of expectation it was in this attitude that when literary success greeted her she made little of it scarcely allowing herself to believe that the world really set a high value on her work 
throughout all the excitement that her books produced she was almost indifferent brought up as she had been to regard literary work as something beyond the proper limits of her sex she never could quite rid herself of the belief that in writing successfully she had made of herself not so much a literary figure as a sort of social curiosity nor was that idea wholly foreign to her time personally charlotte bronte was not unattractive though somewhat too slender and pale and plain of feature she had a pleasant expression and her homelier features were redeemed by a strong massive forehead luxuriant glossy hair and handsome eyes though she had little faith in her powers of inspiring affection she attracted people strongly and was well beloved by her friends that she could stir romantic sentiment too was attested by the fact that she received and rejected three proposals of marriage from as many suitors before her acceptance of mr nichols allusion has been made to the work of charlotte's two sisters emily and anne of the two emily is by far the more remarkable revealing in the single novel we have from her pen a genius as distinct and individual as that of her more celebrated sister had she lived it is more than likely that her literary achievements would have rivalled charlotte's emily bronte has always been something of a puzzle to biographers she was eccentric an odd mixture of bashful reserve and unexpected spells of frankness sweet gentle and retiring in disposition but possessed of great courage she was two years younger than charlotte but taller she was slender though well formed and was pale in complexion with great gray eyes of remarkable beauty emily's literary work is to be found in the volume of poems of her sisters her share in that work being considered superior in imaginative quality and in finish to that of the others and in the novel wuthering heights a weird horrid story of astonishing power written when she was twenty-eight years of age considered purely as an imaginative work wuthering heights is one of the most remarkable stories in english literature and is worthy to be ranked with the works of edgar a poe many will say that it might better not have been written so utterly repulsive is it but others will value it as a striking though distorted expression of unmistakable genius it is a ghastly and gruesome creation not one bright ray redeems it it deals with the most evil characters and the most evil phases of human experience but it fascinates heathcliff the chief figure in the book is one of the greatest villains in fiction an abhorrent creature strange monstrous frankenstein-esque anne bronte is known by her share in the book of poems and by two novels agnes gray and the tenant of wildfell hall both of which are disappointing the former is based on the author's experiences as a governess and is written in the usual placid style of romances of the time the tenant of wildfell hall found its suggestion in the wretched career of branwell bronte and presents a sad and depressing picture of a life of degradation the book was not a success and would no doubt have sunk long ago into oblivion but for its association with the novels of emily and charlotte in studying the work of charlotte bronte the gifted older sister of the group one of the first of the qualities that impress the reader is her actual creative power to one of her imaginative power the simplest life was sufficient the smallest details a fund of material mr swinburne has called attention to the fact that charlotte bronte's characters are individual creations not types constructed out of elements gathered from a wide observation of human nature and that they are real creations that they compel our interest and command our assent because they are true inevitably true perhaps no better example of this individualism could be cited than rochester the character is unique it is not a type nor has it even a prototype like so many of charlotte bronte's characters gossip insisted at one time that the author intended to picture thackeray in rochester but this is groundless rochester is an original creation the character of jane eyre too while reflecting something of the author's nature was distinctly individual 
and it is interesting to note here that with jane eyre came a new heroine into fiction a woman of calm clear reason of firm positive character and what was most novel a plain woman a homely heroine why is it charlotte had once said that heroines must always be beautiful the hero of romance was always noble and handsome the heroine lovely and often insipid and the scene set in an atmosphere of exaggerated idealism against this idealism charlotte bronte revolted her effort was always toward realism in her realism she reveals a second characteristic scarcely less marked than her creative powers an extraordinary faculty of observation she saw the essence the spirit of things and the simplest details of life revealed to her the secrets of human nature what she had herself seen and felt the plain rugged types of yorkshire character the wild scenery of the moorlands she reflected with living truth she got the real fact out of every bit of material in humanity and nature that her simple life afforded her and where her experience could not afford her the necessary material she drew upon some mysterious resources in her nature which were apparently not less reliable than actual experience on being asked once how she could describe so accurately the effects of opium as she does in valette she replied that she knew nothing of opium but that she had followed the process she always adopted in cases of this kind she had thought intently on the matter for many a night before falling asleep till at last after some time she waked in the morning with all clear before her just as if she had actually gone through the experience and then could describe it word for word as it happened her sensitiveness to impressions of nature was exceedingly keen she had what swinburne calls an instinct for the tragic use of landscape by constant and close observation during her walks she had established a fellowship with nature in all her phases learning her secrets from the voices of the night from the whisper of the trees and from the eerie moaning of the moorland blasts she studied the cold sky and had watched the coming night clouds trailing low like banners drooping other qualities that distinguish her work are purity depth and ardor of passion and spiritual force and fervor her genius was lofty and noble and an exalted moral quality predominates in her stories she was ethical as sincerely as she was emotional we have only to consider her technique in which she is characteristically original this originality is noticeable especially in her use of words there is a sense of fitness that often surprises the reader words at times in her hands reveal a new power and significance in the choice of words charlotte bronte was scrupulous she believed that there was just one word fit to express the idea or shade of meaning she wished to convey and she never admitted a substitute sometimes waiting days until the right word came her expressions are therefore well fitted and forcible though the predominant key is a serious one there is nevertheless considerable humor in charlotte bronte's work in shirley especially we find many happy scenes and much wit in repartee and yet with all these merits one will find at times her style to be lame stiff and crude and even when strongest occasionally coarse not infrequently she is melodramatic and sensational but through it all there is that pervading sense of reality and it redeems these defects of the unusual the improbable the highly colored in charlotte bronte's books we shall say little in criticizing works so true to life and nature as these one should not be hasty we feel the presence of a seer someone once made an objection in charlotte bronte's presence to that part of jane eyre in which she hears rochester's voice calling to her at a great crisis in her life he being many miles distant from her at the time charlotte caught her breath and replied in a low voice but it is a true thing it really happened and so it might be said of charlotte bronte's work as a whole it is a true thing it really happened End of section 9
Section 10 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Beth Thomas. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 10. Jane Eyre's Wedding Day. From Jane Eyre. By Charlotte Bronte. Sophie came at seven to dress me. She was very long indeed in accomplishing her task, so long that Mr. Rochester, grown, I suppose, impatient of my delay, sent up to ask why I did not come. She was just fastening my veil, the plain square of blonde after all, to my hair with a brooch. I hurried from under her hands as soon as I could. Stop! she cried in French. Look at yourself in the mirror. You have not taken one peep. So I turned at the door. I saw a robed and veiled figure, so unlike my usual self, that it seemed almost the image of a stranger. Jane! called a voice, and I hastened down. I was received at the foot of the stairs by Mr. Rochester. Lingerer, he said, my brain is on fire with impatience, and you tarry so long. He took me into the dining-room, surveyed me keenly all over, pronounced me fair as a lily, and not only the pride of his life, but the desire of his eyes. And then, telling me he would give me but ten minutes to eat some breakfast, he rang the bell. One of his lately hired servants, a footman, answered it. "'Is John getting the carriage ready?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Is the luggage brought down?' "'They are bringing it down, sir.' "'Go you to the church. See if Mr. Wood—' the clergyman, and the clerk are there. Return and tell me. The church, as the reader knows, was but just beyond the gates. The footman soon returned. Mr. Wood is in the vestry, sir, putting on his surplice. And the carriage? The horses are harnessing. We shall not want it to go to church, but it must be ready the moment we return. All the boxes and luggage arranged and strapped on, and the coachman in his seat. Yes, sir. Jane, are you ready? I rose. There were no groomsmen, no bridesmaids, no relatives to wait for or marshal, none but Mr. Rochester and I. Mrs. Fairfax stood in the hall as we passed. I would fain have spoken to her, but my hand was held by a grasp of iron. I was hurried along by a stride I could hardly follow, and to look at Mr. Rochester's face was to feel that not a second of delay would be tolerated for any purpose. I wondered what other bridegroom ever looked as he did so bent up to a purpose, so grimly resolute, or who under such steadfast brows ever revealed such flaming and flashing eyes. I know not whether the day was fair or foul. In descending the drive I gazed neither on sky nor earth. My heart was with my eyes, and both seemed migrated into Mr. Rochester's frame. I wanted to see the invisible thing on which, as we went along, he appeared to fasten a glance fierce and fell. I wanted to feel the thoughts whose force he seemed breasting and resisting. At the churchyard wicket he stopped. He discovered I was quite out of breath. "'Am I cruel in my love?' he said. "'Delay an instant. Lean on me, Jane. And now I can recall the picture of the grey old house of God rising calm before me, of a rook wheeling around the steeple, of a ruddy morning sky beyond. I remember something, too, of the green grave mounds, and I have not forgotten, either, two figures of strangers, straying among the low hillocks, and reading the mementos graven on the few mossy headstones. I noticed them because, as they saw us, they passed around to the back of the church, and I doubted not they were going to enter by the side-aisle door and witness the ceremony. By Mr. Rochester they were not observed. He was earnestly looking at my face, from which the blood had, I dare say, momentarily fled, for I felt my forehead dewy and my cheeks and lips cold. When I rallied, which I soon did, he walked gently with me up the path to the porch. We entered the humble and quiet temple. The priest waited in his white surplice at the lowly altar, the clerk beside him. All was still. Two shadows only moved in a remote corner. My conjecture had been correct. The strangers had slipped in before us, and they now stood by the vault of the Rochesters, their backs toward us, viewing through the rails the old time-stained marble tomb, where a kneeling angel guarded the remains of the Dame de Rochester, slain at Marston Moor in the time of the civil wars, and of Elizabeth his wife. 
our place was taken at the communion rails hearing a cautious step behind me i glanced over my shoulder one of the strangers a gentleman evidently was advancing up the chancel the service began the explanation of the intent of matrimony was gone through and then the clergyman came a step further forward and bending slightly towards mr rochester went on i require and charge you both as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed that if either of you know any impediment why ye may not lawfully be joined together in matrimony ye do now confess it for be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than god's word doth allow are not joined together by god neither is their matrimony lawful he paused as the custom is when is the pause after that sentence ever broken by reply not perhaps once in a hundred years and the clergyman who had not lifted his eyes from his book and had held his breath but for a moment was proceeding his hand was already stretched toward mr rochester as his lips unclosed to ask wilt thou have this woman for thy wedded wife when a distinct and near voice said the marriage cannot go on i declare the existence of an impediment the clergyman looked up at the speaker and stood mute the clerk did the same mr rochester moved slightly as if an earthquake had rolled under his feet taking a firmer footing and not turning his head or eyes he said proceed profound silence fell when he had uttered that word with deep but low intonation presently mr wood said i cannot proceed without some investigation into what has been asserted and evidence of its truth or falsehood the ceremony is quite broken off subjoined the voice behind us i am in a condition to prove my allegation an insuperable impediment to this marriage exists mr rochester heard but heeded not he stood stubborn and rigid making no movement but to possess himself of my hand what a hot and strong grasp he had and how like quarried marble was his firm pale massive front at this moment how his eye shone still watchful and yet wild beneath mr wood seemed at a loss what is the nature of the impediment he asked perhaps it may be got over explained away hardly was the answer i have called it insuperable and i speak advisedly the speaker came forward and leaned on the rails he continued uttering each word distinctly calmly steadily but not loudly it simply consists in the existence of a previous marriage mr rochester has a wife now living my nerves vibrated to those low-spoken words as they had never vibrated to thunder my blood felt their subtle violence as it had never felt frost or fire but i was collected and in no danger of swooning i looked at mr rochester i made him look at me his whole face was colourless rock his eye was both spark and flint he disavowed nothing he seemed as if he would defy all things without speaking without smiling without seeming to recognize in me a human being he only twined my waist with his arm and riveted me to his side who are you he asked of the intruder my name is briggs a solicitor of <clears throat> street london and you would thrust on me a wife i would remind you of your lady's existence sir which the law recognizes if you do not favour me with an account of her with her name her parentage her place of abode certainly mr briggs calmly took a paper from his pocket and read out in an official sort of nasal voice i affirm and can prove that on the twentieth of october a d a date of fifteen years back edward fairfax rochester of thornfield hall in the county of <coughs> and of ferndean manor in <coughs> shire england was married to my sister bertha antoinetta mason daughter of jonas mason merchant and of antoinetta his wife a creole at <coughs> church spanish town jamaica the record of the marriage will be found in the register of that church a copy of it is now in my possession signed richard mason that if a genuine document may prove that i have been married but it does not prove that the woman mentioned therein as my wife is still living she was living three months ago returned the lawyer how do you know i have a witness to the fact whose testimony even you sir will scarcely controvert 
Produce him, or go to hell. I will produce him first. He is on the spot. Mr. Mason, have the goodness to step forward. Mr. Rochester, on hearing the name, set his teeth. He experienced, too, a sort of strong, convulsive quiver. Near to him as I was, I felt the spasmodic movement of fury or despair run through his frame. The second stranger, who had hitherto lingered in the background, now drew near. A pale face looked over the solicitor's shoulder. Yes, it was Mason himself. Mr. Rochester turned and glared at him. His eye, as I have often said, was a black eye. It had now a tawny, nay, a bloody light in its gloom, and his face flushed, olive cheek and hueless forehead received a glow as from spreading ascending heart-fire, and he stirred, lifted his strong arm, he could have struck Mason, dashed him on the church floor, shocked by ruthless blow the breath from his body, but Mason shrank away, and cried faintly, "'Good God!' Contempt fell cool on Mr. Rochester. His passion died, as if a blight had shriveled it up. He only asked, "'What have you to say?' An inaudible reply escaped Mason's white lips. "'The devil is in it! If you cannot answer distinctly, I again demand, what have you to say?' "'Sir, sir,' interrupted the clergyman, "'do not forget you are in a sacred place.' Then addressing Mason, he inquired gently, "'Are you aware, sir, whether or not this gentleman's wife is still living?' "'Courage!' urged the lawyer. "'Speak out.' "'She is now living at Thornfield Hall,' said Mason, in more articulate tones. "'I saw her there last April. I am her brother.' "'At Thornfield Hall?' ejaculated the clergyman. "'Impossible! I am an old resident in this neighbourhood, sir, and I never heard of a Mrs. Rochester at Thornfield Hall.' I saw a grim smile contort Mr. Rochester's lip, and he muttered, "'No, by God! I took care that none should hear of it, or of her under that name.' He mused. For ten minutes he held counsel with himself. He formed his resolve and announced it. "'Enough! All shall bolt out at once, like a bullet from the barrel. Wood, close your book and take off your surplice.' John Green, to the clerk, leave the church, there'll be no wedding today. The man obeyed. Mr. Rochester continued hardily and recklessly. Bigamy is an ugly word. I meant, however, to be a bigamist. But fate has outmaneuvered me, or providence has checked me, perhaps the last. I am little better than a devil at this moment, and as my pastor there would tell me, deserve no doubt the sternest judgments of God, even to the quenchless fire and the deathless worm. Gentlemen, my plan is broken up. What this lawyer and his clients say is true. I have been married, and the woman to whom I was married lives. You say you have never heard of a Mrs. Rochester at the house up yonder, Wood, but I dare say that you have many a time inclined your ear to gossip about the mysterious lunatic kept there under watch and ward. Some have whispered to you that she is my bastard half-sister, some my cast-off mistress. I now inform you that she is my wife." whom I married fifteen years ago, Bertha Mason by name, sister of this resolute personage who is now, with his quivering limbs and white cheeks, showing you what a stout heart men may bear. Cheer up, Dick. Never fear me. I'd almost as soon strike a woman as you. Bertha Mason is mad, and she came of a mad family, idiots and maniacs, through three generations. Her mother, the Creole, was both a mad woman and a drunkard, as I found out after I had wed the daughter, for they were silent on family secrets before. Bertha, like a dutiful child, copied her parent in both points. I had a charming partner, pure, wise, modest. You can fancy I was a happy man. I went through rich scenes. Oh, my experience has been heavenly, if you only knew it. But I owe you no further explanation. Briggs, Wood, Mason, I invite you all to come up to the house and visit Mrs. Poole's patient and my wife. You shall see what sort of a being I was cheated into espousing, and judge whether or not I had a right to break the compact and seek sympathy with something at least human. This girl, he continued looking at me, knew no more than you would of the disgusting secret. She thought all was fair and legal, and never dreamed that she was going to be entrapped into a feigned union with a defrauded wretch, already bound to a bad, mad, and imbruted partner. Come, all of you, follow. Still holding me fast, he left the church. The three gentlemen came after. At the front door of the hall we found the carriage. Take it back to the coach-house, John, said Mr. Rochester coolly. It will not be wanted to-day. At our entrance, Mrs. Fairfax, Adele, Sophie, Leah, 
advanced to meet and greet us. "'To the right about, every soul!' cried the master. "'Away with your congratulations! Who wants them? Not I. They are fifteen years too late!' He passed on and ascended the stairs, still holding my hand, and still beckoning the gentlemen to follow him, which they did. We mounted the first staircase, passed up the gallery, proceeded to the third story. The low black door, opened by Mr. Rochester's master key, admitted us to the tapestried room, with its great bed and its pictorial cabinet. "'You know this place, Mason,' said our guide. "'She bit and stabbed you here.' He lifted the hangings from the wall, uncovered the second door. This, too, he opened. In a room without a window there burned a fire, guarded by a high and strong fender, and a lamp suspended from the ceiling by a chain. Grace Poole bent over the fire, apparently cooking something in a saucepan. In the deep shade at the further end of the room, a figure ran backward and forward. What it was, whether beast or human being, one could not at first sight tell. It grovelled seemingly on all fours. It snatched and growled like some strange, wild animal. But it was covered with clothing, and a quantity of grizzled dark hair, wild as a mane, hid its face and head. "'Good morning, Mrs. Poole,' said Mr. Rochester. "'How are you, and how is your charge to-day?' "'We're tolerable, sir, I thank you,' replied Grace, lifting the boiling mess carefully onto the hob. "'Rather snappish, but not rageous.' A fierce cry seemed to give the lie to her favourable report. The clothed hyena rose up, and stood tall on its hind feet. "'Ah, sir, she sees you,' exclaimed Grace. "'You'd better not stay.' "'Only a few moments, Grace. You must allow me a few moments.' "'Take care, then, sir. For God's sake, take care.' The maniac bellowed. She parted her shaggy locks from her visage, and gazed wildly at her visitors. I recognised well that purple face, those bloated features. Mrs. Poole advanced. "'Keep out of the way,' said Mr. Rochester, thrusting her aside. "'She has no knife now, I suppose, and I'm on my guard.' "'One never knows what she has, sir. She is so cunning, and it is not in mortal discretion to fathom her craft.' "'We had better leave her,' whispered Mason. "'Go to the devil,' was his brother-in-law's recommendation. "'Where?' cried Grace. The three gentlemen retreated simultaneously. Mr. Rochester flung me behind him. The lunatic sprang and grappled his throat viciously, and laid her teeth to his cheek. They struggled. She was a big woman, in stature almost equalling her husband, and corpulent besides. She showed virile force in the contest. More than once she almost throttled him, athletic as he was. He could have settled her with a well-planted blow, but he would not strike her. He would only wrestle. At last he mastered her arms. Grace Poole gave him a cord, and he pinioned them behind her. With more rope which was at hand he bound her to a chair. The operation was performed amid the fiercest yells and the most convulsive plunges. Mr. Rochester then turned to the spectators. He looked at them with a smile both acrid and desolate. "'That is my wife,' said he. "'Such is the sole conjugal embrace I am ever to know. Such are the endearments which are to solace my leisure hours, and this is what I wish to have.' Laying his hand on my shoulder. "'This young girl, who stands so grave and quiet at the mouth of hell, looking collectedly at the gambles of a demon. I wanted her, just as a change after that fierce ragout. Wood and Briggs, look at the difference. Compare these clear eyes with the red balls yonder, this face with that mask, this form with that bulk, and then judge me, priest of the gospel and man of the law, and remember, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Off with you now. I must shut up my prize. We all withdrew. Mr. Rochester stayed a moment behind us to give some further order to Grace Poole. The solicitor addressed me as he descended the stair. "'You, madam,' said he, "'are cleared from all blame. Your uncle will be glad to hear it, if indeed he should still be living, when Mr. Mason returns to Madeira.' "'My uncle? What of him? Do you know him?' "'Mr. Mason does. Mr. Eyre has been the Funchal correspondent of his house for some years. When your uncle received your letter, intimating the contemplated union between yourself and Mr. Rochester, Mr. Mason, who was staying at Madeira to recruit his health on his way back to Jamaica, happened to be with him.' Mr. Eyre mentioned the intelligence, for he knew that my client here was acquainted with a gentleman of the name of Rochester. Mr. Mason, astonished and distressed, as you may suppose, revealed the real state of matters. 
your uncle i am sorry to say is now on a sick bed from which considering the nature of his disease decline and the stage it has reached it is unlikely he will ever rise he could not then hasten to england himself to extricate you from the snare into which you had fallen but he implored mr mason to lose no time in taking steps to prevent the false marriage he referred him to me for assistance i used all dispatch and am thankful i was not too late as you doubtless must be also were i not morally certain that your uncle will be dead ere you reach madeira i would advise you to accompany mr mason back but as it is i think you had better remain in england till you can hear further either from or of mr eyre have we anything else to stay for he inquired of mr mason no no let us be gone was the anxious reply and without waiting to take leave of mr rochester they made their exit at the hall door the clergyman stayed to exchange a few sentences either of admonition or reproof with his haughty parishioner this duty done he too departed i heard him go as i stood at the half-open door of my own room to which i had now withdrawn the house cleared i shut myself in fastened the bolt that none might intrude and proceeded not to weep not to mourn i was yet too calm for that but mechanically to take off the wedding dress and replace it by the stuff gown i had worn yesterday as i thought for the last time i then sat down i felt weak and tired i leaned my arms on a table and my head dropped on them and now i thought till now i had only heard seen moved followed up and down where i was led or dragged watched event rush on event disclosure open beyond disclosure but now i thought the morning had been quiet enough all except the brief scene with the lunatic the transaction in the church had not been noisy there was no explosion of passion no loud altercation no dispute no defiance or challenge no tears no sobs a few words had been spoken a calmly pronounced objection to the marriage made some stern short questions put by mr rochester answers explanations given evidence adduced an open admission of the truth had been uttered by my master then the living proof had been seen the intruders were gone and all was over i was in my own room as usual just myself without obvious change nothing had smitten me or scathed me or maimed me and yet where was the jane eyre of yesterday where was her life where were her prospects jane eyre who had been an ardent expectant woman almost a bride was a cold solitary girl once again her life was pale her prospects were desolate a Christmas frost had come at midsummer. A white December storm had whirled over June. Ice glazed the ripe apples. Drifts crushed the blowing roses. On hayfield and cornfield lay a frozen shroud. Lanes which last night blushed full of flowers, today were pathless with untrodden snow. And the woods, which twelve hours since waved leafy and fragrant as groves between the tropics, now laid waste wild and white as pine forests in wintry norway my hopes were all dead struck with a subtle doom such as in one night fell on all the first-born in the land of egypt i looked on my cherished wishes yesterday so blooming and glowing they lay stark chill livid corpses that could never revive i looked at my love that feeling which was my master's which he had created it shivered in my heart like a suffering child in a cold cradle. Sickness and anguish had seized it. It could not seek Mr. Rochester's arms. It could not derive warmth from his breast. Oh, never more could it turn to him, for faith was blighted, confidence destroyed. Mr. Rochester was not to me what he had been, for he was not what I had thought him. I would not ascribe vice to him. I would not say he had betrayed me but the attribute of stainless truth was gone from his idea and from his presence i must go that i perceived well when how whither i could not yet discern but he himself i doubted not would hurry me from thornfield real affection it seemed he could not have for me it had been only fitful passion that was balked he would want me no more i should fear even to cross his path now my view must be hateful to him oh how blind had been my eyes how weak my conduct end of section 10 jane eyre's wedding day
Section 11 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6 by Various Authors, Section 11, Madame Beck, from Villette by Charlotte Bronte. "'You air English?' said a voice at my elbow. I almost bounded, so unexpected was the sound, so certain had I been of solitude. No ghost stood beside me, nor anything of spectral aspect, merely a motherly, dumpy little woman in a large shawl, a wrapping gown, and a clean, trim nightcap. I said I was English, and immediately, without further prelude, we fell to a most remarkable conversation— Madame Beck, for Madame Beck it was, she had entered by a little door behind me, and being shod with the shoes of silence, I had heard neither her entrance nor approach. Madame Beck had exhausted her command of insular speech when she said, You air English, and she now proceeded to work away volubly in her own tongue. I answered in mine. She partly understood me, but as I did not at all understand her, though we made together an awful clamour, Anything like Madame's gift of utterance I had not hitherto heard or imagined. We achieved little progress. She rang ere long for aid, which arrived in the shape of a maîtresse, who had been partly educated in an Irish convent, and was esteemed a perfect adept in the English language. A bluff little personage this maîtresse was, la basse courienne from top to toe, and how she did slaughter the speech of Albion. However, I told her a plain tale, which she translated. I told her how I had left my own country, intent on extending my knowledge and gaining my bread, how I was ready to turn my hand to anything useful, provided it was not wrong or degrading, how I would be a child's nurse or a lady's maid, and would not refuse even housework adapted to my strength. Madame heard this, and questioning her countenance, I almost thought the tale won her ear. Il n'y a que les Anglais pour ce sort d'entreprise, said she. Sont-elles d'un intrépide, ces femmes-là? She asked my name, my age. She sat and looked at me, not pityingly, not with interest. Never a gleam of sympathy or a shade of compassion crossed her countenance during the interview. I felt she was not one to be led an inch by her feelings. Grave and considerate, she gazed, consulting her judgment and studying my narrative. In the dead of night I suddenly awoke. All was hushed, but a white figure stood in the room, Madame in her nightdress. Moving without perceptible sound, she visited the three children in the three beds. She approached me. I feigned sleep, and she studied me long. A small pantomime ensued, curious enough. I dare say she sat a quarter of an hour on the edge of my bed, gazing at my face. She then drew nearer, bent close over me, slightly raised my cap, and turned back the border so as to expose my hair. She looked at my hand lying on the bedclothes. This done, she turned to the chair where my clothes lay. It was at the foot of the bed. Hearing her touch and lift them, I opened my eyes with precaution, for I own I felt curious to see how far her taste for research would lead her. It led her a good way. Every article did she inspect. I divined her motive for this proceeding, namely the wish to form from the garments a judgment respecting the wearer, her station, means, neatness, etc. The end was not bad, but the means were hardly fair or justifiable. In my dress was a pocket. She fairly turned it inside out. She counted the money in my purse. She opened a little memorandum book, coolly perused its contents, and took from between the leaves a small plated lock of Miss Marchmont's grey hair. To a bunch of three keys, being those of my trunk, desk, and work-box, she accorded special attention. With these, indeed, she withdrew a moment to her own room. I softly rose in my bed and followed her with my eye. These keys, reader, were not brought back till they had left on the toilette of the adjoining room the impress of their wards in wax. All being thus done decently and in order, my property was returned to its place. My clothes were carefully refolded. Of what nature were the conclusions deduced from this scrutiny? 
Were they favourable or otherwise? Vain question. Madame's face of stone, for of stone in its peasant night aspect it looked, it had been human, as I said before, motherly, in the salon, betrayed no response. Her duty done, I felt that in her eyes this business was a duty. She rose, noiseless as a shadow. She moved toward her own chamber. At the door she turned, fixed her eyes on the heroine of the bottle, who still slept and loudly snored. Mrs. Sweeney, I presume this was Mrs. Sweeney, Anglicé or Ibernese Sweeney, Mrs. Sweeney's doom was in Madame Beck's eye. An immutable purpose that eye spoke. Madame's visitations for shortcomings might be slow, but they were sure. All this was very un-English. Truly, I was in a foreign land. When attired, Madame Beck appeared a personage of a figure rather short and stout, yet still graceful in its own peculiar way, that is, with the grace resulting from proportion of parts. Her complexion was fresh and sanguine, not too rubicund, her eye blue and serene, her dark silk dress fitted her as a French seamstress alone can make a dress fit. She looked well, though a little bourgeois, as bourgeois indeed she was. I know not what of harmony pervaded her whole person, and yet her face offered contrast, too. Its features were by no means such as are usually seen in conjunction with a complexion of such blended freshness and repose. Their outline was stern, her forehead was high but narrow, it expressed capacity and some benevolence, but no expanse. Nor did her peaceful yet watchful eye ever know the fire which is kindled in the heart, or the softness which flows thence. Her mouth was hard, it could be a little grim, her lips were thin. For sensibility and genius, with all their tenderness and temerity, I felt somehow that Madame would be the right sort of Minos in petticoats. In the long run, I found that she was something else in petticoats, too. Her name was Modeste Maria Beck, née Kint. It ought to have been Ignatia. She was a charitable woman, and did a great deal of good. There never was a mistress whose rule was milder. I was told that she never once remonstrated with the intolerable Mrs. Sweeney, the heroine's predecessor, despite her tipsiness, disorder, and general neglect. Yet Mrs. Sweeney had to go the moment her departure became convenient. I was told, too, that neither masters nor teachers were found fault with in that establishment. Yet both masters and teachers were often changed. They vanished, and others filled their places. None could well explain how. The establishment was both a pensionat and an externat. The externs, or day pupils, exceeded one hundred in number. The boarders were about a score. Madame must have possessed high administrative powers. She ruled all these, together with four teachers, eight masters, six servants, and three children, managing at the same time to perfection the pupil's parents and friends, and that without apparent effort, without bustle, fatigue, fever, or any symptom of undue excitement. Occupied she always was, busy rarely. It is true that Madame had her own system for managing and regulating this mass of machinery, and a very pretty system it was. The reader has seen a specimen of it in the small affair of turning my pocket inside out and reading my private memoranda. Surveillance, espionage, these were her watchwords. Still, Madame knew what honesty was, and liked it, that is, when it did not obtrude its clumsy scruples in the way of her will and interest. She had a respect for Angleterre, and as to les Anglais, she would have the women of no other country about her own children, if she could help it. Often in the evening, after she had been plotting and counterplotting, spying and receiving the reports of spies all day, she would come up to my room, a trace of real weariness on her brow, and she would sit down and listen while the children said their little prayers to me in English, the Lord's Prayer, and the hymn beginning, Gentle Jesus, these little Catholics were permitted to repeat at my knee, and when I had put them to bed, she would talk to me. I soon gained enough French to be able to understand, and even answer her, about England and English women, and the reason for what she was pleased to term their superior intelligence, and more real and reliable probity. Very good sense she often showed, very sound opinions she often broached. 
she seemed to know that keeping girls in distrustful restraint in blind ignorance and under a surveillance which left them no moment and no corner for retirement was not the best way to make them grow up honest and modest women but she averred that ruinous consequences would ensue if any other method were tried with continental children they were so accustomed to restraint that relaxation however guarded would be misunderstood and fatally presumed on she was sick she would declare of the means she had to use but use them she must and after discoursing often with dignity and delicacy to me she would move away on her souliers de silence and glide ghost-like through the house watching and spying everywhere peering through every keyhole listening behind every door after all madame's system was not bad let me do her justice nothing could be better than all her arrangements for the physical well-being of her scholars no minds were overtasked the lessons were well distributed and made incomparably easy to the learner there was a liberty of amusement and a provision for exercise which kept the girls healthy the food was abundant and good neither pale nor puny faces were anywhere to be seen in the rue facette she never grudged a holiday she always allowed plenty of time for sleeping dressing washing eating her method in all these matters was easy liberal salutary and rational many an austere english schoolmistress would do vastly well to imitate it and i believe many would be glad to do so if exacting english parents would let them as madame beck ruled by espionage she of course had her staff of spies she perfectly knew the quality of the tools she used and while she would not scruple to handle the dirtiest for a dirty occasion flinging this sort from her like refuse rind after the orange had been duly squeezed i have known her fastidious in seeking pure metal for cleaner uses and when once a bloodless and rustless instrument was found she was careful of the prize keeping it in silk and cotton wool yet woe to the man or woman who relied on her one inch beyond the point where it was in her interest to be trustworthy interest was the master key of madame's nature the mainspring of her motives the alpha and omega of her life i have seen her feelings appealed to and i have smiled in half pity half scorn at the appellants none ever gained her ear through that channel or swayed her purpose by that means on the contrary to attempt to touch her heart was the surest way to rouse her antipathy and to make of her a secret foe it proved to her that she had no heart to be touched it reminded her where she was impotent and dead never was the distinction between charity and mercy better exemplified than in her while devoid of sympathy she had a sufficiency of rational benevolence she would give in the readiest manner to people she had never seen rather however to classes than to individuals pour les pauvres she opened her purse freely against the poor man as a rule she kept it closed in philanthropic schemes for the benefit of society at large she took a cheerful part no private sorrow touched her no force or mass of suffering concentrated in one heart had power to pierce hers not the agony of gethsemane not the death on calvary could have wrung from her eyes one tear i say again madame was a very great and a very capable woman that school offered for her powers too limited a sphere she ought to have swayed a nation she should have been the leader of a turbulent legislative assembly nobody could have browbeaten her none irritated her nerves exhausted her patience or overreached her astuteness in her own single person she could have comprised the duties of a first minister and a superintendent of police wise firm faithless secret crafty passionless watchful and inscrutable astute and insensate was all perfectly decorous what more could be desired end of section 11section 12 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gemma library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 by various authors 
Section 12. A Yorkshire Landscape from Shirley by Charlotte Bronte. Miss Kildar, just stand still now and look down at Nunnally Dale and Wood. They both halted on the green brow of the common. They looked down on the deep valley robed in May raiment, on varied meads, some pearled with daisies and some golden with kingcups. Today all this young verdure smiled clear in sunlight. Transparent emerald and amber gleams played over it. On Nunwood, the sole remnant of antique British forest in a region whose lowlands were once all sylvan chase, as its highlands were breast-deep heather, slept the shadow of a cloud. The distant hills were dappled, the horizon was shaded and tinted like mother-of-pearl. Silvery blues, soft purples, evanescent greens, and rose shades, all melting into fleeces of white cloud, pure as osiery snow, allured the eye with a remote glimpse of heaven's foundations. The air blowing on the brow was fresh and sweet and bracing. Our England is a bonny island, said Shirley, and Yorkshire is one of her bonniest nooks. You are a Yorkshire girl, too. I am. Yorkshire in blood and birth. Five generations of my race sleep under the aisles of Briarfield Church. I drew my first breath in the old black hall behind us. Hereupon, Caroline presented her hand, which was accordingly taken and shaken. We are compatriots, said she. Yes agreed Shirley, with a grave nod. "'And that,' asked Miss Kildar, pointing to the forest, "'that is Nunwood.' "'It is. Were you ever there?' "'Many a time.' "'In the heart of it?' "'Yes.' "'What is it like?' "'It is like an encampment of forest sons of Anak. "'The trees are huge and old. "'When you stand at their roots, the summits seem in another region. The trunks remain still and firm as pillars, while the boughs sway to every breeze. In the deepest calm their leaves are never quite hushed, and in a high wind a flood rushes, a sea thunders above you. Was it not one of Robin Hood's haunts? Yes, and there are mementos of him still existing. To penetrate into Nunwood, Miss Kildar, is to go far back into the dim days of old. Can you see a break in the forest about the centre? Yes, distinctly. That break is a dell, a deep hollow cup, lined with turf as green and short as the sod of this common. The very oldest of the trees, gnarled mighty oaks, crowd about the brink of this dell. In the bottom lies the ruin of a nunnery. We will go, you and I alone, Caroline, to that wood, early some fine summer morning, and spend a long day there. We can take pencils and sketchbooks, and any interesting reading book we like, and of course we shall take something to eat. I have two little baskets in which Mrs. Gill, my housekeeper, might pack our provisions, and we could each carry our own. It would not tire you too much to walk so far. Oh no, especially if we rested the whole day in the wood. And I know all the pleasantest spots. I know where we could get nuts in nutting time. I know where wild strawberries abound. I know certain lonely, quite untrodden glades, carpeted with strange mosses, some yellow as if gilded, some a sober gray, some gem green. I know groups of trees that ravish the eye with their perfect, picture-like effects. Rude oak, delicate birch, glossy beech, clustered in contrast, and ash trees, stately as Saul, standing isolated, and superannuated wood giants clad in bright shrouds of ivy. End of section 12、section、thirteen of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume、six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marina Tsung. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume Six, by various authors, Section Thirteen.
The End of Heathcliff From Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte For some days after that evening, Mr. Heathcliff shunned meeting us at meals, yet he would not consent formally to exclude Hareton and Cathy. He had an aversion to yielding so completely to his feelings, choosing rather to absent himself, and eating once in twenty-four hours seemed sufficient sustenance for him. One night, after the family were in bed, I heard him go downstairs and out at the front door. I did not hear him re-enter, and in the morning I found he was still away. We were in April then. The weather was sweet and warm, the grass as green as showers and sun could make it, and the two dwarf apple trees near the southern wall, in full bloom. After breakfast, Catherine insisted on my bringing a chair and sitting with my work under the fir trees at the end of the house, and she beguiled Hareton, who had recovered from his accident, to dig and arrange her little garden, which was shifted to that corner by the influence of Joseph's complaints. I was comfortably reveling in the spring fragrance around, and the beautiful soft blue overhead, when my young lady, who had run down near the gate to procure some primrose roots for a border, returned only half-laden, and informed us that Mr. Heathcliff was coming in. And he spoke to me, she added with a perplexed look. What did he say? asked Hareton. He told me to be gone as fast as I could, she answered. But he looked so different from his usual look that I stopped a moment to stare at him. How? he inquired. Why, almost bright and cheerful. No, almost nothing. Very much excited. And wild and glad, she replied. Night walking amuses him, then, I remarked, affecting a careless manner. In reality as surprised as she was, and anxious to ascertain the truth of her statement, for to see the master looking glad would not be an everyday spectacle, I framed an excuse to go in. Heathcliff stood at the open door. He was pale, and he trembled, yet certainly he had a strange joyful glitter in his eyes that altered the aspect of his whole face. "'Will you have some breakfast?' I said. "'You must be hungry, rambling about all night.' I wanted to discover where he had been, but I did not like to ask directly. "'No, I'm not hungry.' he answered, averting his head, and speaking rather contemptuously, as if he guessed I was trying to divine the occasion of his good humour. I felt perplexed. I didn't know whether it were not a proper opportunity to offer a bit of admonition. I don't think it right to wander out of doors, I observed. Instead of being in bed, it is not wise, at any rate, this moist season. I dare say you'll catch a bad cold, or a fever, you have something the matter with you now. Nothing but what I can bear, he replied, and with the greatest pleasure provided you'll leave me alone. Get in, and don't annoy me. I obeyed, and in passing I saw he breathed as fast as a cat. Yes, I reflected to myself, we shall have a fit of illness. I cannot conceive what he has been doing. That noon he sat down to dinner with us and received a heaped-up plate from my hands, as if he intended to make amends for previous fasting. "'I've neither cold nor fever, Nellie,' he remarked, in allusion to my morning speech, "'and I'm ready to do justice to the food you give me.' He took his knife and fork, and was going to commence eating, when the inclination appeared to become suddenly extinct. He laid them on the table, looked eagerly toward the window, then rose and went out, we saw him walking to and fro in the garden while we concluded our meal. And Earnshaw said he'd go and ask why he would not dine. He thought we had grieved him some way. Well, is he coming? cried Catherine when he returned. Nay, he answered. But he's not angry. He seemed rare and pleased indeed. Only I made him impatient by speaking to him twice. And then he bid me off to you. He wondered how I could want the company of anybody else. I set his plate to keep warm on the fender, and after an hour or two he re-entered, when the room was clear, in no degree calmer. The same unnatural, it was unnatural, appearance of joy under his black brows, the same bloodless hue, and his teeth visible now and then in a kind of smile, his frame shivering, not as one shivers with chill or weakness, 
but as a tight-stretched cord vibrates, a strong thrilling rather than trembling. I will ask what is the matter, I thought, or who should, and I exclaimed, Have you heard any good news, Mr. Heathcliff? You look uncommonly animated. Where should good news come from to me, he said. I am animated with hunger, and seemingly I must not eat. Your dinner is here, I returned. Why won't you get it? I don't want it now, he muttered hastily. I'll wait till supper, and Nelly, once for all, let me beg you to warn Hareton and the other away from me. I wish to be troubled by nobody. I wish to have this place to myself. Is there some new reason for this banishment? I inquired. Tell me why you are so queer, Mr. Heathcliff. Where were you last night? I'm not putting the question through idle curiosity, but... You are putting the question through very idle curiosity, he interrupted with a laugh. Yet I'll answer it. Last night I was on the threshold of hell. Today I am within sight of my heaven. I have my eyes on it. Hardly three feet to sever me. And now you'd better go. You'll neither see nor hear anything to frighten you if you refrain from prying. Having swept the hearth and wiped the table, I departed more perplexed than ever. He did not quit the house again that afternoon, and no one intruded on his solitude till at eight o'clock I deemed it proper, though unsummoned, to carry a candle and his supper to him. He was leaning against the ledge of an open lattice, but not looking out. His face was turned to the interior gloom. The fire had smoldered to ashes. The room was filled with the damp, mild air of the cloudy evening, and so still that not only the murmur of the back down Gimmerton was distinguishable, but its ripples and its gurgling over the pebbles or through the large stones which it could not cover. I uttered an ejaculation of discontent at seeing the dismal grate, and commenced shutting the casements, one after another, till I came to his. Must I close this? I asked, in order to rouse him, for he would not stir. The light flashed on his features as I spoke. Oh, Mr. Lockwood, I cannot express what a terrible start I got by the momentary view. Those deep black eyes, that smile and ghastly paleness. It appeared to me not Mr. Heathcliff, but a goblin and in my terror I let the candle bend toward the wall, and it left me in darkness. Yes, close it, he replied in his familiar voice. There, that is pure awkwardness. Why did you hold the candle horizontally? Be quick and bring another. I hurried out in a foolish state of dread, and said to Joseph, The master wishes you to take him a light and rekindle the fire, for I dare not go in myself again just then. Joseph rattled some fire into the shovel and went, but he brought it back immediately, with the supper tray in his other hand, explaining that Mr. Heathcliff was going to bed, and he wanted nothing to eat till morning. We heard him mount the stairs directly. He did not proceed to his ordinary chamber, but turned into that with the panelled bed. Its window, as I mentioned before, is wide enough for anybody to get through, and it struck me that he plotted another midnight excursion which he had rather we had no suspicion of. Is he a ghoul or a vampire? I mused. I had read of such hideous incarnate demons. And then I set myself to reflect how I had tended him in infancy, and watched him grow to youth, and followed him almost through his whole course, and what nonsense it was to yield to that sense of horror. But where did he come from, the little dark thing? Harbored by a good man to his bane, muttered superstition, as I dozed into unconsciousness, and I began, half dreaming, to weary myself with imagining some fit parentage for him, and repeating my waking meditations, I tracked his existence over again, with grim variations, at last picturing his death and funeral, of which all I can remember is being exceedingly vexed at having the task of dictating an inscription for his monument, and consulting the sexton about it, and as he had no surname and we could not tell his age, we were obliged to content ourselves with a single word, Heathcliff. That came true, we were. If you enter the kirkyard, you'll read on his headstone only that, and the date of his death. Dawn restored me to common sense. I rose and went into the garden as soon as I could see, to ascertain if there were any footmarks under his window. There were none. He has stayed at home, I thought, and he'll be all right today. I prepared breakfast for the household, 
as was my usual custom, but told Hareton and Catherine to get theirs ere the master came down, for he lay late. They preferred taking it out of doors, under the trees, and I set a little table to accommodate them. On my re-entrance I found Mr. Heathcliff below. He and Joseph were conversing about some farming business. He gave clear minute directions concerning the matter discussed, but he spoke rapidly and turned his head continually aside and had the same excited expression, even more exaggerated. When Joseph quitted the room, he took his seat in the place he generally chose, and I put a basin of coffee before him. He drew it nearer and then rested his arms on the table and looked at the opposite wall, as I supposed surveying one particular portion, up and down, with glittering, restless eyes, and with such eager interest that he stopped breathing during half a minute together. Come now, I exclaimed, pushing some bread against his hand. Eat and drink that while it is hot. It has been waiting near an hour. He didn't notice me, and yet he smiled. I'd rather have seen him gnash his teeth than smile so. Mr. Heathcliff, master, I cried, don't for God's sake stare as if you saw an unearthly vision. Don't for God's sake shout so loud, he replied. Turn round and tell me, are we by ourselves? Of course, was my answer. Of course we are. Still, I involuntarily obeyed him, as if I were not quite sure. With a sweep of his hand, he cleared a vacant space in front among the breakfast things, and leaned forward to gaze more at his ease. Now I perceived he was not looking at the wall, for when I regarded him alone, it seemed exactly that he gazed at something within two yards' distance, and, whatever it was, it communicated apparently both pleasure and pain in exquisite extremes. At least the anguished yet raptured expression of his countenance suggested that idea. The fancied object was not fixed either. His eyes pursued it with unwearied vigilance, and even in speaking to me were never weaned away. I vainly reminded him of his protracted abstinence from food. If he stirred to touch anything in compliance with my entreaties, if he stretched his hand out to get a piece of bread, his fingers clenched before they reached it, and remained on the table, forgetful of their aim. I sat, a model of patience, trying to attract his absorbed attention from its engrossing speculation, till he grew irritable and got up, asking why I would not allow him to have his own time in taking his meals, and saying that on the next occasion I needn't wait. I might set the things down and go. Having uttered these words, he left the house, slowly sauntered down the garden path, and disappeared through the gate. The hours crept anxiously by. Another evening came. I did not retire to rest till late, and when I did, I could not sleep. He returned after midnight, and instead of going to bed, shut himself into the room beneath. I listened and tossed about, and finally dressed and descended. It was too irksome to lie up there, harassing my brain with a hundred idle misgivings. I distinguished Mr. Heathcliff's step, restlessly measuring the floor, and he frequently broke the silence by a deep inspiration, resembling a groan. He muttered detached words, also. The only one I could catch was the name of Catherine, coupled with some wild term of endearment or suffering, and spoken as one would speak to a person present, low and earnest and wrung from the depth of his soul. I had not courage to walk straight into the apartment, but I desired to divert him from his reverie, and therefore fell foul of the kitchen fire, stirred it, and began to scrape the cinders. It drew him forth sooner than I expected. He opened the door immediately and said, Nelly, come here. Is it morning? Come in with your light. It is striking four, I answered. You want a candle to take upstairs? You might have lighted one at this fire. No, I don't wish to go upstairs, he said. Come in, and kindle me a fire, and do anything there is to do about the room. I must blow the coals red first, before I can carry any, I replied, getting a chair and the bellows. He roamed to and fro, meantime, in a state approaching distraction, his heavy sighs succeeding each other so thick as to leave no space for common breathing between. When day breaks, I'll send for Green, he said. I wish to make some legal inquiries of him. While I can bestow a thought on those matters, and while I can act calmly, 
I have not written my will yet, and how to leave my property I cannot determine. I wish I could annihilate it from the face of the earth. I would not talk so, Mr. Heathcliff, I interposed. Let your will be a while. You'll be spared to repent of your many injustices yet. I never expected that your nerves would be disordered. They are at present, marvellously so, however, and almost entirely through your own fault. The way you've passed these last three days might knock up a titan. Do take some food and some repose. You need only look at yourself in a glass to see how you require both. Your cheeks are hollow and your eyes bloodshot, like a person starving with hunger and going blind with loss of sleep. It is not my fault that I cannot eat or rest, he replied. I assure you it is through no subtle designs. I'll do both as soon as I possibly can. But you might as well bid a man struggling in water rest within arm's length of the shore. I must reach it first, and then I'll rest. Well, never mind, Mr. Green. As to repenting of my injustices, I've done no injustice, and I repent of nothing. I'm too happy, and yet I'm not happy enough. My soul's bliss kills my body, but does not satisfy itself. Happy, master? I cried. Strange happiness! If you would hear me without being angry, I might offer some advice that would make you happier. What is that? he asked. Give it. You are aware, Mr. Heathcliff, I said, that from the time you were thirteen years old, you have lived a selfish, unchristian life, and probably hardly had a Bible in your hands during all that period. You must have forgotten the contents of the book, and you may not have space to search it now. Could it be hurtful to send for someone, some minister of any denomination, it doesn't matter which, to explain it and show you how very far you have erred from its precepts, and how unfit you will be for its heaven, unless a change takes place before you die? I'm rather obliged than angry, Nelly, he said, for you remind me of the manner that I desire to be buried in. It is to be carried to the churchyard in the evening. You and Hareton may, if you please, accompany me, and mind, particularly, to notice that the sexton obeys my directions concerning the two coffins. No minister need come, nor need anything be said over me. I tell you, I have nearly attained my heaven, and that of others is altogether unvalued and uncoveted by me. And supposing you preserved in your obstinate fast, and died by that means, and they refused to bury you in the precincts of the kirk? I said shocked at his godless indifference. How would you like it? They won't do that, he replied. If they did, you must have me removed secretly, and if you neglect it, you shall prove practically that the dead are not annihilated. As soon as he heard the other members of the family stirring, he retired to his den, and I breathed freer. But in the afternoon, while Joseph and Hareton were at their work, he came into the kitchen again, and with a wild look bid me come and sit in the house. He wanted somebody with him. I declined, telling him plainly that his strange talk and manner frightened me, and I had neither the nerve nor the will to be his companion alone. I believe you think me a fiend, he said, with his dismal laugh, something too horrible to live under a decent roof. Then, turning to Catherine, who was there, and who drew behind me at his approach, he added, half sneeringly, Will you come, Chuck? I'll not hurt you. No. To you I've made myself worse than the devil. Well, there is one who won't shrink from my company. By God, she's relentless. Oh, damn it. It's unutterably too much for flesh and blood to bear even mine. He solicited the society of no one more. At dusk he went into his chamber. Through the whole night and far into the morning we heard him groaning and murmuring to himself. Hareton was anxious to enter, but I bid him fetch Mr. Kenneth, and he should go in and see him. When he came and I requested admittance and tried to open the door, I found it locked, and Heathcliff bid us be damned. He was better and would be left alone, so the doctor went away. The following evening was very wet, indeed it poured down till day dawn, and as I took my morning walk round the house, I observed the master's window swinging open and the rain driving straight in. He cannot be in bed, I thought. Those showers would drench him through. He must be either up or out. But I'll make no more ado. I'll go boldly and look. Having succeeded in obtaining entrance with another key, I ran to unclose the panels, for the chamber was vacant. Quickly pushing them aside, I peeped in. Mr. Heathcliff was there. 
laid on his back. His eyes met mine, so keen and fierce that I started, and then he seemed to smile. I could not think him dead, but his face and throat were washed with rain. The bedclothes dripped, and he was perfectly still. The letters flapping to and fro had grazed one hand that rested on the sill. No blood trickled from the broken skin, and when I put my fingers to it I could doubt no more. He was dead and stark. I hasped the window. I combed his long black hair from his forehead. I tried to close his eyes, to extinguish, if possible, that frightful, lifelike exultation before anyone else beheld it. They would not shut. They seemed to sneer at my attempts, and his parted lips and sharp white teeth sneered too. Taken with another fit of cowardice, I cried out for Joseph. Joseph shuffled up and made a noise, but resolutely refused to meddle with him. The devil's hurried off his soul, he cried. That he must have his carcass out with a bargain, for all that I care. Ugh, what a wicked and he looks, grinning in death. And the old sinner grinned in mockery. I thought he intended to cut a cape around the bed, but suddenly composing himself, he fell on his knees and raised his hands, and returned thanks that the lawful master and the ancient stock were restored to their rights. I felt stunned by the awful event and my memory unavoidably recurred to former times with a sort of oppressive sadness. But poor Hareton, the most wronged, was the only one that really suffered much. He sat by the corpse all night, weeping in bitter earnest. He pressed its hand and kissed the sarcastic, savage face that everyone else shrank from contemplating, and bemoaned him with that strong grief which springs naturally from a generous heart though it be tough as tempered steel. Kenneth was perplexed to pronounce of what disorder the master died. I concealed the fact of his having swallowed nothing for four days, fearing it might lead to trouble, and then I am persuaded he did not abstain on purpose. It was the consequence of his strange illness, not the cause. We buried him to the scandal of the whole neighborhood, as he had wished. Earnshaw and I, the sexton, and six men to carry the coffin, comprehended the whole attendance. The six men departed, when they had let it down into the grave, we stayed to see it covered. Hareton, with a streaming face, dug green sods and laid them over the brown mould himself. At present it is as smooth and verdant as its companion mounds, and I hope its tenant sleeps as soundly. But the country folks, if you asked them, would swear on their Bibles that he walks. There are those who speak to having met him near the church, and on the moor, and even within this house. Idle tales, you'll say, and so say I. Yet that old man by the kitchen fire affirms he has seen two of them, looking out of his chamber window on every rainy night since his death. And an odd thing happened to me about a month ago. I was going to the Grange one evening, a dark evening threatening thunder, and just at the turn of the heights I encountered a little boy with a sheep and two lambs before him. He was crying terribly, and I supposed the lambs were skittish and would not be guided. What is the matter, my little man? I asked. There's Heathcliff and a woman yonder under the nab, he blubbered, and I daren't pass them. I saw nothing, but neither the sheep nor he would go on. So I bid him take the road lower down. He probably raised the phantoms from thinking as he traversed the moors alone, on the nonsense he had heard his parents and companions repeat. Yet still I don't like being out in the dark now, and I don't like being left by myself in this grim house. I cannot help it. I shall be glad when they leave it and shift to the Grange. They are going to the Grange, then, I said. Yes, answered Mrs. Dean. As soon as they are married, and that will be on New Year's Day. And who will live here then? Why, Joseph will take care of the house, and perhaps a lad to keep him company. They will live in the kitchen, and the rest will be shut up. For the use of such ghosts as choose to inhabit it, I observed. No, Mr. Lockwood, said Nelly, shaking her head. I believe the dead are at peace, but it is not right to speak of them with levity. At the moment the garden gate swung to, the ramblers were returning. They are afraid of nothing, I grumbled, watching their approach through the window. Together they would brave Satan and all his legions. As they stepped upon the door stones, 
and halted to take a last look at the moon, or more correctly at each other, by her light, I felt irresistibly impelled to escape them again, and pressing a remembrance into the hands of Mrs. Dean, and disregarding her expostulations at my rudeness, I vanished through the kitchen as they opened the house door, and so should have confirmed Joseph in his opinion of his fellow servant's gay indiscretions, had he not fortunately recognized me for a respectable character by the sweet ring of a sovereign at his feet. My walk home was lengthened by a diversion in the direction of the kirk, when beneath its walls I perceived decay had made progress even in seven months. Many a window showed black gaps deprived of glass, and slates jutted off, here and there, beyond the right line of the roof, to be gradually worked off in coming autumn storms. I sought, and soon discovered, the three headstones on the slope next the moor. The middle one, grey and half-buried in the heath, Edgar Linton's only harmonized by the turf and moss creeping up its foot, Heathcliff's still bare. I lingered round them, under that benign sky, watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listened to the soft wind breathing through the grass, and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth. End of section 13Section 14 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 14. Selected Excerpts by Phillips Brooks. Phillips Brooks, 1835-1893. Phillips Brooks was born in Boston, Massachusetts, December 13, 1835, and died there January 23, 1893. He inherited the best traditions of New England history, being, on the paternal side, the direct descendant of John Cotton, and his mother's name Phillips, standing for high learning and a distinction in the Congregational Church. Born at a time when the Orthodox faith was fighting its bitterest battle with Unitarianism, his parents accepted the dogmas of the new theology and had him baptized by a Unitarian clergyman. But while refusing certain dogmas of the Orthodox Church, they were the more thrown back for spiritual support upon the internal evidences of evangelical Christianity. Holding still, says the Reverend Arthur Brooks, in a greater or less degree, and with more or less precision, to the old statements, they counted the great fact that these statements enshrined more precious truth than any other. Transition to the Episcopal Church was easy. The mother became an Episcopalian, and Phillips Brooks received all his early training in that communion. But heredity had its influence and in after life the great bishop said that the Episcopal Church could reap the fruits of the long and bitter controversy which divided the New England Church only as it discerned the spiritual worth of Puritanism and the value of its contributions to the history of religious thought and character. Such were the early surroundings of the man, and the subsequent influences of his life tended to foster this liberal spirit. For such a purpose, Boston itself was a good place to live in. It was too large to be wholly provincial, and it was not so large that the individual was lost, and at that time it was moreover the literary center of America. When Phillips Brooks entered Harvard, 
he came into an atmosphere of intense intellectual activity. James Walker was the president of the college, and Lowell, Holmes, Agassiz, and Longfellow were among the professors. He graduated with honor in 1855, and soon after entered the Episcopal Theological Seminary at Alexandria, Virginia. The transition from Harvard to this college was an abrupt one. The standards of the North and South were radically different. The theology of the church in Virginia, while tolerant to that of other denominations, was uncompromisingly hostile to what it regarded as heterodox. When the war was declared, he threw himself passionately into the cause of the Union. Yet his affection for his southern classmates, men from whom he so widely differed, broadened that charity that was one of his finest characteristics, a charity that respected conviction wherever found. No man, in truth, ever did so much to remove prejudice against a church that had never been popular in New England. To the old Puritan dislike of episcopacy and distrust of the English church as that of the oppressors of the colony, was added a sense of resentment toward its sacerdotal claims and its assumption of ecclesiastical supremacy. But he nevertheless protested against the claim by his own communion to the title of the American Church. He preached occasionally in other pulpits. He even had among his audiences clergymen of other denominations, and he was able to reconcile men of different creeds into concord on what is essential in all. The breadth and depth of his teaching attracted so large a following that he increased the strength of the Episcopal Church in America far more than he could have done by carrying on an active propaganda in its behalf. Under his pastorate, Trinity Church, Boston, became the center of some of the most vigorous Christian activity in America. His first charge was the Church of the Advent in Philadelphia. In two years he became rector of Holy Trinity Church in the same city. In 1869 he was called to Trinity Church, Boston, of which he was rector until his election as Bishop of Massachusetts in 1891. It is impossible to give an idea of Phillips Brooks without a word about his personality, which was almost contradictory. His commanding figure, his wit, the charm of his conversation, and a certain boyish gaiety and naturalness, drew people to him as to a powerful magnet. He was one of the best-known men in America. People pointed him out to strangers in his own city, as they pointed out the Common and the Bunker Hill Monument. When he went to England, where he preached before the Queen, men and women of all classes greeted him as a friend. They thronged the churches where he preached, not only to hear him, but to see him. Many stories are told of him, some true, some more or less apocryphal, all proving the affectionate sympathy existing between him and his kind. It was said of him that as soon as he entered a pulpit, he was absolutely impersonal. There was no trace of individual experience or theological conflict by which he might be labeled. He was simply a messenger of the truth as he held it, a mouthpiece of the gospel as he believed it had been delivered to him. Although in his seminary days his sermons were described as vague and unpractical, Phillips Brooks was as great a preacher when under thirty years of age as he was at any later time. His early sermons, delivered to his first charge in Philadelphia, displayed the same individuality, 
the same force and completeness and clearness of construction, the same deep, strong undertone of religious thought, as his great discourses preached in Westminster Abbey six months before his death. His sentences are sonorous. His style was characterized by a noble simplicity, impressive, but without a touch showing that dramatic effect was strained for. He passionately loved nature in all her aspects, and traveled widely in search of the picturesque. But he used his experience with reserve, and his illustrations are used to explain human life. His power of painting a picture in a few bold strokes appears strikingly in the great sermon on the lesson of the life of Saul, where he contrasts early promise and final failure, and in that other not less remarkable presentation of the vision of St. Peter. His treatment of Bible narratives is not a translation into the modern manner, nor is it an adaptation but a poetical rendering in which the flavor of the original is not lost though the lesson is made contemporary. And while he did not transcribe nature upon his pages, his sermons are not lacking in decoration. He used figures of speech and drew freely on history and art for illustrations, but not so much to elucidate his subject as to ornament it. His essays on social and literary subjects are written with the aim of directness of statement, pure and simple, but the stuff of which his sermons are woven is of royal purple. The conviction that religious sentiment should penetrate the whole life showed itself in Phillips Brooks's relation to literature. Truth, bathed in light, and uttered in love, makes the new unit of power, he says in his essay on literature. It was his task to mediate between literature and theology, and restore theology to the place it lost through the abstractions of the schoolmen. What he would have done if he had devoted himself to literature alone we can only conjecture by the excellence of his style in essays and sermons. They show his poetical temperament. And his little lyric, O Little Town of Bethlehem, will be sung as long as Christmas is celebrated. His essays show more clearly even than his sermons his opinions on society, literature, and religion. They place him where he belongs, in that small transfigured band the world cannot tame. The world of Cranmer, Jeremy Taylor, Robertson, Arnold, Maurice. His paper on Dean Stanley discloses his theological views as openly as do his addresses on heresies and orthodoxy. As might be expected of one who, in the world's best sense, was so thoroughly a man, he had great influence with young men and was one of the most popular of Harvard preachers. It was his custom for thirty alternate years to go abroad in the summer, and there, as in America, he was regarded as a great pulpit orator. He took a large view of social questions and was in sympathy with all great popular movements. His advancement to the Episcopate was warmly welcomed by all parties, except one branch of his own church with which his principles were at variance, and every denomination delighted in his elevation as if he were the peculiar property of each. He published several volumes of sermons, his works include Lectures on Preaching, New York, 1877, Sermons, 1878 to 81, Bolin Lectures, 1879, Baptism and Confirmation, 1880, 
Sermons Preached in English Churches, 1883, The Oldest Schools in America, Boston, 1885, Twenty Sermons, New York, 1886, Tolerance, 1887, The Light of the World and Other Sermons, 1890, and Essays and Addresses, 1894. His letters of travel show him to be an accurate observer with a large fund of spontaneous humor. No letters to children are so delightful as those in this volume. O LITTLE TOWN OF BETHLEHEM O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee to-night o morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to god the king and peace to men on earth for christ is born of mary and gather all above while mortals sleep the angels keep their watch of wondering love how silently how silently the wondrous gift is given so god imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven no ear may hear his coming but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still the dear christ enters in where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child where misery cries out to thee son of the mother mild where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door the dark night wakes the glory breaks and christmas comes once more o holy child of bethlehem descend to us we pray cast out our sin and enter in be born in us to-day we hear the christmas angels the great glad tidings tell o come to us abide with us our lord emmanuel personal character from essays and addresses as one looks around the world and as one looks around our own land to-day he sees that the one thing we need in high places the thing whose absence among those who hold the reins of highest power is making us all anxious with regard to the progress of the country is personal character the trouble is not what we hold to be mistaken ideas with regard to policies of government, but it is the absence of lofty and unselfish character. It is the absence of the complete consecration of a man's self to the public good. It is the willingness of men to bring their personal and private spites into spheres whose elevation ought to shame such things into absolute death. The tendencies of men, even of men whom the nation has put in very high places indeed, to count those high places their privileges, and to try to draw from them, not help for humanity and the community over which they rule, but their own mean, personal, private advantage if there is any power that can elevate human character if there is any power which without inspiring men with a supernatural knowledge with regard to policies of government without making men solve all at once intuitively the intricacies of problems of legislation 
with which they are called upon to deal without making men see instantly to the very heart of every matter if there is any power which could permeate to the very bottom of our community which would make men unselfish and true why the errors of men the mistakes men might make in their judgment would not be an obstacle in the way of the progress of this great nation in the work which god has given her to do they would make jolts but nothing more or in the course which god has appointed her to run she would go to her true results there is no power that man has ever seen that can abide there is no power of which man has ever dreamed that can regenerate human character except religion and till the christian religion which is the religion of this land till the christian religion shall have so far regenerated human character in this land that multitudes of men shall act under its high impulses and principles so that the men who are not inspired with them shall be shamed at least into an outward conformity with them there is no security for the great final continuance of the nation the courage of opinions from essays and addresses we have spoken of physical courage or the courage of nerves of moral courage or the courage of principles besides these there is intellectual courage or the courage of opinions let me say a few words upon that for surely there is nothing which we more need to understand the ways in which people form their opinions are most remarkable every man when he begins his reasonable life finds certain general opinions current in the world he is shaped by these opinions in one way or another either directly or by reaction if he is soft and plastic like the majority of people he takes the opinions that are about him for his own if he is self-asserting and defiant he takes the opposite of these opinions and gives to them his vehement adherence we know the two kinds well and as we ordinarily see them the fault which is at the root of both is intellectual cowardice one man clings servilely to the old ready-made opinions which he finds because he is afraid of being called rash and radical another rejects the traditions of his people from fear of being thought fearful and timid and a slave the results are very different one is the tame conservative and the other is the fiery iconoclast but i beg you to see that the cause in both cases is the same both are cowards both are equally removed from that brave seeking of the truth which is not set upon either winning or avoiding any name which will take no opinion for the sake of conformity and reject no opinion for the sake of originality which is free therefore free to gather its own convictions a slave neither to any compulsion nor to any antagonism tell me have you never seen two teachers one of them slavishly adopting old methods because he feared to be called imitator the other crudely devising new plans because he was afraid of seeming conservative both of them really cowards neither of them really thinking out his work the great vice of our people in their relation to the politics of the land is cowardice it is not lack of intelligence our people know the meaning of political conditions with wonderful sagacity it is not low morality the great mass of our people apply high standards to the acts of public men but it is cowardice it is the disposition of one part of our people 
to fall in with current ways of working to run with the mass and of another part to rush headlong into this or that new scheme or policy of opposition merely to escape the stigma of conservatism literature and life from essays and addresses life comes before literature as the material always comes before the work the hills are full of marble before the world blooms with statues the forests are full of trees before the sea is thick with ships so the world abounds in life before men begin to reason and describe and analyze and sing and literature is born the fact and the action must come first this is true in every kind of literature the mind and its workings are before the metaphysician beauty and romance antedate the poet the nations rise and fall before the historian tells their story nature's profusion exists before the first scientific book is written even the facts of mathematics must be true before the first diagram is drawn for their demonstration to own and recognize this priority of life is the first need of literature literature which does not utter a life already existent more fundamental than itself is shallow and unreal i had a schoolmate who at the age of twenty published a volume of poems called life memories the book died before it was born there were no real memories because there had been no life so every science which does not utter investigated fact every history which does not tell of experience every poetry which is not based upon the truth of things has no real life it does not perish it is never born therefore men and nations must live before they can make literature boys and girls do not write books oregon and van diemen's land produce no literature they are too busy living the first attempts at literature of any country as of our own are apt to be unreal and imitative and transitory because life has not yet accumulated and presented itself in forms which recommend themselves to literature the wars must come the clamorous problems must arise the new types of character must be evolved the picturesque social complication must develop a life must come and then will be the true time for a literature literature grows feeble and conceited unless it ever recognizes the priority and superiority of life and stands in genuine awe before the greatness of the men and of the ages which have simply lived end of section 14 Recording by Leonard Wilson Section 15 of Library of the World's Best Literature Ancient and Modern, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Matt Braymiller Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors. Section 15. Wyland's Statement, by Charles Brockton Brown. Charles Brockton Brown, 1771 to 1810. Not only was Brockton Brown the first American man of letters proper, one writing for a living before we had any real literature of our own, 
but his work possessed a genuine power and originality which gives it some claim to remembrance for its own sake and it is fair always to remember that a given product from a pioneer indicates a far greater endowment than the same from one of a group in a more developed age the forerunner lacks not one thing only but many things which help his successors he lacks the mental friction from the emulation of the competition with other writers he lacks the stimulus and comfort of sympathetic companionship he lacks an audience to spur him on and a market to work for lacks labor-saving conventions training and an environment that heartens him instead of merely tolerating him like robinson crusoe he must make his tools before he can use them a meagre result may therefore be a proof of great abilities the united states in eighteen hundred was mentally and morally a colony of great britain still a few hundred thousand white families scattered over about as many square miles of territory much of it refractory wilderness with more refractory inhabitants with no cities of any size and no communication save by wretched roads or by sailing vessels no rich old universities for centers of culture and no rich leisured society to enjoy it the energies of the people perforce absorbed in subduing material obstacles or solidifying a political experiment disbelieved in by the very men who organized it neither time nor materials existed then for an independent literary life which is the growth of security and comfort and leisure if it embraces a whole society or of endowed college foundations and an aristocracy if it is only of the few hence american society took its literary meals at the common table of the english-speaking race with little or no effort at a separate establishment there was much writing but mostly polemic or journalistic when real literature was attempted it consisted in general of imitations of british essays or fiction or poetry and in the last two cases not even imitations of the best models in either the essays were modeled on addison the poetry on the heavy imitators of pope's heroics the fiction either on the effusive sentimentalists who followed richardson or the pseudo orientalists like walpole and lewis or on the pseudo medievalists like mrs roche and mrs radcliffe this sort of work filled the few literary periodicals of the day but was not read enough to make such publications profitable even then, and is pretty much all unreadable now. Charles Brockton Brown stands in marked contrast to these second-hand weaklings, not only by his work, but still more by his method and temper. In actual achievement, he did not quite fulfill the promise of his early books, and cannot be set high among his craft. He was an inferior artist, and though he achieved naturalism of matter, he clung to the theatrical artificiality of style which was in vogue. But if he had broken away from all traditions, he could have gained no hearing whatever. He died young. Twenty years more might have left him a much greater figure, and he wrought in disheartening loneliness of spirit. His accomplishment was that of a pioneer. He was the first American author to see that the true field for his fellows was America and not Europe. He realized, as the genius of Chateaubriand realized at almost the same moment, the artistic richness of the material which lay to hand in the silent forest vastness, with their unfamiliar life of man and beast, and their possibilities of mystery enough to satisfy the most craving. He was not the equal of the author of the Natchez and Attila, but he had a fresh and daring mind. He turned away from both the emotional orgasms and the stage claptrap of his time to break ground for all future American novelists. He antedated Cooper in the field of Indian life and character, and he entered the regions of mystic supernaturalism and the disordered human brain in advance of Hawthorne and Poe. That his choice of material was neither chance nor blind instinct, but deliberate judgment and insight, is shown by the preface to Edgar Huntley, in which he sets forth his views. America has opened new views to the naturalist and politician, but has seldom furnished themes to the moral pointer, that new springs of action and new motives of curiosity should operate, that the field of investigation opened to us by our own country should differ essentially from those which exist in Europe may be readily conceived. 
The sources of amusement to the fancy and instruction to the heart that are peculiar to ourselves are equally numerous and inexhaustible. It is the purpose of this work to profit by some of these sources, to exhibit a series of adventures growing out of the conditions of our country, and connected with one of the most common and wonderful diseases of the human frame, puerile superstition and exploded manners. Gothic castles and chimeras are the materials usually employed for this end. The incidents of Indian hostility and the perils of the western wilderness are far more suitable, and for a native of America to overlook these would admit of no apology. These, therefore, are in part the ingredients of this tale. Brown's was an uneventful career. He was much given to solitary rambles and musings, varied by social intercourse with a few congenial friends and the companionship of his affectionate family, and later many hours spent at his writing desk or in an editorial chair. He was born January seventeenth, 1771, in Philadelphia, of good Quaker stock, a delicate boyhood keeping him away from the more active life of youths of his own age fostered a love for solitude and a taste for reading he received a good classical education but poor health prevented him from pursuing his studies at college at his family's wish he entered a law office instead but the literary instinct was strong within him literature at this time was scarcely considered a profession magazine circulations were too limited for publishers to pay for contributions and all an author usually got or expected to get was some copies to distribute among his friends to please his prudent home circle brown dallied for a while with the law but a visit to new york where he was cordially received by the members of the friendly club opened up avenues of literary work to him and he removed to new york in seventeen ninety six to devote himself to it the first important work he produced was Wyland, or The Transformation, 1798. It shows at the outset Brown's characteristic traits, independence of British materials and methods. It is in substance a powerful tale of ventriloquism operating on an unbalanced and superstitious mind. Its psychology is acute and searching, the characterization realistic and effective. His second book, Ormond, or The Secret Witness, 1799, does not reach the level of Wyland. It is more conventional and not entirely independent of foreign models, especially Godwin, whom Brown greatly admired. A rapid writer, he soon had the manuscript of his next novel in the hands of the publisher. The first part of Arthur Mervyn, or Memoirs of the Year 1793, came out in 1799, and the second part in 1800. It is the best known of his six novels. Though the scene is laid in Philadelphia, Brown embodied in it his experience of the yellow fever which raged in New York in 1799. The passage describing this epidemic can stand beside Defoe's or Poe's or Manzoni's similar descriptions for power in setting forth the horrors of the plague. In the same year with the first volume of Arthur Mervyn appeared Edgar Huntley, or Memoirs of a Sleepwalker, here he deals with the wild life of nature, the rugged solitudes, and the redskins, the field in which he was followed by Cooper. A thrilling scene in which a panther as chief actor was long familiar to American children in their school reading books. In 1801 came out his last two novels, Clara Howard, in a series of letters, and Jane Talbot. They are a departure from his previous work. Instead of dealing with uncanny subjects, they treat of quiet domestic and social life. They show also a great advance on his previous books in constructive art. In 1799, Brown became editor of the monthly magazine and American Review, and contributed largely to it. In the autumn of 1801, he returned to Philadelphia to assume the editorship of Conrad's literary magazine and American Review. The duties of this office suspended his own creative work, and he did not live to take up again the novelist's stylus. In 1806 he became editor of the Annual Register. His genuine literary force is best proved by the fact that whatever periodical he took in charge, he raised its standard of quality and made it a success for the time. He died in February, 1810. The work to which he had given the greater part of his time and strength, especially toward the end of his life, was in its nature not only transitory, but not of a sort to keep his name alive. 
The magazines were children of a day, and the editor's repute as such could hardly survive them long. The fame which belongs to Charles Brockton Brown, grudgingly accorded by a country that can ill afford to neglect one of its earliest, most devoted, and most original workers, rests on his novels. Judged by standards of the present day, these are far from faultless. The facts are not very coherent, the diction is artificial in the fashion of the day. But when all is said, Brown was a rare storyteller. He interested his readers by the novelty of his material, and he was quite objective in its treatment, never obtruding his own personality. Wyland, Edgar Huntley, and Arthur Mervyn, the trilogy of his best novels, are not to be contemned, and he has the distinction of being, in very truth, the pioneer of American letters. Wyland's Statement Theodore Wyland, the prisoner at the bar, was now called upon for his defense. He looked around him for some time in silence, and with a mild countenance. At length he spoke. It is strange. I am known to my judges and my auditors. Who is there present a stranger to the character of Wyland? Who knows him not as a husband, as a father, as a friend? Yet here am I arraigned as a criminal. I am charged with diabolical malice. I am accused of the murder of my wife and my children. It is true. They were slain by me. They all perished by my hand. The task of vindication is ignoble. What is it that I am called to vindicate? And before whom? You know that they are dead, and that they were killed by me. What more would you have? Would you extort from me a statement of my motives? Have you failed to discover them already? You charge me with malice, but your eyes are not shut. Your reason is still vigorous. Your memory has not forsaken you. You know whom it is that you thus charge. The habits of his life are known to you. His treatment of his wife and his offspring is known to you. The soundness of his integrity and the unchangeableness of his principles are familiar to your apprehension. Yet you persist in this charge. You lead me hither manacled as a felon. You deem me worthy of a vile and tormenting death. Who are they whom I have devoted to death? My wife, the little ones that drew their being from me, that creature who, as she surpassed them in excellence, claimed a larger affection than those whom natural affinities bound to my heart. Think ye that malice could have urged me to this deed? Hide your audacious fronts from the scrutiny of heaven. Take refuge in some cavern unvisited by human eyes. Ye may deplore your wickedness or folly, but ye cannot expiate it. Think not that I speak for your sakes. Hug to your hearts this detestable infatuation. Deem me still a murderer, and drag me to an untimely death. I make not an effort to dispel your illusion. I utter not a word to cure you of your sanguinary folly. But there are probably some in this assembly who have come from far. For their sakes, whose distance has disabled them from knowing me, I will tell what I have done, and why. It is needless to say that God is the object of my supreme passion. I have cherished in His presence a single and upright heart. I have thirsted for the knowledge of His will. I have burnt with ardor to approve my faith and my obedience. My days have been spent in searching for the revelation of that will, but my days have been mournful because my search failed. I solicited direction. I turned on every side where glimmerings of light could be discovered. I have not been wholly uninformed, but my knowledge has always stopped short of certainty. Dissatisfaction has insinuated itself into all my thoughts. My purposes have been pure, my wishes indefatigable but not till lately were these purposes thoroughly accomplished and these wishes fully gratified. I thank thee, my father, for thy bounty, that thou didst not ask a less sacrifice than this, that thou placed me in a condition to testify my submission to thy will. What have I withheld which it was thy pleasure to exact? Now may I, with dauntless and erect eye, claim my reward since I have given thee the treasure of my soul. I was at my own house. It was late in the evening. My sister had gone to the city, but proposed to return. It was in expectation of her return that my wife and I delayed going to bed beyond the usual hour. 
The rest of the family, however, were retired. My mind was contemplative and calm, not wholly devoid of apprehension on account of my sister's safety. Recent events, not easily explained, had suggested the existence of some danger, but this danger was without a distinct form in our imagination and scarcely ruffled our tranquillity. Time passed and my sister did not arrive. Her house is at some distance from mine, and though her arrangements had been made with a view of residing with us, it was possible that through forgetfulness, or the occurrence of unforeseen emergencies, she had returned to her own dwelling. Hence it was conceived proper that I should ascertain the truth by going thither. I went. On my way my mind was full of those ideas which related to my intellectual condition. In the torrent of fervid conceptions I lost sight of my purpose. Sometimes I stood still, sometimes I wandered from my path and experienced some difficulty on recovering from my fit of musing to regain it. The series of my thoughts is easily traced. At first every vein beat with raptures known only to the man whose parental and conjugal love is without limits, and the cup of whose desires, immense as it is, overflows with gratification. I know not why emotions that were perpetual visitants should now have recurred with unusual energy. The transition was not new from sensations of joy to a consciousness of gratitude. The author of my being was likewise the dispenser of every gift with which that being was embellished. The service to which a benefactor like this was entitled could not be circumscribed. My social sentiments were indebted to their alliance with devotion for all their value. All passions are base, all joys feeble, all energies malignant which are not drawn from this source. For a time my contemplations soared above earth and its inhabitants. I stretched forth my hands, I lifted my eyes and exclaimed, Oh, that I might be admitted to thy presence, that mine were the supreme delight of knowing thy will and of performing it the blissful privilege of direct communication with thee and of listening to the audible enunciation of thy pleasure what task would i not undertake what privation would i not cheerfully endure to testify my love of thee alas thou hidest thyself from my view glimpses only of thy excellence and beauty are afforded me would that a momentary emanation from thy glory would visit me that some unambiguous token of thy presence would salute my senses in this mood I entered the house of my sister. It was vacant. Scarcely had I regained collection of the purpose that brought me hither. Thoughts of a different tendency had such an absolute possession of my mind that the relations of time and space were almost obliterated from my understanding. These wanderings, however, were restrained, and I ascended to her chamber. I had no light and might have known by external observation that the house was without any inhabitant with this however i was not satisfied i entered the room and the object of my search not appearing i prepared to return the darkness required some caution in descending the stair i stretched out my hand to seize the balustrade by which i might regulate my steps how shall i describe the lustre which at that moment burst upon my vision i was dazzled my organs were bereaved of their activity my eyelids were half closed and my hands withdrawn from the balustrade a nameless fear chilled my veins and i stood motionless this irradiation did not retire or lessen it seemed as if some powerful effulgence covered me like a mantle i opened my eyes and found all about me luminous and glowing it was the element of heaven that flowed around nothing but a fiery stream was at first visible but anon a shrill voice from behind called upon me to attend. I turned. It is forbidden to describe what I saw. Words, indeed, would be wanting to the task. The lineaments of that being whose veil was now lifted and whose visage beamed upon my sight, no hues of pencil or of language can portray. As it spoke, the accents thrilled to my heart. Thy prayers are heard. In proof of thy faith, render me thy wife this is the victim i choose call her hither and here let her fall the sound and visage and light vanished at once what demand was this the blood of catherine was to be shed my wife was to perish by my hand i sought opportunity to attest my virtue little did i expect that a proof like this would have been demanded 
my wife i exclaimed o oh god substitute some other victim make me not the butcher of my wife my own blood is cheap this i will pour out before thee with a willing heart but spare i beseech thee this precious life or commission some other than her husband to perform the bloody deed in vain the conditions were prescribed the decree had gone forth and nothing remained but to execute it i rushed out of the house and across the intermediate fields and stopped not till i had entered my own parlour my wife had remained here during my absence in anxious expectation of my return with some tidings of her sister i had none to communicate for a time i was breathless with my speed this and the tremors that shook my frame and the wildness of my looks alarmed her she immediately suspected some disaster to have happened to her friend and her own speech was as much overpowered by emotion as mine she was silent but her looks manifested her impatience to hear what i had to communicate i spoke but with so much precipitation as scarcely to be understood catching her at the same time by the arm and forcibly pulling her from her seat come along with me fly waste not a moment time will be lost and the deed will be omitted tarry not question not but fly with me this deportment added afresh to her alarms her eyes perused mine and she said what is the matter for god's sake what is the matter where would you have me go my eyes were fixed upon her countenance while she spoke i thought upon her virtues i viewed her as the mother of my babes as my wife i recalled the purpose for which i thus urged her attendance my heart faltered and i saw that i must rouse to this work all my faculties the danger of the least delay was imminent i looked away from her and again exerting my force drew her toward the door you must go with me indeed you must in her fright she half resisted my efforts and again exclaimed good heavens what is it you mean where go what has happened have you found clara follow me and you will see i answered still urging her reluctant steps forward what frenzy has seized you something must needs have happened is she sick have you found her come and see follow me and know for yourself still she expostulated and besought me to explain this mysterious behavior i could not trust myself to answer her to look at her but grasping her arm i drew her after me she hesitated rather through confusion of mind than from unwillingness to accompany me this confusion gradually abated and she moved forward but with irresolute footsteps and continual exclamations of wonder and terror her interrogations of what was the matter and whither was i going were ceaseless and vehement it was the scope of my efforts not to think to keep up a conflict and uproar in my mind in which all order and distinctness should be lost to escape from the sensations produced by her voice i was therefore silent i strove to abridge this interval by haste and to waste all my attention in furious gesticulations in this state of mind we reached my sister's door she looked at the windows and saw that all was desolate why come we here there is nobody here i will not go in still i was dumb but opening the door i drew her into the entry this was the allotted scene here she was to fall i let go her hand and pressing my palms against my forehead made one mighty effort to work up my soul to the deed in vain it would not be my courage was appalled my arms nerveless i muttered prayers that my strength might be aided from above they availed nothing horror diffused itself over me this conviction of my cowardice my rebellion fastened upon me and i stood rigid and cold as marble from this state i was somewhat relieved by my wife's voice who renewed her supplications to be told why we come hither and what was the fate of my sister the fellness of a gloomy hurricane but faintly resembled the discord that reigned in my mind to omit this sacrifice must not be yet my sinews had refused to perform it no alternative was offered to rebel against the mandate was impossible but obedience would render me the executioner of my wife my will was strong but my limbs refused their office that accents and looks so winning should disarm me of my resolution was to be expected my thoughts were thrown anew into anarchy 
I spread my hand before my eyes that I might not see her, and answered only by groans. She took my other hand between hers, and pressing it to her heart, spoke with that voice which had ever swayed my will and wafted away sorrow. My friend, my soul's friend, tell me thy cause of grief. Do I not merit to partake with thee in thy cares? Am I not thy wife? This was too much. I broke from her embrace and retired to a corner of the room. In this pause, courage was once more infused into me. I resolved to execute my duty. She followed me and renewed her passionate entreaties to know the cause of my distress. I raised my head and regarded her with steadfast looks. I muttered something about death and the injunctions of my duty. At these words she shrunk back and looked at me with a new expression of anguish. After a pause she clasped her hands and exclaimed, Oh, Wyland, Wyland, God grant that I am mistaken, but something surely is wrong. I see it. It is too plain. Thou art undone, lost to me and to thyself. At the same time she gazed on my features with intensest anxiety, in hope that different symptoms would take place. I replied to her with vehemence, Undone! No, my duty is known, and I thank my God that my cowardice is now vanquished, and I have power to fulfill it. Catherine, I pity the weakness of thy nature. I pity thee, but must not spare. Thy life is claimed from my hands. Thou must die. Fear was now added to her grief. What mean you? Why talk you of death? Bethink yourself, Wyland. Bethink yourself, and this fit will pass. Oh, why came I hither? Why did you drag me hither? I brought thee hither to fulfill a divine command. I am appointed thy destroyer, and destroy thee I must. Saying this, I seized her wrists. She shrieked aloud and endeavored to free herself from my grasp, but her efforts were vain. Surely, surely, Wyland, thou dost not mean it. Am I not thy wife? And wouldst thou kill me? Thou wilt not, and yet... I see... Thou art Wyland no longer. A fury resistless and horrible possesses thee. Spare me! Spare! Help! Help! Till her breath was stopped, she shrieked for help, for mercy. When she could speak no longer, her gestures, her looks, appealed to my compassion. My accursed hand was irresolute and tremulous. I meant thy death to be sudden, thy struggles to be brief. Alas! My heart was infirm my resolves mutable. Thrice I slackened my grasp, and life kept its hold, though in the midst of pangs. Her eyeballs started from their sockets. Grimness and distortion took the place of all that used to bewitch me into transport and subdue me into reverence. I was commissioned to kill thee, but not to torment thee with the foresight of thy death, not to multiply thy fears and prolong thy agonies. Haggard and pale and lifeless, at length thou ceased to contend with thy destiny. This was the moment of triumph. Thus had I successfully subdued the stubbornness of human passions. The victim which had been demanded was given. The deed was done past recall. I lifted the corpse in my arms and laid it on the bed. I gazed upon it with delight. Such was the elation of my thoughts that I even broke into laughter. I clapped my hands and exclaimed, It is done! my sacred duty fulfilled to that i have sacrificed o oh my god thy last and best gift my wife for a while i thus soared above frailty i imagined that i had set myself forever beyond the reach of selfishness but my imaginations were false this rapture quickly subsided i looked again at my wife my joyous ebullitions vanished and i asked myself who it was whom i saw Methought it could not be Catherine. It could not be the woman who had lodged for years in my heart, who had slept nightly in my bosom, who had borne in her womb, who had fostered at her breast the beings who called me father, whom I have watched with delight and cherished with a fondness ever new and perpetually growing. It could not be the same. Where was her bloom? These deadly and blood-suffused orbs but ill resembled the azure and ecstatic tenderness of her eyes. The lucid stream that meandered over that bosom, the glow of love that was wont to sit upon that cheek, are much unlike these livid stains and this hideous deformity. Alas, these were the traces of agony. The gripe of the assassin had been here. 
I will not dwell upon my lapse into desperate and outrageous sorrow. The breath of heaven that sustained me was withdrawn, and I sunk into mere man. I leaped from the floor, I dashed my head against the wall, I uttered screams of horror, I panted after torment and pain, eternal fire and the bickerings of hell, compared with what I felt, were music and a bed of roses. I thank my God that this degeneracy was transient, that he deigned once more to raise me aloft. I thought upon what I had done as a sacrifice to duty, and was calm. My wife was dead, but I reflected that though this source of human consolation was closed, yet others were still open. If the transports of a husband were no more, the feelings of a father had still scope for exercise. When remembrance of their mother should excite too keen a pang, I would look upon them and be comforted. While I resolved these ideas, new warmth flowed in upon my heart. I was wrong. These feelings were the growth of selfishness. Of this I was not aware, and to dispel the mist that obscured my perceptions, a new effulgence and a new mandate were necessary. From these thoughts I was recalled by a ray that was shot into the room. A voice spake like that which I had heard before. Thou hast done well, but all is not done. The sacrifice is incomplete. Thy children must be offered. They must perish with their mother. Thou, omnipotent and holy, thou knowest that my actions were conformable to thy will. I know not what is crime, what actions are evil in their ultimate and comprehensive tendency, or what are good. Thy knowledge, as thy power, is unlimited. I have taken thee for my guide and cannot err. To the arms of thy protection I entrust my safety. In the awards of thy justice I confide for my recompense. Come death when it will, I am safe. Let calumny and abhorrence pursue me among men. I shall not be defrauded of my dues. The peace of virtue and the glory of obedience will be my portion hereafter. End of section 15section sixteen of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne spiegel library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section sixteen marjorie fleming from spare hours by john brown part one one November afternoon in 1810, the year in which Waverley was resumed and laid aside again, to be finished off, its last two volumes in three weeks, and made immortal in 1814, and when its author, by the death of Lord Melville, narrowly escaped getting a civil appointment in India, three men, evidently lawyers, might have been seen escaping like schoolboys from the Parliament House, and speeding arm in arm down Bank Street, and the mound, in the teeth of a surly blast of sleet. The three friends sought the beeld of the low wall old Edinburgh boys remember well, and sometimes miss now, as they struggle with the stout west wind. The third we all know. What has he not done for every one of us? Who else ever, except Shakespeare, so diverted mankind, entertained and entertains a world so liberally, so wholesomely? We are fain to say not even Shakespeare, for his is something deeper than diversion, something higher than pleasure, and yet who would care to split this hair? Had any one watched him closely before and after the parting, what a change he would see! The bright, broad laugh, the shrewd, jovial word, the man of the Parliament House and of the world, and next stop, moody, the light of his eye withdrawn, as if seeing things that were invisible, his shut mouth like a child's, so impressionable, so innocent, so sad. He was now all within, as before he was all without, hence his brooding look. As the snow blattered in his face, he muttered, How it raves and drifts! Onding, o sna! Ay, that's the word, onding! He was now at his own door, Castle Street, number 39. He opened the door and went straight to his den, that wondrous workshop, where in one year, 1823, when he was fifty-two, 
he wrote Peveril of the Peak, Quentin Durward, and St. Ronan's Well, besides much else. We once took the foremost of our novelists, the greatest, we would say, since Scott, into this room, and could not but mark the solemnizing effect of sitting where the great magician sat so often and so long, and looking out upon that shabby bit of sky, and that back green where faithful dog camp lies. He sat down in his large green Morocco elbow chair, drew himself close to his table, and glowered and gloomed at his writing apparatus, a very handsome old box, richly carved, lined with crimson velvet, and containing ink bottles, taper stand, etc., in silver, the whole in such order that it might have come from the silversmith's window half an hour before. He took out his paper, then starting up angrily, said, "'Go spin, you jade, go spin! No, d it, it won't do. My spinning wheel is odd and stiff, the rock ought one to stand, stir, to keep the temper pin in tiff, employs our oft my hand, sir. I'm off the fang. I can make nothing of Waverley to-day. I'll away to Marjorie. Come with me, matey. You thief. The creature rose slowly, and the pair were off, Scott taking a maud, a plaid, with him. White as a frosted plum cake, by Jingo, said he, when he got to the street. Come wee me, matey. You thief. The great creature rose slowly, and the pair were off, Scott taking a maud, a plaid, with him. White as a frosted plum cake, by Jingo, said he, when he got to the street. Maida gambled and whisked among the snow, and his master strode across to Young Street, and through it to one North Charlotte Street, to the house of his dear friend, Mrs. William Keith, of Corsterfine Hill, niece of Mrs. Keith of Ravelston, of whom he said at her death, eight years after, much tradition, and that of the best, has died with that excellent old lady, one of the few persons whose spirits, and cleanliness and freshness of mind and body, made old age lovely and desirable. Sir Walter was in that house almost every day, and had a key, so in he and the hound went, shaking themselves in the lobby. Marjorie, Marjorie, shouted her friend, where are ye, my bonny wee crudlin do? In a moment a bright, eager child of seven was in his arms, and he was kissing her all over. Out came Mrs. Keith. Come your ways in, Watty. No, not now. I'm going to take Marjorie wee me. And you may come to your tea in Duncan Roy's sedan, and bring the bairn home in your lap. Take Marjorie, and it on ding a snay, said Mrs. Keith. He said to himself, On ding, that's odd. That is the very word. Hoot, away, look here. And he displayed the corner of his plaid, made to hold lambs, the true shepherd's plaid consisting of two breasts sewed together and uncut at one end, making a poke or cul-de-sac. "'Take your lamb,' said she, laughing at the contrivance. And so the pet was first well happed up, and then put, laughing silently, into the plaid nuke, and the shepherd strode off with his lamb, Maida gambling through the snow and running races in her mirth. Didn't he face the angry Ert? and make her belled his bosom, and into his own room with her, and lock the door, and out with a warm rosy little wifey, who took it all with great composure. There the two remained for three or more hours, making the house ring with their laughter. You can fancy the big man's, and Maidie's laugh. Having made the fire cheery, he set her down in his ample chair, and standing sheepishly before her, began to say his lesson, which appeared to be, zickety dickety dock the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, down the mouse ran, zickety-dickety-dock. This done, repeatedly till she was pleased, she gave him his new lesson, gravely and slowly, timing it upon her small fingers, he saying it after her. Wannery, tuary, tickery, seven, alibi, crackaby, ten, and eleven, pin, pan, musky, dan, tweedle-um, toodle-um, twenty, wan, eerie, ori, uri, you are out. He pretended to great difficulty, and she rebuked him with most comical gravity, treating him as a child. He used to say that when he came to Alibi Crackaby, he broke down, and Pim Pan Musky Dan Tweedle Um Twoodle Um made him roar with laughter. He said Musky Dan especially was beyond endurance, bringing up an Irishman and his hat fresh from the Spice Islands, an odiferous ind. 
she getting quite bitter in her displeasure at his ill behavior and stupidness then he would read ballads to her in his own glorious way the two getting wild with excitement over gil morris or the baron of smailhorm and he would take her on his knee and make her repeat constance's speech in king john till he swayed to and fro sobbing his fill scott used to say that he was amazed at her power over him saying to mrs keith she is the most extraordinary creature i ever met with and her repeating of shakespeare overpowers me as nothing else does thanks to the unforgetting sister of this dear child who has much of the sensibility and fun of her who has been in her small grave these fifty and more years we now have before us the letters and journals of pet marjorie before us lies and gleams her rich brown hair bright and sunny as if yesterday's with the words on the paper cut out in her last illness and two pictures of her by her beloved isabella whom she worshipped there are the faded old scraps of paper hoarded still over which her warm breath and her warm little heart had poured themselves there is the old watermark lingard eighteen o eight the two portraits are very like each other but plainly done at different times it is a chubby healthy face deep-set brooding eyes as eager to tell what is going on within as to gather in all the glories from without quick with the wonder and the pride of life they are eyes that would not soon be satisfied with seeing eyes that would devour their object and yet childlike and fearless and that is a mouth that will not soon be satisfied with love it has a curious likeness to scott's own which has always appeared to us his sweetest most mobile and speaking feature there she is looking straight at us as she did at him fearless and full of love passionate wild willful fancy's child end of section sixteen Section 17 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 17. Marjorie Fleming, From Spare Hours, by John Brown. Part 2. There was an old servant, Jeanie Robertson, who was forty years in her grandfather's family, Marjorie Fleming, or as she is called in the letters and by Sir Walter, Maidy, was the last child she kept. Jeanie's wages never exceeded three pounds a year, and when she left service she had saved forty pounds. She was devotedly attached to Maidy, rather despising and ill-using her sister Isabella, a beautiful and gentle child. This partiality made Maidy apt at times to domineer over Isabella. I mention this, writes her surviving sister, for the purpose of telling you an instance of Maidie's generous justice. When only five years old, when walking in wraith grounds, the two children had run on before, and old Jeanie remembered they might come too near a dangerous mill laid. She called them to turn back. Maidie heeded her not, rushed all the faster on, and fell, and would have been lost, had her sister not pulled her back, saving her life, but tearing her clothes. Jeanie flew on Isabella to give it her for spoiling her favorite dress. Maidy rushed in between, crying out, Pay, whip, Maidy, as much as you like, and I'll not say one word, but touch Izzy and I'll roar like a bull. Years after Maidy was resting in her grave, my mother used to take me to the place and told the story always in the exact same words. This Jeanie must have been a character. She took great pride in exhibiting Maidie's brother, William's Calvinistic acquirements, when nineteen months old, to the officers of a militia regiment then quartered in Kirkcaldy. This performance was so amusing that it was often repeated, and the little theologian was presented by them with a cap and feathers. Jeanie's glory was putting him through the carriage, catechism, in broad scotch, beginning at the beginning with, Wa may may bonnie man. For the correctness of this, and the three next replies, Jeanie had no anxiety. But the tone changed to menace, and the closed, neve, fist, was shaken in the child's face as she demanded, Of what are you made? Dirt, was the answer uniformly given. Will ye never learn to say dust, ye thrain devil, with a cuff from the opened hand, was the as inevitable rejoinder. Here is Maidie's first letter, before she was six, the spelling unaltered, and there are no comos. 
My dear Isa, I now sit down to answer all your kind and beloved letters, which you were so good as to write me. This is the first time I ever wrote a letter in my life. There are a great many girls in the square, and they cry just like a pig when we are under the painful necessity of putting it to death. Miss Potoon, a lady of my acquaintance, praises me dreadfully. I repeated something of Dean Swift, and she said I was fit for the stage, and you may think I was primmed up with the majestic pride, but upon my word I felt myself turn a little Beersy. Beersy is a word which is a word that William composed, which is, as you may suppose, a little enraged. This horrid fat simpleton says that my aunt is beautiful, which is entirely impossible, for that is not her nature. What a peppery little pen we wield! What could that have been out of the sardonic dean? What other child of that age would have used beloved as she does? This power of affection, this faculty of be-loving, and the wild hunger to be beloved, comes out more and more. She periled her all upon it, and it may have been as well, we know, indeed, that it was far better, for her that this wealth of love was so soon withdrawn to its one only infinite giver and receiver. This must have been the law of her earthly life. Love was indeed her lord and king, and it was perhaps well for her that she found so soon that her and our only lord and king himself is love. Here are bits from her diary at Brayhead. The day of my existence here has been delightful and enchanting. On Saturday I expected no less than three well-made bucks, the names of whom is here advertised, Mr. George Crakey, Craigy, and William Keith, and John Keith. The first is the funniest of every one of them. Mr. Crakey and I walked to Crakey Hall, Craigy Hall, hand in hand in innocence and meditation, meditation, sweet thinking on the kind love which flows in our tender-hearted mind, which is overflowing with majestic pleasure, no one was ever so polite to me in the whole state of my existence. Mr. Cracky, you must know, is a great buck, and pretty good-looking. I am at Ravelston, enjoying nature's fresh air. The birds are singing sweetly, the calf doth frisk, and nature shows her glorious face. Here is a confession. I confess I have been very more like a little girl devil than a creature, for when Isabella went upstairs to teach me religion and my multiplication, and to be good and all my other lessons, I stamped with my foot and threw my new hat which she had made on the ground, and was sulky and was dreadfully passionate. But she never whipped me, but said, Marjorie, go into another room, and think what a great crime you are committing, letting your temper get the better of you. But I went so sulkily that the devil got the better of me, but she never, never whips me, so that I think I would be the better of it, and the next time that I behave ill, I think she should do it, for she never does it. Isabella has given me praise for checking my temper, for I was sulky even when she was kneeling a whole hour teaching me to write. Our poor little Whiffy, she has no doubts of the personality of the devil. Yesterday I behave extremely ill in God's most holy church, for I would never attend myself nor let Isabella attend, which was a great crime, for she often, often tells me that when two or three are gathered together, God is in the midst of them, and it was the very same devil that tempted Job that tempted me, I am sure. But he resisted Satan, though he had boils and many other misfortunes, which I have escaped. I am now going to tell you the horrible and wretched plague that my multiplication gives me, you can't conceive it the most devilish thing is eight times eight and seven times seven. It is what nature itself can't endure. This is delicious. And what harm is there in her devilish? It is strong language merely. Even old Roland Hill used to say, he grudged the devil those rough and ready words. I walked to that delightful place, Crakey Hall, with a delightful young man, beloved by all his friends, especially by me, his loveress, but I must not talk any more about him, for Isa said it is not proper to speak of a gentleman, but I will never forget him. I am very, very glad that Satan has not given me boils and many other misfortunes. In the Holy Bible these words are written that the devil goes like a roaring lion in search of his prey, but the Lord lets us escape from him, but we, pauvre petite, do not strive with this awful spirit. Today I pronounced a word which should never come out of a lady's lips, 
It was that I called John an impudent bitch. I will tell you what I think made me in so bad a humor, is I got one or two of that bad sinna, senna, tea today. A better excuse for bad humor and bad language than most. She had been reading the book of Esther. It was a dreadful thing that Haman was hanged on the very gallows which he had prepared for Mordecai to hang him and his ten sons thereon, and it was very wrong and cruel to hang his sons, for they did not commit the crime, but then Jesus was not then come to teach us to be merciful. This is wise and beautiful. It has upon it the very dew of youth and holiness. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings he perfects his praise. This is Saturday, and I am very glad of it, because I have play half the day, and I get money, too, but alas I owe Isabella four pence, and I am finned two pence whenever I bite my nails. Isabella is teaching me to make semi-cooling knots of interrogations, periods, comos, etc. As this is Sunday, I will meditate upon sensible and religious subjects. First, I should be very thankful I am not a beggar. This amount of meditation and thankfulness seems to have been all she was able for. I am going tomorrow to a delightful place, Brayhead by name, belonging to Mrs. Crawford, where there is ducks, cocks, hens, bubbly jocks, two dogs, two cats, and swine, which is delightful. I think it is shocking to think that the dog and cat should bear them. This is a meditation, physiological. And they are drowned, after all. I would rather have a man-dog than a woman-dog, because they do not bear like woman-dogs. It is a hard case. It is shocking. I came here to enjoy nature's delightful breath. It is sweeter than a phial of rose oil. Brayhead is the farm the historical Jock Howison asked and got from our gay James V, the Grundman o Ballengrich, as a reward for the services of his flail when the king had the worst of it at Cromond Brig with the gypsies. The farm is unchanged in size from that time, and still in the unbroken line of the ready and victorious thrasher. Brayhead is held on the condition of the possessor being ready to present the king with an ewer and basin to wash his hands, Jock having done this for his unknown king after the splore. And when George the Fourth came to Edinburgh, this ceremony was performed in silver at Holyrood. It is a lovely nook, this Brayhead, preserved almost as it was two hundred years ago, Lot and his wife, mentioned by Mattie, two quaintly cropped yew trees still thrive. The burn runs as it did in her time, and sings the same quiet tune, as much the same and as different as now and then. The house is full of old family relics and pictures, the sun shining on them through the small deep windows with their plate glass, and their blinking at the sun and chattering contentedly is a parrot that might, for its looks of eld, have been in the ark and domineered over and deaved the dove. Everything about the place is old and fresh. This is beautiful. I am very sorry to say that I forgot God, that is to say, I forgot to pray today, and Isabella told me that I should be thankful that God did not forget me. If he did, oh, what would become of me if I was in danger, and God not friends with me? I must go to unquenchable fire, and if I was tempted to sin, how could I resist it, Oh, no, I will never do it again. No, no, if I can help it. Canny wee wiffy. My religion is greatly falling off because I don't pray with so much attention when I am saying my prayers, and my character is lost among the Brayhead people. I hope I will be religious again, but as for regaining my character, I despair for it. Poor little habit and repute. Her temper, her passion, and her badness are almost daily confessed and deplored. I will never again trust in my own power, for I see that I cannot be good without God's assistance. I will not trust in my own self, and Isa's health will be quite ruined by me. It will indeed. Isa has given me advice, which is, that when I feel Satan beginning to tempt me, that I flee him, and he would flee me. Remorse is the worst thing to bear, and I am afraid that I will fall a martyr to it. Poor dear little sinner, here comes the world again. In my travels I met with a handsome lad named Charles Balfour Esquire, and from him I got offers of marriage. Offers of marriage, did I say? Nay, plenty heard me. A fine scent for breach of promise. 
This is abrupt and strong. The devil is cursed and all works. Tis a fine work, Newton on the prophecies. I wonder if there is another book of poems comes near the Bible. The devil always grins at the sight of the Bible. Miss Portoon, her simpleton friend, is very fat. She pretends to be very learned. She says she saw a stone that dropped from the skies, but she is a good Christian. Here comes her views on church government. An Anabaptist is a thing I am not a member of. I am a Peslican, Episcopalian, just now, and, O oh, you little Laodicean, and Latitudinarian, a Presbyterian at Kirkcaldy, Blandula, Vagula, Colum et animum mutas coe trans mare, i.e., trans bodotirium, curis, my native town. Sentiment is not what I am acquainted with as yet, though I wish it, and should like to practice it. I wish I had a great, great deal of gratitude in my heart, in all my body. There is a new novel published named Self-Control, Mrs. Burton's, a very good maxim forsooth. This is shocking. Yesterday a married man, named Mr. John Balfour Esquire, offered to kiss me, and offered to marry me, though the man, a fine directness this, was espoused, and his wife was present, and said he must ask her permission, but he did not. I think he was ashamed and confounded before three gentlemen, Mr. Jobson and two Mr. Kings. Mr. Bannisters, Bannisters, budget is tonight. I hope it will be a good one. A great many authors have expressed themselves too sentimentally. You are right, Marjorie. A Mr. Burns writes a beautiful song on Mr. Cunhamming, whose wife deserted him. Truly, it is a most beautiful one. I like to read the fabulous histories about the history of Robin, Dicky, Flapsay, and Piquet, and it is very amusing, for some were good birds and others bad, but Piquet was the most dutiful and obedient to her parents. Thompson is a beautiful author, and Pope, but nothing to Shakespeare, of which I have little knowledge. Macbeth is a pretty composition, but awful one. The Newgate calendar is very instructive. A sailor called here to say farewell. It must be dreadful to leave his native country when he might get a wife, or perhaps me, for I love him very much. But, oh, I forgot. Isabella forbid me to speak about love. This antiphlogistic regimen and lesson is ill to learn by our Maddie, for here she sins again. Love is a very pathetic thing. It is almost a pity to correct this to pathetic as well as troublesome and tiresome, but, oh, Isabella, forbid me to speak of it. Here are her reflections on a pineapple. I think the price of pineapple is very dear. It is a whole bright golden guinea that might have sustained a poor family. Here is a new vernal simile. The hedges are sprouting like chicks from the eggs when they are newly hatched or, as the vulgar say, clacked. Dr. Swift's works are very funny. I got some of them by heart. Moorhead sermons are I hear much praised, but I never read sermons of any kind. But I read novelettes and my Bible, and I never forget it, or my prayers. Brava, Marjorie. She seems now, when still about six, to have broken out into song. Ephibole, epigram or epitaph, who knows which, on my dear love, Isabella. Here lies sweet Isabel in bed, with a nightcap on her head. Her skin is soft, her face is fair, and she has very pretty hair. She and I, in bed lies nice, and undisturbed by rats or mice. She is disgusted with Mr. Worgan, though he plays upon the organ. Her nails are neat, her teeth are white, her eyes are very, very bright. In a conspicuous town she lives, and to the poor her money gives. Here ends sweet Isabella's story, and may it be much to her glory." Here are some bits at random. Of summer I am very fond, and love to bathe into a pond. The look of sunshine dies away, and will not let me out to play. I love the morning's sun to spy, glittering through the casement's eye. The rays of light are very sweet, and puts away the taste of meat. The balmy breeze comes down from heaven, and makes us like to be for living. The causawary is a curious bird, and so is the gigantic crane, and the pelican of the wilderness, whose mouth holds a bucket of fish and water. 
fighting is what ladies is not qualified for they would not make a good figure in a battle or in a duel alas we females are of little use to our country the history of the malcontents as ever was hanged is amusing still harping on the newgate calendar brayhead is extremely pleasant to me by the company of swine geese cocks etc and they are the delight of my soul i am going to tell you of a melancholy story a young turkey of two or three months old would you believe it the father broke its leg and he killed another i think he ought to be transported or hanged queen street is a very gay one and so is prince's street for all the lads and lasses besides bucks and beggars parade there i should like to see a play very much for i never saw one in all my life and don't believe i ever shall but i hope i can be content without going to one I can be quite happy without my desire being granted. Some days ago Isabella had a terrible fit of the toothache, and she walked with a long night shift at dead of night like a ghost, and I thought she was one. She prayed for nature's sweet restorer, balmy sleep, but did not get it. A ghostly figure indeed she was, enough to make a saint tremble. It made me quiver and shake from top to toe. Superstition is a very mean thing, and should be despised and shunned. Here is her weakness and her strength again. In the love novels, all the heroines are very desperate. Isabella will not allow me to speak about lovers and heroines, and tis too refined for my taste. Miss Edwards, Edgeworth's tales are very good, particularly some that are not very much adapted for youth, as Laz Lawrence and Tarleton, False Keys, etc., etc. Tom Jones and Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard are both excellent and much spoke of by both sex, particularly by the men. Are our Marjories nowadays better or worse because they cannot read Tom Jones unharmed? More better than worse, but who among them can repeat Gray's lines on a distant prospect of Eton College, as could our matey? Here is some more of her prattle. I went into Isabella's bed to make her smile, like the genius de Medicus, the Venus de Medicis, or the statue in an ancient Greece, but she fell asleep on my very face, at which my anger broke forth, so that I awoke her from a comfortable nap. All was now hushed up again, but again my anger burst forth at her bidding me get up. She begins thus loftily, Death the righteous love to see, but from it doth the wicked flee. Then suddenly breaks off, as with laughter. I am sure they fly as fast as their legs can carry them. There is a thing I love to see, that is our monkey catch a flea. I love in Isa's bed to lie, oh, such a joy and luxury. The bottom of the bed I sleep, and with great care within I creep. Oft I embrace her feet of lilies, but she has gotten all the pillies. Her neck I never can embrace, but I do hug her feet in place. How childish, and yet how strong and free is her use of words. I lay at the foot of the bed because Isabella said I disturbed her by continually fighting and kicking, but I was very dull and continually at work reading the Arabian Nights, which I could not have done if I had slept at the top. I am reading The Mysteries of Udolfo. I am much interested in the fate of poor, poor Emily. Here is one of her swains. Very soft and white his cheeks, his hair is red and gray his breeks. His tooth is like the daisy fair, his only fault is in his hair. This is a higher flight. Dedicated to Mrs. H. Crawford by the author, M. F. Three turkeys fair their last have breathed, and now this world forever leaved. Their father and their mother too, they sigh and weep as well as you. Indeed the rats their bones have crunched, into eternity there he launched. A direful death indeed they had, as was put any parent mad. But she was more than usual calm. She did not give a single dam. This last word is saved from all sin by its tender age, not to speak of the want of the N. We fear she is the abandoned mother, in spite of her previous sighs and tears. Isabella says, When we pray we should pray fervently, and not rattle over a prayer, for that we are kneeling at the footstool of our Lord and Creator, who saves us from eternal damnation, and from unquestionable fire and brimstone. 
She has a long poem on Mary, Queen of Scots. Queen Mary was much loved by all, both by the great and by the small. But hark, her soul to heaven doth rise, and I suppose she has gained a prize. For I do think she would not go into the awful place below. There is a thing that I must tell. Elizabeth went to fire and hell. He who would teach her to be civil, it must be her great friend, the devil. She hits off darnly well. A noble's son, a handsome lad, by some queer way or other had, got quite the better of her heart. With him she always talked apart. Silly was he, but very fair. A greater buck was not found there. By some queer way or other, is not this the general case and the mystery, young ladies and gentlemen? Goethe's doctrine of elective affinities, discovered by our pet Maddie. A Sonnet to a Monkey O lively, O most charming pug, Thy graceful air and heavenly mug, The beauties of his mind do shine, And every bit is shaped and fine. Your teeth are whiter than the snow, You're a great buck, you're a great bow. Your eyes are of so nice a shape, More like a Christian's than an ape. Your cheek is like the rose's bloom, Your hair is like the raven's plume. His nose's cast is of the Roman, He is a very pretty woman. I could not get a rhyme for Roman, So was obliged to call him woman. This last joke is good. She repeats it when writing of James the Second Being killed at Roxburgh. He was killed by a cannon splinter, Quite in the middle of the winter. Perhaps it was not at that time, but I can get no other rhyme. Here is one of her last letters, dated Kirk Caldy, 12th October, 1811. You can see how her nature is deepening and enriching. My dear mother, you will think that I entirely forgot you, but I assure you that you are greatly mistaken. I think of you always, and often sigh to think of the distance between us two loving creatures of nature. We have regular hours for all our occupations. First at seven o'clock we go to the dancing and come home at eight. We then read our Bible and get to our repeating and then play till ten. Then we get our music till eleven, when we get our writing and accounts. We sew from twelve till one, after which I get my grammar, and then work till five. At seven we come and knit till eight, when we don't go to the dancing. This is an exact description. I must take a hasty farewell to her whom I love, reverence and dote on, and who I hope thinks the same of, Marjorie Fleming. P.S. An old pack of cards would be very acceptable. My dear little mamma, I was truly happy to hear that you were all well. We are surrounded with measles at present on every side, for the herons got it, and Isabella Heron was near death's door, and one night her father lifted her out of bed, and she fell down as they thought lifeless. Mr. Heron said, That lassie's deed no. I'm no deed yet. She then threw up a big worm nine inches and a half long. I have begun dancing, but am not very fond of it. For the boys strikes and mocks me. I have been another night at the dancing. I like it better. I will write to you as often as I can, but I am afraid not every week. I long for you with the longings of a child to embrace you, to fold you in my arms. I respect you with all the respect due a mother. You don't know how I love you. So I shall remain your loving child. M. Fleming. What rich involution of love in the words marked. Here are some lines to her beloved Isabella in July, 1811. There is a thing that I do want, with you these beauteous walks to haunt. We would be happy if you would, try to come over if you could. Then I would all quite happy be, now and for all eternity. My mother is so very sweet, and checks my appetite to eat. My father shows us what to do. But, oh, I'm sure that I want you. I have no more of poetry. Oh, Isa, do remember me, and try to love your Marjorie. In a letter from Isa to Miss Muff Maddie Marjorie Fleming, favored by rare Rear Admiral Fleming, she says, I long much to see you and talk over all our old stories together and to hear you read and repeat. I am pining for my old friend, Cesario, and poor Lear, and wicked Richard. How is the dear multiplication table going on? Are you still as much attached to nine times nine as you used to be? But this dainty, bright thing is about to flee, to come quick to confusion. 
The measles she writes of seized her, and she died on the 19th of December, 1811. The day before her death, Sunday, she sat up in bed, worn and thin, her eye gleaming as with the light of a coming world, and with a tremulous, old voice repeated the lines by Burns, heavy with the shadow of death, and lit with the fantasy of the judgment seat, the publican's prayer in paraphrase. Why am I loath to leave this earthly scene? It is more affecting than we care to say to read her mother's and Isabel Keith's letters written immediately after her death. Old and withered, tattered and pale they are now, but when you read them, how quick, how throbbing with life and love, how rich in that language of affection which only women and Shakespeare and Luther can use, that power of detaining the soul over the beloved object of its loss. In her first letter to Miss Keith, Mrs. Fleming says of her dead Maddie, Never did I behold so beautiful an object. It resembled the finest waxwork. There was in the countenance an expression of sweetness and serenity, which seemed to indicate that the pure spirit had anticipated the joys of heaven ere it quitted the mortal frame. To tell you what your Maddie said of you would fill volumes, for you were the constant theme of her discourse, the subject of her thoughts, and the ruler of her actions. The last time she mentioned you was a few hours before all sense, save that of suffering, was suspended, and when she said to Dr. Johnstone, If you will let me out at the new year, I will be quite contented, I asked her what made her so anxious to get out then. I want to purchase a New Year's gift for Isa Keith, with the sixpence you gave me for being patient in the measles, and I would like to choose it myself. I do not remember her speaking afterwards, except to complain of her head, till just before she expired, when she articulated, O oh, mother, mother. Do we make too much of this little child, who has been in her grave in Abbot's Hall, Kirkyard, these fifty and more years? We may of her cleverness, not of her affectionateness, her nature. What a picture of the animosa infants gives us of herself, her vivacity, her passionateness, her precocious love-making, her passion for nature, for swine, for all living things, her reading, her turn for expression, her satire, her frankness, her little sins and rages, her great repentances. We don't wonder Walter Scott carried her off in the nook of his plaid and played himself with her for hours. We are indebted for the following, and our readers will not be unwilling to share our obligations. To her sister, her birth was 15th January 1803, her death, 19th December, 1811. I take this from her Bibles. I believe she was a child of robust health, of much vigor of body, and beautifully formed arms, until her last illness, never was an hour in bed. She was niece to Mrs. Keith, residing in Number 1 North Charlotte Street, who was not Mrs. Murray Keith, although very intimately acquainted with that old lady. As to my aunt and Scott, they were on a very intimate footing, he asked my aunt to be the godmother to his eldest daughter, Sophia Charlotte. I had a copy of Miss Edgeworth's Rosamond and Harry and Lucy for long, which was a gift to Marjorie from Walter Scott, probably the first edition of that attractive series, for it wanted Frank, which is also now published as part of the series under the title of Early Lessons. I regret to say these little volumes have disappeared. Sir Walter was no relation of Marjorie's, but of the Keiths, through the Swintons, and like Marjorie, he stayed much at Ravelston in his early days with his great-aunt, Mrs. Keith. We cannot better end than in words from this same pen. I have asked you to forgive my anxiety in gathering up fragments of Marjorie's last days, but I have an almost sacred feeling to all that pertains to her. You are quite correct in stating that measles were the cause of her death. My mother was struck by the patient quietness manifested by Marjorie during this illness, unlike her ardent, impulsive nature, but love and poetic feeling were unquenched. When lying very still, her mother asked her if there was anything she wished. Oh, yes, if you would just leave the room door open a wee bit and play The Land of the Leal, and I will lie and think and enjoy myself. This is just as stated to me by her mother and mine. Well, the happy day came, alike to parents and child, when Marjorie was allowed to come forth from the nursery to the parlor, it was Sabbath evening, and after tea. My father, who idolized this child, and never afterwards in my hearing mentioned her name, took her in his arms, and while walking up and down the room, she said, Father, I will repeat something to you. What would you like? He said, Just choose yourself, Maddie. She hesitated for a moment between the paraphrase, Few are thy days and full of woe, 
and the lines of Burns already quoted, but decided on the latter, a remarkable choice for a child. The repeating of these lines seemed to stir up the depths of feeling in her soul. She asked to be allowed to write a poem. There was a doubt whether it would be right to allow her, in case of hurting her eyes. She pleaded earnestly, just this once. The point was yielded, her slate was given her, and with great rapidity she wrote an address of fourteen lines, to her loved cousin on the author's recovery, her last work on earth. Oh, Isa, pain did visit me. I was at the last extremity. How often did I think of you. I wished your graceful form to view, to clasp you in my weak embrace. Indeed, I thought I'd run my race. Good care, I'm sure, was of me taken, but still indeed I was much shaken. At last I daily strength did gain, and oh, at last, away went pain. At length the doctor thought I might stay in the parlor all the night. I now continue so to do. Farewell to Nancy and to you. She went to bed apparently well, awoke in the middle of the night with the old cry of woe to a mother's heart, my head, my head. Three days of the dire malady, water in the head, followed, and the end came. Soft silken primrose, fading timelessly. It is needless, it is impossible to add anything to this. The fervor, the sweetness, the flush of poetic ecstasy, the lovely and glowing eye, the perfect nature of that bright and warm intelligence, that darling child, Lady Nairn's words, and the old tune stealing up from the depths of the human heart, deep calling unto deep, gentle and strong like the waves of the sea hushing themselves to sleep in the dark. The words of Burns touching the kindred chord, her last numbers, wildly sweet, traced with thin and eager fingers, already touched by the last enemy and friend, Morian's Kennet, and that love which is so soon to be her everlasting light, is her song's burden to the end. She sets as sets the morning star, which goes not down behind the darkened west, nor hides obscured among the tempests of the sky, but melts away into the light of heaven. End of section 17section eighteen of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by gemma library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section eighteen the Death of Thackeray by John Brown From Spare Hours We cannot resist here recalling one Sunday evening in December, when he was walking with two friends along the Dean Road, to the west of Edinburgh, one of the noblest outlets to any city. It was a lovely evening, such a sunset as one never forgets, a rich dark bar of cloud hovered over the sun, going down behind the highland hills, lying bathed in amethystine bloom. Between this cloud and the hills there was a narrow slip of the pure ether, of a tender cowslip colour, lucid, and as if it were the very body of heaven in its clearness, every object standing out as if etched upon the sky. The northwest end of Corstefine Hill, with its trees and rocks, lay in the heart of this pure radiance, and there a wooden crane, used in the quarry below, was so placed as to assume the figure of a cross. There it was, unmistakable, lifted up against the crystalline sky. All three gazed at it silently. As they gazed, he gave utterance, in a tremulous, gentle, and rapid voice, to what all were feeling, in the word, Calvary. The friends walked on in silence, and then turned to other things. All that evening he was very gentle and serious, speaking, as he seldom did, of divine things, of death, of sin, of eternity, of salvation, expressing his simple faith in God and in his Saviour. There is a passage at the close of the roundabout paper, 
number twenty three de finibus in which a sense of the ebb of life is very marked the whole paper is like a soliloquy it opens with a drawing of mr punch with unusually mild eye retiring for the night he is putting out his high-heeled shoes and before disappearing gives a wistful look into the passage as if bidding it and all else good night he will be in bed his candle out and in darkness in five minutes and his shoes found next morning at his door the little potentate all the while in his final sleep the whole paper is worth the most careful study it reveals not a little of his real nature and unfolds very curiously the secret of his work the vitality and abiding power of his own creations how he invented a certain costigan out of scraps heel taps odds and ends of characters and met the original the other day without surprise in a tavern parlor the following is beautiful years ago i had a quarrel with a certain well-known person i believed a statement regarding him which his friends imparted to me and which turned out to be quite incorrect to his dying day that quarrel was never quite made up i said to his brother why is your brother's soul still dark against me it is i who ought to be angry and unforgiving for i was in the wrong odisse quem laceris was never better contravened but what we chiefly refer to now is the profound pensiveness of the following strain as if written with a presentiment of what was not then very far off another finis written another milestone on this journey from birth to the next world sure it is a subject for solemn cogitation shall we continue this story-telling business and be voluble to the end of our age will it not be presently time o prattler to hold your tongue and thus he ends oh the sad old pages the dull old pages oh the cares the ennui the squabbles the repetitions the old conversations over and over again but now and again a kind thought is recalled and now and again a dear memory yet a few chapters more and then the last after which behold finis itself comes to an end and the infinite begins he had been suffering on sunday from an old and cruel enemy he fixed with his friend and surgeon to come again on Tuesday, but with that dread of anticipated pain which is a common condition of sensibility and genius, he put him off with a note from yours unfaithfully, W.M.T. He went out on Wednesday for a little, and came home at ten. He went to his room, suffering much, but declining his man's offer to sit with him. He hated to make others suffer. He was heard moving, as if in pain, about twelve, on the eve of that happy morn, wherein the son of heaven's eternal king, of wedded maid and virgin mother born, our great redemption from above did bring. Then all was quiet, and then he must have died, in a moment. Next morning his man went in, and opening the windows, found his master dead, his arms behind his head, as if he had tried to take one more breath. We think of him, as of our Chalmers, found dead in like manner, the same childlike, unspoiled, open face, the same gentle mouth, the same spaciousness and softness of nature, the same look of power. What a thing to think of, his lying there alone in the dark, in the midst of his own mighty London, his mother and his daughters asleep, and, it may be, dreaming of his goodness. God help them, and us all. What would become of us, stumbling along this our path of life, if we could not, at our utmost need, stay ourselves on him? Long years of sorrow, labor, and pain had killed him before his time. It was found after death how little life he had to live, he looked always fresh, with that abounding silvery hair, and his young, almost infantine face, 
but he was worn to a shadow, and his hands wasted as if by eighty years. With him it is the end of ends. Finite is over, and infinite begun. What we all felt and feel can never be so well expressed as in his own words of sorrow for the early death of Charles Bueller. Who knows the inscrutable design? Blessed he who took and he who gave. Why should your mother, Charles, not mine, be weeping at her darling's grave? We bow to heaven that willed it so, that darkly rules the fate of all, that sends the respite or the blow, that's free to give or to recall. End of section 18「Section 19 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors, Section 19, Selected Excerpts by Charles Farrar Brown, Artemis Ward, 1834-1867, through 1867, by Charles F. Johnson. Charles Farrar Brown, better known to the public of thirty years ago, under his pen name of Artemis Ward, was born in the little village of Waterford, Maine, on the 26th day of April, 1834. Waterford is a quiet village of about 700 inhabitants, lying among the foothills of the White Mountains. When Brown was a child, it was a station on the western stage route, and an important depot for lumbermen's supplies. Since the extension of railroads northerly and westerly from the seaboard, it has, however, shared the fate of many New England villages in being left on one side of the main currents of commercial activity, and gradually assuming a character of repose and leisure, in many regards more attractive than the life and bustle of earlier days. Many persons are still living there who remember the humorist as a quaint and tricksy boy, alternating between laughter and preternatural gravity, and of a surprising ingenuity in devising odd practical jokes in which good nature so far prevailed that even the victims were too much amused to be very angry. On both sides he came from original New England stock, and although he was proud of his descent from a very ancient English family, in deference to whom he wrote his name with the final E, he felt greater pride in his American ancestors, and always said that they were genuine and primitive Yankees, people of intelligence, activity, and integrity in business, but entirely unaffected by new-fangled ideas. It is interesting to notice that Brown's humor was hereditary on the paternal side, his father especially being noted for his quaint sayings and harmless eccentricities. His cousin Daniel, many years later, bore a strong resemblance to what Charles had been, and he too possessed a kindred, humorous faculty and told the story in much the same solemn manner, bringing out the point as if it were something entirely irrelevant and unimportant, and casually remembered. The subject of this sketch, however, was the only member of the family in whom a love for the droll and incongruous was a controlling disposition. As is frequently the case, a family trait was intensified in one individual to the point where talent passes over into genius. 
on his mother's side too, Brown was a thoroughbred New Englander. His maternal grandfather, Mr. Calvin Farrar, was a man of influence in town and state, and was able to send two of his sons to Bowdoin College. I have mentioned Brown's parentage because his humor is so essentially American. Whether this consists in a peculiar gravity in the humorous attitude towards the subject, rather than playfulness, or in a tendency to exaggerated statement, or in a broad humanitarian standpoint, or in a certain flavor given by a blending of all these, it is very difficult to decide. Probably the peculiar standpoint is the distinguishing note, and American humor is a product of democracy. Humor is as difficult of definition as is poetry. It is an intimate quality of the mind, which predisposes a man to look for remote and unreal analogies, and to present them gravely, as if they were valid. It sees that many of the objects valued by men are illusions, and it expresses this conviction by assuming that other manifest trifles are important. It is the deadly enemy of sentimentality and affectation, for its vision is clear. Although it turns everything topsy-turvy in sport, its world is not a chaos nor a child's playground for humor is based on keen perception of truth. There is no method except the highest poetic treatment which reveals so distinctly the falsehoods and hypocrisies of the social and economic order as the reductio ad absurdum of humor. For all human institutions have their ridiculous sides, which astonish and amuse us when pointed out, but from viewing which we suddenly become aware of relative values before misunderstood. But just as poetry may degenerate into a musical collection of words, and painting into a decorative association of colors, so humor may degenerate into the merely comic or amusing. The laugh which true humor arouses is not far removed from tears. Humor, indeed, is not always associated with kindliness, for we have the sardonic humor of Carlyle and the savage humor of Swift, but it is naturally dissociated from egotism and is never more attractive than when, as in the case of Charles Lamb and Oliver Goldsmith, it is based on a loving and generous interest in humanity. Humor must rest on a broad human foundation, and cannot be narrowed to the notions of a certain class. But in most English humor, as indeed in all English literature except the very highest, the social class to which the writer does not belong is regarded ab extra, in Punch, for instance, not only are servants always given a conventional set of features, but they are given conventional minds, and the jokes are based on a hypothetical conception of personality. Dickens was a great humorist, and understood the nature of the poor, because he had been one of them. But his gentlemen and ladies are lay figures. Thackeray's studies of the flunky are capital, but he studies him qua flunky, as a naturalist might study an animal, and hardly ranks him subspecie humanitatis. But to the American humorist, all men are primarily men. The waiter and the prince are equally ridiculous to him, because in each he finds similar incongruities between the man and and his surroundings. But in England there is a deep, impassable gulf between the man at the table and the man behind his chair. This democratic independence of external and adventitious circumstance sometimes gives a tone of irreverence to American persiflage, 
and the temporary character of class distinctions in America undoubtedly diminishes the amount of literary material in sight. But when, as in the case of Brown and Clemens, there is in the humorist's mind a basis of reverence for things and persons that are really reverend, it gives a breath and freedom to the humorous conception that is distinctively American. We put Clemens and Brown in the same line, because in reading a page of either, we feel at once the American touch. Brown, of course, is not to be compared to Clemens in affluence or in range in depicting humorous character types, but it must be remembered that Clemens has lived thirty active years longer than his predecessor did. Neither has written a line that he would wish to blot for its foul suggestion, or because it ridiculed things that were lovely and of good report. Both were educated in journalism, and came into direct contact with the strenuous and realistic life of labor. And to repeat, though one was born and bred west of the Mississippi, and the other far down east, both are distinctly American. Had either been born and passed his childhood outside our magic line, this resemblance would not have existed. And yet we cannot say precisely wherein this likeness lies, nor what caused it. So deep, so subtle, so pervading is the influence of nationality. But their original expressions of the American humorous tone are worth ten thousand literary echoes of Stern, or Lamb, or Dickens, or Thackeray. The education of young Brown was limited to the strictly preparatory years. At the age of thirteen, he was forced by the death of his father to try to earn his living. When about fourteen, he was apprenticed to a Mr. Rex, who published a paper at Lancaster, New Hampshire. He remained there about a year, then worked on various country papers, and finally passed three years in the printing house of Snow and Wilder, Boston. He then went to Ohio, and after working for some months on the Tiffin Advertiser, went to Toledo, where he remained till the fall of 1857. Thence he went to Cleveland, Ohio, as local editor of the Plain Dealer. Here appeared the humorous letters signed Artemis Ward, and written in the character of an itinerant showman. In 1860, he went to New York as editor of the comic journal Vanity Fair. His reputation grew steadily, and his first volume, Artemis Ward, his book, was brought out in 1862. In 1863, he went to San Francisco by way of the Isthmus and returned overland. This journey was chronicled in a short volume, Artemis Ward, his travels. He had already undertaken a career of lecturing, and his comic entertainments, given in a style peculiarly his own, became very popular. The mimetic gift is frequently found in the humorist, and Brown's peculiar drawl, his profound gravity, and dreamy, faraway expression, the unexpected character of his jokes, and the surprise with which he seemed to regard the audience, made a combination of a delightfully quaint absurdity. Brown himself was a very winning personality, and never failed to put his audience in good humor. None who knew him twenty-nine years ago think of him without tenderness. In 1866 he visited England, and became almost as popular there as a lecturer and writer for Punch. He died from a pulmonary trouble in Southampton, March 6, 1867, being not quite 33 years old. He was never married. 
when we remember that a large part of Brown's mature life was taken up in learning the printer's trade, in which he became a master, we must decide that he had only entered on his career as humorous writer. Much of what he wrote is simply amusing, with little depth or power of suggestion. It is comic, not humorous. He was gaining the ear of the public and training his powers of expression. What he has left consists of a few collections of sketches written for a daily paper, but the subjoined extracts will show, albeit dimly, that he was more than a joker, as under the cap and bells of the fool in Lear, we catch a glimpse of the face of a tender-hearted and philosophic friend. Brown's nature was so kindly and sympathetic, so pure and manly, that after he had achieved a reputation and was relieved from immediate pecuniary pressure, he would have felt an ambition to do some worthy work and take time to bring out the best that was in him. As it is, he had only tried his prentice hand. Still, the figure of the old showman, though not very solidly painted, is admirably done. He is a sort of sublimated and unoffensive Barnum, perfectly consistent, permeated with his professional view of life, yet quite incapable of anything underhand or mean, radically loyal to the Union, appreciative of the nature of his animals, steady in his humorous attitude toward life, and above all, not a composite of shreds and patches, but a personality. Slight as he is, and unconscious and unpracticed, as is the art that went to his creation, he is one of the humorous figures of all literature, and old Sir John Falstaff, Sir Roger D. Coverley, Uncle Toby, and Dr. Primrose will not disdain to admit him into their company, for he too is a man, not an abstraction, and need not be ashamed of his parentage nor doubtful of his standing among the children of the men of wit. Edwin Forrest as Othello During a recent visit to New York, the undersigned went to see Edwin Forrest. As I am into the moral show business myself, I generally go to Barnum's Moral Museum, where only moral people are admitted particularly on Wednesday afternoons. But this time I thought I'd go and see Ed. Ed has been acting out on the stage for many years. There is various opinions about his acting, Englishmen generally believing that he's far superior to Mr. McCready. But on one pint all agree, and that is that Ed draws like a six-ox team. Ed was acting at Niblo's Guarding, which looks considerable more like a parster than a guarding, but let that parse. I sat down in the pit, took out my spectacles, and commenced perusing the evening's bill. The audience was all fired large, and the boxes was full of the Aletti of New York. Several opera glasses was leveled at me by Gotham's fairest darters, but I didn't let on as though I noticed it, though maybe I did take out my sixteen-dollar silver watch and brandish it round more than was necessary. But the best of us has our weaknesses, and if a man has jewelry, let him show it. As I was perusing the bill, a grave young man who sought near me asked me if I'd ever seen Forrest dance the essence of old Virginia. He's immense in that, said the young man. 
He also does a fair champion jig, the young man contendered. But his big thing is the essence of old Virginia. Says I, fair youth, do you know what I'd do with you if you was my son? No, says he. Wall, says I, I'd a pint your funeral tomorrow afternoon, and the corpse should be ready. You're too smart to live on this earth. He didn't try any more of his capers on me, but another pusillanimous individual in a red vest and patent leather boots told me his name was Bill Astor and asked me to lend him fifty cents till early in the morning. I told him I'd probably send it round to him before he retired to his virtuous couch, but if I didn't, he might look for it next fall, as soon as I'd cut my corn. The orchestra was now fiddling with all their might, and as the people didn't understand anything about it, they applauded vociferously. Presently, old Ed come out. The play was Otheller, or More of Venice. Otheller was writ by Wilm Shakespeare. The scene is laid in Venice. Otheller was a likely man and was a general in the Venice army. He eloped with Desdemony, a daughter of the Honorable Mr. Brabantio, who represented one of the back districts in the Venetian legislature. Old Brabantio was as mad as thunder at this and tore round considerable but finally cooled down, telling Otheller, howsoever, that Desdemony had come it over her par, and that he had better look out, or she'd come it over him likewise. Mr. and Mrs. Otheller get along very comfortable like for a spell. She is sweet-tempered and loving, a nice, sensible female never going in for he, female conventions, green cotton umbrellas, and pickled beets. Otheller is a good provider, and thinks all the world of his wife. She has a lazy time of it, a herd girl doing all the cooking and washing. Desdemony, in fact, don't have to get the water to wash her own hands with but a low cuss named Iago, who I believe wants to get Othello out of his snug government berth, now goes to work and upsets the Othello family in most outrageous style. Iago falls in with a brainless youth named Roderigo and wins all his money at poker. Iago allers played foul. He thus got money enough to carry out his unprincipled scheme. Mike Cassio, a Irishman, is selected as a tool by Iago. Mike was a clever feller and a officer in Otheller's army. He liked his tods too well, howsoever, and they floored him as they have many other promising young men. Iago induces Mike to drink with him, Iago slyly throwing his whiskey over his shoulder. Mike gets as drunk as a biled owl and allows that he can lick a yard full of the Venetian fancy before breakfast, without sweating a hair. He meets Roderigo and proceeds for to smash him. A feller named Mentano undertakes to slap Cassio when that infatuated person runs his sword into him. That miserable man, Iago, pretends to be very sorry to see Mike conduct himself in this way and undertakes to smooth the thing over to Othello, who rushes in with a drawn sword and wants to know what's up. 
Iago cunningly tells his story, and Othello tells Mike that he thinks a good deal of him, but that he can't train no more in his regiment. Desdemony sympathizes with poor Mike, and intercedes for him with Othello. Iago makes him believe she does this because she thinks more of Mike than she does of his self. Othello swallers Iago's lying tale and goes to making a nuisance of hisself generally. He worries poor Desdemony terrible by his vile insinuations and finally smothers her to death with a pillar. Mrs. Iago comes in just as Othello has finished the foul deed and gives him fits right and left, showing him that he has been orfully gulled by her miserable cuss of a husband. Iago comes in, and his wife commences raking him down also, when he stabs her. Othello jaws him a spell, and then cuts a small hole in his stomach with his sword. Iago pints to Desdemony's deathbed, and goes off with a sardonic smile onto his countenance. Othello tells the people that he has done the state some service, and they know it, axes them to do as fair a thing as they can for him under the circumstances, and kills himself with a fish knife which is the most sensible thing he can do. This is a brief schedule of the synopsis of the play. Edwin Forrest is a great actor. I thought I saw Othello before me all the time he was acting, and when the curtain fell, I found my spectacles was still missened with salt water, which had run from my eyes while poor Desdemony was dying. Betsy Jane, Betsy Jane, let us pray that our domestic bliss may never be busted up by A. Iago. Edwin Forrest makes money acting out on the stage. He gets $500 a night and his board and washing. I wish I had such a forest in my garden. Copyrighted by G. W. Dillingham and Company, New York. High-Handed Outrage at Utica In the fall of 1856, I showed my show in Utica, a truly great city in the state of New York. The people gave me a cordial reception. The press was loud in her praises. One day, as I was given a description of my beasts and snakes in my usual flowery style, what was my scorn and disgust to see a big, burly feller walk up to the cage containing my wax figures of the Lord's Last Supper and seize Judas Iscariot by the feet and drag him out on the ground. He then commenced fur to pound him as hard as he could. "'What under the sun are you about?' cried I. Says he, "'What did you bring this pusillanimous cuss here fur?' And he hit the wax figure another tremendous blow on the head. Says I, "'You egregious ass! That air's a wax figure!' a representation of the false apostle. Says he, That's all very well for you to say, but I tell you, old man, that Judas Iscariot can't show hisself in Utica with impunity by a darn sight. With which observation he caved in Judas's head. The young man belonged to one of the first families in Utica. I sued him, and the jury brought in a verdict of arson in the third degree. 
Copyrighted by G. W. Dillingham and Company, New York. Affairs Round the Village Green And where are the friends of my youth? I have found one of them, certainly. I saw him ride in a circus the other day on a bareback horse, and even now his name stares at me from yonder board fence in green and blue and red and yellow letters. Dashington, the youth with whom I used to read the able orations of Cicero, and who as a declaimer on exhibition days used to wipe the rest of us boys pretty handsomely out. Well, Dashington is identified with the halibut and cod interests. Drives a fish cart, in fact, from a certain town on the coast back into the interior. Herbertson, the utterly stupid boy, the lunkhead who never had his lesson, he's about the ablest lawyer a sister state can boast. Mills is a newspaper man and is just now editing a major general down south. Singlingson, the sweet-faced boy, whose face was always washed and who was never rude, he is in the penitentiary for putting his uncle's autograph to a financial document. Hawkins, the clergyman's son, is an actor, and Williamson, the good little boy who divided his bread and butter with the beggar man, is a failing merchant and makes money by it. Tom Slink, who used to smoke short sixes and get acquainted with the little circus boys, is popularly supposed to be the proprietor of a cheap gaming establishment in Boston, where the beautiful but uncertain prop is nightly tossed. Be sure the army is represented by many of the friends of my youth, the most of whom have given a good account of themselves. But Chalmerson hasn't done much. No, Chalmerson is rather of a failure. He plays on the guitar and sings love songs. Not that he is a bad man. A kinder-hearted creature never lived. And they say he hasn't yet got over crying for his little curly-haired sister who died ever so long ago. But he knows nothing about business, politics, the world, and those things. He is dull at trade. Indeed, it is the common remark that everybody cheats Chalmerson. He came to the party the other evening and brought his guitar. They wouldn't have him for a tenor in the opera, certainly, for he is shaky in his upper notes. But if his simple melodies didn't gush straight from the heart, why, even my trained eyes were wet. And although some of the girls giggled, and some of the men seemed to pity him, I could not help fancying that poor Charlmerson was nearer heaven than any of us all. Copyrighted by G. W. Dillingham and Company Mr. Pepper From Artemis Ward, His Travels my arrival at Virginia City was signalized by the following incident. I had no sooner achieved my room in the garret of the International Hotel than I was called upon by an intoxicated man who said he was an editor. Knowing how rare it is for an editor to be under the blighting influence of either spirituous or malt liquors, I received this statement doubtfully, but I said, What name? Wait, he said, and went out. I heard him pacing unsteadily up and down the hall outside. In ten minutes he returned and said, Pepper. Pepper was indeed his name. He had been out to see if he could remember it, and he was so flushed with his success that he repeated it joyously several times, and then, with a short laugh, he went away. 
I had often heard of a man being so drunk that he didn't know what town he lived in. But here was a man so hideously inebriated that he didn't know what his name was. I saw him no more, but I heard from him, for he published a notice of my lecture in which he said that I had a dissipated air. Horace Greeley's Ride to Placerville from Artemis Ward, His Travels When Mr. Greeley was in California, ovations awaited him at every town. He had written powerful leaders in the Tribune in favor of the Pacific Railroad, which had greatly endeared him to the citizens of the Golden State, and therefore they made much of him when he went to see them. At one town, the enthusiastic populace tore his celebrated white coat to pieces and carried the pieces home to remember him by. The citizens of Placerville prepared to fet the great journalist, and an extra coach with extra relays of horses was chartered of the California Stage Company to carry him from Folsom to Placerville. Distance, 40 miles. The extra was in some way delayed and did not leave Folsom until late in the afternoon. Mr. Greeley was to be feted at 7 o'clock that evening by the citizens of Placerville, and it was altogether necessary that he should be there by that time. So the stage company said to Henry Monk, the driver of the extra, Henry, this great man must be there by seven tonight. And Henry answered, The great man shall be there. The roads were in an awful state, and during the first few miles out of Folsom, slow progress was made. Sir, said Mr. Greeley, are you aware that I must be in Placerville at seven o'clock tonight? I've got my orders, laconically replied Henry Monk. Still the coach dragged slowly forward. Sir, said Mr. Greeley, this is not a trifling matter. I must be there at seven. Again came the answer. I've got my orders. But the speed was not increased, and Mr. Greeley chafed away another half hour, when, as he was again about to remonstrate with the driver, the horses suddenly started into a furious run, and all sorts of encouraging yells filled the air from the throat of Henry Monk. That is right, my good fellow, said Mr. Greeley. I'll give you ten dollars when we get to Placerville. Now we are going. They were indeed, and at a terrible speed. Crack, crack went the whip. And again, that voice split the air. Get up! Hi ye! Go long! Yip yip! And on they tore over stones and ruts, up hill and down, at a rate of speed never before achieved by stage horses. Mr. Greeley, who had been bouncing from one end of the stage to the other like an India rubber ball, managed to get his head out of the window when he said, Don't, on't, 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 you think we e e shall get there by seven if we don't, on't, on't go so fast? I've got my orders, that was all Henry Monk said, and on tore the coach. It was becoming serious. Already the journalist was extremely sore from the terrible jolting, and again his head might have been seen from the window. Sir, he said, I don't care, care, air er, if we don't get there at seven. I've got my orders. Fresh horses, forward again, faster than before, over rocks and stumps, on one of which the coach narrowly escaped turning a somerset. See here, shrieked Mr. Greeley, 
I don't care if we don't get there at all. I've got my orders. I work for the California Stage Company, I do. That's what I work for. They said, get this man through by seven. And this man's going through, you bet. Ger long, woo it. Another frightful jolt, and Mr. Greeley's bald head suddenly found its way through the roof of the coach, amidst the crash of small timbers and the ripping of strong canvas. Stop, you maniac, he roared. Again answered Henry Monk. I've got my orders. Keep your seat, Horace. At Mud Springs, a village a few miles from Placerville, they met a large delegation of the citizens of Placerville, who had come out to meet the celebrated editor and escort him into town. There was a military company, a brass band, and a six-horse wagon load of beautiful damsels in milk-white dresses, representing all the states in the Union. It was nearly dark now, but the delegation was amply provided with torches, and bonfires blazed all along the road to Placerville. The citizens met the coach in the outskirts of Mud Springs, and Mr. Monk reined in his foam-covered steeds. "'Is Mr. Greeley on board?' asked the chairman of the committee. "'He was a few miles back,' said Mr. Monk. "'Yes,' he added, looking down through the hole "'which the fearful jolting had made in the coach roof. "'Yes, I can see him. He is there.' "'Mr. Greeley,' said the chairman of the committee, "'presenting himself at the window of the coach. "'Mr. Greeley, sir, we are come to most cordially welcome you, sir. "'What? God bless me, sir, you are bleeding at the nose.' I've got my orders, cried Mr. Monk. My orders is as follows. Get him there by seven. It wants a quarter to seven. Stand out of the way. But, sir, exclaimed the committee man, seizing the off leader by the reins, Mr. Monk, we are come to escort him into town. Look at the procession, sir, and the brass band, and the people and the young women, sir. I've got my orders, screamed Mr. Monk. My orders don't say nothing about no brass bands and young women. My orders says, get him there by seven. Let go them lines. Clear the way there. woo ep Keep your seat, Horace. And the coach dashed wildly through the procession, upsetting a portion of the brass band and violently grazing the wagon which contained the beautiful young women in white. Years hence, gray-haired men who were little boys in this procession will tell their grandchildren how this stage tore through mud springs and how Horace Greeley's bald head ever and anon showed itself like a wild apparition above the coach roof. Mr. Monk was on time. There is a tradition that Mr. Greeley was very indignant for a while. Then he laughed and finally presented Mr. Monk with a brand new suit of clothes. Mr. Monk himself is still in the employ of the California Stage Company and is rather fond of relating a story that has made him famous all over the Pacific Coast but he says he yields to no man in his admiration for Horace Greeley. End of section 19